the name the first, usually known as the name the conqueror and sometimes the name the last, was the first Norman monarch of England, reigning from 1066 until his death in 1087. He was a descendant of Rollo and was Duke of Normandy from 1035 onward. By 1060, following a long struggle to establish his throne, his hold on Normandy was secure. In 1066, following the death of Edward the Confessor, William invaded England, leading an army of Normans to victory over the Anglo-Saxon forces of Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings, and suppressed subsequent English revolts in what has become known as the Norman Conquest. The rest of his life was marked by struggles to consolidate his hold over England and his continental lands, and by difficulties with his eldest son, Robert Curthose. William was the son of the unmarried Duke Robert I of Normandy and his mistress Hareleva. His illegitimate status in his youth caused some difficulties for him after he succeeded his father, as did the anarchy which plagued the first years of his rule. During his childhood and adolescence, Members of the Norman aristocracy battled each other, both for control of the child duke, and for their own ends. In 1047, William was able to quash a rebellion and begin to establish his authority over the duchy, a process that was not complete until about 1060. His marriage in the 1050s to Matilda of Flanders provided him with a powerful ally in the neighboring county of Flanders. By the time of his marriage, William was able to arrange the appointment of his supporters as bishops and abbots in the Norman Church. His consolidation of power allowed him to expand his horizons, and he secured control of the neighboring county of Maine by 1062. In the 1050s and early 1060s, William became a contender for the throne of England held by the childless Edward the Confessor, his first cousin once removed. There were other potential claimants, including the powerful English Earl Harold Godwinson, whom Edward named as king on his deathbed in January 1066. Arguing that Edward had previously promised the throne to him and that Harold had sworn to support his claim, William built a large fleet and invaded England in September 1066. He decisively defeated and killed Harold at the Battle of Hastings on 14 October 1066. After further military efforts, William was crowned king on Christmas Day, 1066, in London. He made arrangements for the governance of England in early 1067 before returning to Normandy. Several unsuccessful rebellions followed, but William's hold was mostly secure on England by 1075, allowing him to spend the majority of his reign in continental Europe. William's final years were marked by difficulties in his continental domains, troubles with his son, Robert, and threatened invasions of England by the Danes. In 1086, he ordered the compilation of the Doomsday Book, a survey listing all the land holdings in England along with their pre-conquest and current holders. He died in September 1087 while leading a campaign in northern France, and was buried in Caen. His reign in England was marked by the construction of castles, settling a new Norman nobility on the land, and change in the composition of the English clergy. He did not try to integrate his various domains into one empire but continued to administer each part separately. His lands were divided after his death, Normandy went to Robert, and England went to his second surviving son, William Rufus. Norsemen first began raiding in what became Normandy in the late 8th century. Permanent Scandinavian settlement occurred before 911, when Rollo, one of the Viking leaders, and King Charles the Simple of France reached an agreement ceding the county of Rouen to Rollo. The lands around Rouen became the core of the later Duchy of Normandy. El Normandy may have been used as a base when Scandinavian attacks on England were renewed at the end of the 10th century, which would have worsened relations between England and Normandy. In an effort to improve matters, King Aethel the Unready took Emma, sister of Richard II, Duke of Normandy, as his second wife in 1002. Danish raids on England continued, and Aethel sought help from Richard, taking refuge in Normandy in 1013 when King Swain I of Denmark drove Aethel and his family from England. Swain's death in 1014 allowed Aethel to return home, but Swain's son Cnut contested Aethelred's return. Aethel died unexpectedly in 1016, and Cnut became King of England. 
Ethel and Emma's two sons, Edward and Alfred, went into exile in Normandy while their mother, Emma, became Snut's second wife. After Snut's death in 1035, the English throne fell to Harold Harefoot, his son by his first wife, while Hartheknet, his son by Emma, became king in Denmark. England remained unstable. Alfred returned to England in 1036 to visit his mother and perhaps to challenge Harold as king. One story implicates Earl Godwin of Wessex in Alfred's subsequent death, but others blame Harold. Emma went into exile in Flanders until Hartheknet became king following Harold's death in 1040, and his half-brother Edward followed Hartheknet to England. Edward was proclaimed king after Hartheknet's death in June 1042. William faced several challenges on becoming duke, including his illegitimate birth and his youth. The evidence indicates that he was either seven or eight years old at the time. He enjoyed the support of his great-uncle, Archbishop Robert, as well as King Henry I of France, enabling him to succeed to his father's duchy. The support given to the exiled English princes in their attempt to return to England in 1036 shows that the new duke's guardians were attempting to continue his father's policies, but Archbishop Robert's death in March 1037 removed one of William's main supporters, and conditions in Normandy quickly descended into chaos. The anarchy in the duchy lasted until 1047, Ellen control of the young duke was one of the priorities of those contending for power. At first, Alan of Brittany had custody of the Duke, but when Alan died in either late 1039 or October 1040, Gilbert of Brienne took charge of William. Gilbert was killed within months, and another guardian, Turchetal, was also killed around the time of Gilbert's death. Yet another guardian, Osborne, was slain in the early 1040s in William's chamber while the Duke slept. It was said that Walter, William's maternal uncle, was occasionally forced to hide the young duke in the houses of peasants, although this story may be an embellishment by Odoric Vitalis. The historian Eleanor Searle speculates that William was raised with the three cousins who later became important in his career, William Fitzosborn, Roger de Beaumont, and Roger of Montgomery. Although many of the Norman nobles engaged in their own private wars and feuds during William's minority, the Viscounts still acknowledged the ducal government, and the ecclesiastical hierarchy was supportive of William. King Henry continued to support the young duke, but in late 1046 opponents of William came together in a rebellion centered in Lower Normandy, led by Guy of Burgundy with support from Nigel, Viscount of the Catenton, and Ranulf, Viscount of the Besson. According to stories that may have legendary elements, an attempt was made to seize William at Valens, but he escaped under cover of darkness, seeking refuge with King Henry. In early 1047 Henry and William returned to Normandy and were victorious at the Battle of Valais Dunes near Cain, although few details of the actual fighting are recorded. William of Poitiers claimed that the battle was won mainly through William's efforts, but earlier accounts claim that King Henry's men and leadership also played an important part. William assumed power in Normandy, and shortly after the battle promulgated the truce of God throughout his duchy, in an effort to limit warfare and violence by restricting the days of the year on which fighting was permitted. Although the Battle of Valais Dunes marked a turning point in William's control of the duchy, it was not the end of his struggle to gain the upper hand over the nobility. The period from 1047 to 1054 saw almost continuous warfare, with lesser crises continuing until 1060. William was born in 1027 or 1028 at Falaise, Duchy of Normandy, most likely towards the end of 1028. He was the only son of Robert I, son of Richard II. His mother Herleva was a daughter of Fulbert of Falaise. He may have been a tanner or embalmer. She was possibly a member of the ducal household, but did not marry Robert. She later married Herluin de Conteval, with whom she had two sons, Otto of Bayer and Count Robert of Mortain, and a daughter whose name is unknown. One of Herleva's brothers, Walter, became a supporter and protector of William during his minority. Robert also had a daughter, Adelaide, by another mistress. Robert I succeeded his elder brother Richard III as Duke on 6 August 1027. The brothers had been at odds over the succession, and Richard's death was sudden. 
Robert was accused by some writers of killing Richard, a plausible but now unprovable charge. Conditions in Normandy were unsettled, as noble families despoiled the church and Alan III of Brittany waged war against the duchy, possibly in an attempt to take control. By 1031 Robert had gathered considerable support from noblemen, many of whom would become prominent during William's life. They included the Duke's uncle Robert, the Archbishop of Rouen, who had originally opposed the Duke, Osborne, a nephew of Gunnar the wife of Richard I, and Gilbert of Brienne, a grandson of Richard I. After his accession, Robert continued Norman support for the English princes Edward and Alfred, who were still in exile in northern France. There are indications that Robert may have been briefly betrothed to a daughter of King C. and U. T., but no marriage took place. It is unclear if William would have been supplanted in the ducal succession if Robert had had a legitimate son. Earlier dukes had been illegitimate, and William's association with his father on ducal charters appears to indicate that William was considered Robert's most likely heir. In 1034 the duke decided to go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Although some of his supporters tried to dissuade him from undertaking the journey, he convened a council in January 1035 and had the assembled Norman magnates swear fealty to William as his heir before leaving for Jerusalem. He died in early July at Nicer, on his way back to Normandy. Consolidation of power William's next efforts were against Guy of Burgundy, who retreated to his castle at Brienne, which William besieged. After a long effort, the duke succeeded in exiling Guy in 1050. To address the growing power of the Count of Anjou, Geoffrey Martel, William joined with King Henry in a campaign against him, the last known cooperation between the two. They succeeded in capturing an Anjouan fortress, but accomplished little else. Geoffrey attempted to expand his authority into the county of Menay, especially after the death of Hugh I.V. of Menay in 1051. Central to the control of Menay were the holdings of the Bellum family, who held Bellum on the border of Menay and Normandy, as well as the fortresses at Alencon and Dimfront. Bellum's overlord was the King of France, but Dimfront was under the overlordship of Geoffrey Martel and Duke William was Alencon's overlord. The Bellum family, whose lands were quite strategically placed between their three different overlords, were able to play each of them against the other and secure virtual independence for themselves. On the death of Hugh of Menay, Geoffrey Martel occupied Menay in a move contested by William and King Henry, eventually, they succeeded in driving Geoffrey from the county, and in the process, William had been able to secure the Bellum family strongholds at Alencon and Dimfront for himself. He was thus able to assert his overlordship over the Bellum family and compel them to act consistently with Norman interests. However, in 1052 the king and Geoffrey Martel made common cause against William at the same time as some Norman nobles began to contest William's increasing power. Henry's about face was probably motivated by a desire to retain dominance over Normandy, which was now threatened by William's growing mastery of his duchy. The royal forces, which had overrun and were garrisoned in the fortresses at Dimfront and Alencon, promptly surrendered purely out of fear however, after hearing how not long into his journey upon leaving some of his men behind to besiege the royal fortress at Dimfront, William and his knights had stormed a small rebel garrison of townspeople, who had been taunting him over his mother coming from a family of tanners by beating animal skins against the walls, and in a fit of rage the duke had all of the survivors' hands and feet hacked off in revenge after he and his knights took and burned the garrison, thus allowing William to regain control of the greater part of Normandy for the time being. In 1053, William was engaged in military actions against his own nobles, as well as with the new Archbishop of Rouen, Marga. In February 1054 the king and the Norman rebels launched a double invasion of the duchy. Henry led the main thrust through the county of Evreux, while the other wing, under the king's brother Ordo, invaded eastern Normandy. William met the invasion by dividing his forces into two groups. The first, which he led, faced Henry. The second, which included some who became William's firm supporters, such as Robert, Count of EU, Walter Gifford, Roger of Mortimer, and William de Varenne, faced the other invading force. This second force defeated the invaders at the Battle of Mortimer. In addition to ending both invasions, 
the battle allowed the Duke's ecclesiastical supporters to depose Archbishop Marga. Mortimer thus marked another turning point in William's growing control of the duchy, although his conflict with the French king and the Count of Anjou continued until 1060. Henry and Geoffrey led another invasion of Normandy in 1057 but were defeated by William at the Battle of Wirreville. This was the last invasion of Normandy during William's lifetime. In 1058, William invaded the county of Dror and took Tillier's sur Avre and Thymert. Henry attempted to dislodge William, but the siege of Thymert dragged on for two years until Henry's death. The deaths of Count Geoffrey and the king in 1060 cemented the shift in the balance of power towards William. One factor in William's favour was his marriage to Matilda of Flanders, the daughter of Count Baldwin V of Flanders. The union was arranged in 1049, but Pope Leo IX forbade the marriage at the Council of Reims in October 1049. The marriage nevertheless went ahead some time in the early 1050s, possibly unsanctioned by the Pope. According to a late source not generally considered to be reliable, papal sanction was not secured until 1059, but as papal Norman relations in the 1050s were generally good, and Norman clergy were able to visit Rome in 1050 without incident, it was probably secured earlier. Papal sanction of the marriage appears to have required the founding of two monasteries in Cain, one by William and one by Matilda. The marriage was important in bolstering William's status, as Flanders was one of the more powerful French territories, with ties to the French royal house and to the German emperors. Contemporary writers considered the marriage, which produced four sons and five or six daughters, to be a success. Appearance and character No authentic portrait of William has been found. The contemporary depictions of him on the Bayer tapestry and on his seals and coins are conventional representations designed to assert his authority. There are some written descriptions of a burly and robust appearance, with a guttural voice. He enjoyed excellent health until old age, although he became quite fat in later life. He was strong enough to draw bows that others were unable to pull and had great stamina. Geoffrey Martel described him as without equal as a fighter and as a horseman. Examination of William's femur, the only bone to survive when the rest of his remains were destroyed, showed he was approximately 5 feet 10 inches 1.78 meters in height. There are records of two tutors for William during the late 1030s and early 1040s, but the extent of his literary education is unclear. He was not known as a patron of authors, and there is little evidence that he sponsored scholarship or other intellectual activities. Odoric Vitalis records that William tried to learn to read Old English late in life, but he was unable to devote sufficient time to the effort and quickly gave up. William's main hobby appears to have been hunting. His marriage to Matilda appears to have been quite affectionate, and there are no signs that he was unfaithful to her, unusual in a medieval monarch. Medieval writers criticized William for his greed and cruelty, but his personal piety was universally praised by contemporaries. Norman administration Norman government under William was similar to the government that had existed under earlier dukes. It was a fairly simple administrative system, built around the ducal household, which consisted of a group of officers including stewards, butlers, and marshals. The duke traveled constantly around the duchy, confirming charters and collecting revenues. Most of the income came from the ducal lands, as well as from tolls and a few taxes. This income was collected by the chamber, one of the household departments. William cultivated close relations with the church in his duchy. He took part in church councils and made several appointments to the Norman episcopate, including the appointment of Morelius as Archbishop of Rouen. Another important appointment was that of William's half-brother Ordo as Bishop of Bayer in either 1049 or 1050. He also relied on the clergy for advice, including Lanfranc, a non-Norman who rose to become one of William's prominent ecclesiastical advisers in the late 1040s and remained so throughout the 1050s and 1060s. William gave generously to the church, from 1035 to 1066, the Norman aristocracy founded at least 20 new monastic houses, including William's two monasteries in Cain, a remarkable expansion of religious life in the duchy.
English and continental concerns In 1051, the childless King Edward of England appears to have chosen William as his successor. William was the grandson of Edward's maternal uncle, Richard II of Normandy. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, in the D. version, states that William visited England in the later part of 1051, perhaps to secure confirmation of the succession, or perhaps William was attempting to secure aid for his troubles in Normandy. The trip is unlikely given William's absorption in warfare with Anjou at the time. Whatever Edward's wishes, it was likely that any claim by William would be opposed by Godwin, Earl of Wessex, a member of the most powerful family in England. Edward had married Edith, Godwin's daughter, in 1043, and Godwin appears to have been one of the main supporters of Edward's claim to the throne. By 1050, however, relations between the king and the earl had soured, culminating in a crisis in 1051 that led to the exile of Godwin and his family from England. It was during this exile that Edward offered the throne to William. Godwin returned from exile in 1052 with armed forces, and a settlement was reached between the king and the earl, restoring the earl and his family to their lands and replacing Robert of Jumiges, a Norman whom Edward had named Archbishop of Canterbury, with Stigand, the Bishop of Winchester. No English source mentions a supposed embassy by Archbishop Robert to William conveying the promise of the succession, and the two Norman sources that mention it, William of Jumiges and William of Poitiers, are not precise in their chronology of when this visit took place. Count Herbert II of Menet died in 1062, and William, who had betrothed his eldest son Robert to Herbert's sister Margaret, claimed the county through his son. Local nobles resisted the claim, but William invaded and by 1064 had secured control of the area. William appointed a Norman to the bishopric of Le Mains in 1065. He also allowed his son Robert Curthose to do homage to the new Count of Anjou, Geoffrey the Bearded. William's western border was thus secured, but his border with Brittany remained insecure. In 1064 William invaded Brittany in a campaign that remains obscure in its details. Its effect, though, was to destabilize Brittany, forcing the Duke, Conan II, to focus on internal problems rather than on expansion. Conan's death in 1066 further secured William's borders in Normandy. William also benefited from his campaign in Brittany by securing the support of some Breton nobles who went on to support the invasion of England in 1066. In England, Earl Godwin died in 1053 and his sons were increasing in power, Harold succeeded to his father's earldom, and another son, Tostig, became Earl of Northumbria. Other sons were granted earldoms later, Jaith as Earl of East Anglia in 1057 and Levine as Earl of Kent sometime between 1055 and 1057. Some sources claim that Harold took part in William's Breton campaign of 1064 and swore to uphold William's claim to the English throne at the end of the campaign, but no English source reports the strip, and it is unclear if it actually occurred. It may have been Norman propaganda designed to discredit Harold, who had emerged as the main contender to succeed King Edward. Meanwhile, another contender for the throne had emerged, Edward the Exile, son of Edmund Ironside and a grandson of Aethel II, returned to England in 1057, and although he died shortly after his return, he brought with him his family, which included two daughters, Margaret and Christina, and a son, Edgar the Aetheling. In 1065 Northumbria revolted against Tostig, and the rebels chose Morca, the younger brother of Edwin, Earl of Mercia, as Earl in place of Tostig. Harold, perhaps to secure the support of Edwin and Morca in his bid for the throne, supported the rebels and persuaded King Edward to replace Tostig with Morca. Tostig went into exile in Flanders, along with his wife Judith, who was the daughter of Baldwin IV, Count of Flanders. Edward was ailing, and he died on 5 January 1066. It is unclear what exactly happened at Edward's deathbed. One story, deriving from the Vita Edwardi, a biography of Edward, claims that he was attended by his wife Edith, Harold, Archbishop Stigand, and Robert Fitzwimark, and that the king named Harold as his successor. The Norman sources do not dispute the fact that Harold was named as the next king, but they declare that Harold's oath and Edward's earlier promise of the throne could not be changed on Edward's deathbed.
Later English sources stated that Harold had been elected as king by the clergy and magnates of England. Invasion of England Harold's preparations Harold was crowned on 6 January 1066 in Edward's new Norman-style Westminster Abbey, although some controversy surrounds who performed the ceremony. English sources claim that Eildred, the Archbishop of York, performed the ceremony, while Norman sources state that the coronation was performed by Stigand, who was considered a non-canonical archbishop by the papacy. Harold's claim to the throne was not entirely secure, however, as there were other claimants, perhaps including his exiled brother Tostig. King Harald Hardrader of Norway also had a claim to the throne as the uncle and heir of King Magnus I, who had made a pact with Harthiknet in about 1040 that if either Magnus or Harthiknet died without heirs, the other would succeed. The last claimant was William of Normandy, against whose anticipated invasion King Harald Godwinson made most of his preparations. Harald's brother Tostig made probing attacks along the southern coast of England in May 1066, landing at the Isle of Wight using a fleet supplied by Baldwin of Flanders. Tostig appears to have received little local support, and further raids into Lincolnshire and near the River Humber met with no more success, so he retreated to Scotland, where he remained for a time. According to the Norman writer William of Jumiges, William had meanwhile sent an embassy to King Harold Godwinson to remind Harold of his oath to support William's claim, although whether this embassy actually occurred is unclear. Harold assembled an army and a fleet to repel William's anticipated invasion force, deploying troops and ships along the English Channel for most of the summer. William's preparations William of Poitiers describes a council called by Duke William, in which the writer gives an account of a great debate that took place between William's nobles and supporters over whether to risk an invasion of England. Although some sort of formal assembly probably was held, it is unlikely that any debate took place, as the Duke had by then established control over his nobles, and most of those assembled would have been anxious to secure their share of the rewards from the conquest of England. William of Poitiers also relates that the Duke obtained the consent of Pope Alexander II for the invasion, along with the papal banner. The chronicler also claimed that the Duke secured the support of Henry IV, Holy Roman Emperor, and King Sven II of Denmark. Henry was still a minor, however, and Sven was more likely to support Harald, who could then help Sven against the Norwegian king, so these claims should be treated with caution. Although Alexander did give papal approval to the conquest after it succeeded, no other source claims papal support prior to the invasion. Events after the invasion, which included the penance William performed and statements by later popes, do lend circumstantial support to the claim of papal approval. To deal with Norman affairs, William put the government of Normandy into the hands of his wife for the duration of the invasion. Throughout the summer, William assembled an army and an invasion fleet in Normandy. Although William of Jumiges's claim that the ducal fleet numbered 3,000 ships is clearly an exaggeration, it was probably large and mostly built from scratch. Although William of Poitiers and William of Jumiges disagree about where the fleet was built, Poitiers states it was constructed at the mouth of the river Dives, while Jumiges states it was built at St. Valery sur Somme, both agree that it eventually sailed from Valery sur Somme. The fleet carried an invasion force that included, in addition to troops from William's own territories of Normandy and Maine, large numbers of mercenaries, allies, and volunteers from Brittany, northeastern France, and Flanders, together with smaller numbers from other parts of Europe. Although the army and fleet were ready by early August, Adverse winds kept the ships in Normandy until late September. There were probably other reasons for William's delay, including intelligence reports from England revealing that Harold's forces were deployed along the coast. William would have preferred to delay the invasion until he could make an unopposed landing. Harold kept his forces on alert throughout the summer, but with the arrival of the harvest season he disbanded his army on 8 September. Tostig and Hardrada's invasion Tostig Godwinson and Harald Hardrada invaded Northumbria in September 1066 and defeated the local forces under Morka and Edwin at the Battle of Fulford near York. King Harald received word of their invasion and marched north, defeating the invaders and killing Tostig and Hardrada on 25 September at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. 
The Norman fleet finally set sail two days later, landing in England at Pevensey Bay on the 28th of September. William then moved to Hastings, a few miles to the east, where he built a castle as a base of operations. From there, he ravaged the interior and waited for Harold's return from the north, refusing to venture far from the sea, his line of communication with Normandy. Battle of Hastings After defeating Harold Hardrader and Tostig, Harold left much of his army in the north, including Morcar and Edwin, and marched the rest south to deal with the threatened Norman invasion. He probably learned of William's landing while he was travelling south. Harold stopped in London, and was there for about a week before marching to Hastings, so it is likely that he spent about a week on his march south, averaging about 27 miles 43 kilometers per day, for the distance of approximately 200 miles 320 kilometers. Although Harold attempted to surprise the Normans, William's scouts reported the English arrival to the Duke. The exact events preceding the battle are obscure, with contradictory accounts in the sources, but all agree that William led his army from his castle and advanced towards the enemy. Harold had taken a defensive position at the top of Senlac Hill present-day battle, East Sussex, about 6 miles 9.7 kilometers from William's castle at Hastings. The battle began at about 9 a.m. on the 14th of October and lasted all day, but while a broad outline is known, the exact events are obscured by contradictory accounts in the sources. Although the numbers on each side were about equal, William had both cavalry and infantry, including many archers, while Harold had only foot soldiers and few, if any, archers. The English soldiers formed up as a shield wall along the ridge and were at first so effective that William's army was thrown back with heavy casualties. Some of William's Breton troops panicked and fled, and some of the English troops appear to have pursued the fleeing Bretons until they themselves were attacked and destroyed by Norman cavalry. During the Bretons' flight, rumours swept through the Norman forces that the Duke had been killed, but William succeeded in rallying his troops. Two further Norman retreats were feigned, to once again draw the English into pursuit and expose them to repeated attacks by the Norman cavalry. The available sources are more confused about events in the afternoon, but it appears that the decisive event was Harold's death, about which differing stories are told. William of Jumiges claimed that Harold was killed by the Duke. The Bayer tapestry has been claimed to show Harold's death by an arrow to the eye, but that may be a later reworking of the tapestry to conform to 12th century stories in which Harold was slain by an arrow wound to the head. Harold's body was identified the day after the battle, either through his armour or marks on his body. The English dead, who included some of Harold's brothers and his housecarls, were left on the battlefield. Jitha Thokal's datir, Harold's mother, offered the victorious duke the weight of her son's body in gold for its custody, but her offer was refused. William ordered that the body was to be thrown into the sea, but whether that took place is unclear. Waltham Abbey, which had been founded by Harold, later claimed that his body had been secretly buried there. March on London William may have hoped the English would surrender following his victory, but they did not. Instead, some of the English clergy and magnates nominated Edgar the Aetheling as king, though their support for Edgar was only lukewarm. After waiting a short while, William secured Dover, parts of Kent, and Canterbury, while also sending a force to capture Winchester, where the royal treasury was. These captures secured William's rear areas and also his line of retreat to Normandy, if that was needed. William then marched to Southwark, across the Thames from London, which he reached in late November. Next he led his forces around the south and west of London, burning along the way. He finally crossed the Thames at Wallingford in early December. Stigand submitted to William there, and when the Duke moved on to Berkhamsted soon afterwards, Edgar the Aetheling, Morka, Edwin, and Eildred also submitted. William then sent forces into London to construct the castle. He was crowned at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day 1066. First actions William remained in England after his coronation and tried to reconcile the native magnates. The remaining earls, Edwin of Mercia, Morka of Northumbria, and Waldeb of Northampton, were confirmed in their lands and titles. Waldeb was married to William's niece Judith, daughter of Adelaide, 
and a marriage between Edwin and one of William's daughters was proposed. Edgar VIII Helling also appears to have been given lands. Ecclesiastical offices continued to be held by the same bishops as before the invasion, including the uncanonical Stigand. But the families of Harold and his brothers lost their lands, as did some others who had fought against William at Hastings. By March, William was secure enough to return to Normandy, but he took with him Stigand, Morca, Edwin, Edgar, and Waldo. He left his half-brother Ordo, the Bishop of Bayer, in charge of England along with another influential supporter, William Fitzosbin, the son of his former guardian. Both men were also named to earldoms, Fitzosbin to Hereford or Wessex and Ordo to Kent. Although he put two Normans in overall charge, he retained many of the native English sheriffs. Once in Normandy the new English king went to Rouen and the Abbey of Fecamp, and then attended the consecration of new churches at two Norman monasteries. While William was in Normandy, a former ally, Eustace, the Count of Boulogne, invaded at Dover but was repulsed. English resistance had also begun, with Edric the Wild attacking Hereford and revolts at Exeter, where Harold's mother Jitha was a focus of resistance. Fitzosbin and Ordo found it difficult to control the native population and undertook a program of castle building to maintain their hold on the kingdom. William returned to England in December 1067 and marched on Exeter, which he besieged. The town held out for 18 days, and after it fell to William he built a castle to secure his control. Harold's sons were meanwhile raiding the southwest of England from a base in Ireland. Their forces landed near Bristol but were defeated by Ednoth. By Easter, William was at Winchester, where he was soon joined by his wife Matilda, who was crowned in May 1068. English resistance main article, harrying of the north in 1068 Edwin and Mocha revolted, supported by Ghost Patrick, Earl of Northumbria. The chronicler Ordaric Vitalis states that Edwin's reason for revolting was that the proposed marriage between himself and one of William's daughters had not taken place, but another reason probably included the increasing power of Fitzosbin in Herefordshire, which affected Edwin's power within his own earldom. The king marched through Edwin's lands and built Warwick Castle. Edwin and Morca submitted, but William continued on to York, building York and Nottingham castles before returning south. On his southbound journey, he began constructing Lincoln, Huntingdon, and Cambridge castles. William placed supporters in charge of these new fortifications, among them William Peveril at Nottingham and Henry the Beaumont at Warwick. Then the king returned to Normandy late in 1068. Early in 1069, Edgar VIII Helling rose in revolt and attacked York. Although William returned to York and built another castle, Edgar remained free, and in the autumn he joined up with King Sven. The Danish king had brought a large fleet to England and attacked not only York but Exeter and Shrewsbury. York was captured by the combined forces of Edgar and Sven. Edgar was proclaimed king by his supporters. William responded swiftly, ignoring a continental revolt in Mene, and symbolically wore his crown in the ruins of York on Christmas Day 1069. He then proceeded to buy off the Danes. He marched to the River Tees, ravaging the countryside as he went. Edgar, having lost much of his support, fled to Scotland, where King Malcolm III was married to Edgar's sister Margaret. Waldo, who had joined the revolt, submitted, along with Ghost Patrick, and both were allowed to retain their lands. But William was not finished, he marched over the Pennines during the winter and defeated the remaining rebels at Shrewsbury before building Chester and Stafford castles. This campaign, which included the burning and destruction of part of the countryside that the royal forces marched through, is usually known as the Harrying of the North. It was over by April 1070, when William wore his crown ceremonially for Easter at Winchester. Church affairs While at Winchester in 1070, William met with three papal legates, John Minutus, Peter, and Ermanfred of Sion, who had been sent by the Pope. The legate ceremonially crowned William during the Easter court. The historian David Bates sees this coronation as the ceremonial papal, seal of approval, for William's conquest. The legates and the king then proceeded to hold a series of ecclesiastical councils dedicated to reforming and reorganizing the English church. Stigand and his brother, Ethelmere, the bishop of Elmham, were deposed from their bishoprics. 
Some of the native abbots were also deposed, both at the council held near Easter and at a further one near Whitson. The Whitson Council saw the appointment of Lanfranc as the new Archbishop of Canterbury, and Thomas of Bayer as the new Archbishop of York, to replace Hildred, who had died in September 1069. William's half-brother Otto perhaps expected to be appointed to Canterbury, but William probably did not wish to give that much power to a family member. Another reason for the appointment may have been pressure from the papacy to appoint Lanfranc. Norman clergy were appointed to replace the deposed bishops and abbots, and at the end of the process, only two native English bishops remained in office, along with several continental prelates appointed by Edward the Confessor. In 1070 William also founded Battle Abbey, a new monastery at the site of the Battle of Hastings, partly as a penance for the deaths in the battle and partly as a memorial to the dead. At an ecclesiastical council held in Lilbon in 1080, he was confirmed in his ultimate authority over the Norman Church. Revolt of the Earls in 1075, during William's absence, Ralph the Gale, the Earl of Norfolk, and Roger the Bretoy, the Earl of Hereford, conspired to overthrow William in the Revolt of the Earls. Ralph was at least part Breton and had spent most of his life prior to 1066 in Brittany, where he still had lands. Roger was a Norman, son of William Fitzosburn, but had inherited less authority than his father held. Ralph's authority seems also to have been less than his predecessors in the earldom, and this was likely the cause of his involvement in the revolt. The exact reason for the rebellion is unclear, but it was launched at the wedding of Ralph to a relative of Roger, held at Uxning in Suffolk. Waldo, the Earl of Northumbria, although one of William's favourites, was also involved, and there were some Breton lords who were ready to rebel in support of Ralph and Roger. Ralph also requested Danish aid. William remained in Normandy while his men in England subdued the revolt. Roger was unable to leave his stronghold in Herefordshire because of efforts by Wolfston, the Bishop of Worcester, and Aethelwig, the Abbot of Evesham. Ralph was bottled up in Norwich Castle by the combined efforts of Otto of Bayer, Geoffrey de Montbray, Richard Fitzgilbert, and William de Warren. Ralph eventually left Norwich in the control of his wife and left England, finally ending up in Brittany. Norwich was besieged and surrendered, with the garrison allowed to go to Brittany. Meanwhile, the Danish king's brother, CNUT, had finally arrived in England with a fleet of 200 ships, but he was too late as Norwich had already surrendered. The Danes then raided along the coast before returning home. William returned to England later in 1075 to deal with the Danish threat, leaving his wife Matilda in charge of Normandy. He celebrated Christmas at Winchester and dealt with the aftermath of the rebellion. Roger and Waldorf were kept in prison, where Waldorf was executed in May 1076. Before this, William had returned to the continent, where Ralph had continued the rebellion from Brittany. Danish raids and rebellion Although Sven had promised to leave England, he returned in spring 1070, raiding along the Humber in East Anglia toward the Isle of Eli, where he joined up with Herewood the Wake, a local then. Havard's forces attacked Peterborough Abbey, which they captured and looted. William was able to secure the departure of Sven and his fleet in 1070, allowing him to return to the continent to deal with troubles in Mene, where the town of Lermains had revolted in 1069. Another concern was the death of Count Baldwin VI of Flanders in July 1070, which led to a succession crisis as his widow, Richard, was ruling for their two young sons, Arnulf and Baldwin. Her rule, however, was contested by Robert, Baldwin's brother. Richard proposed marriage to William Fitzosburn, who was in Normandy, and Fitzosburn accepted. But after he was killed in February 1071 at the Battle of Castle, Robert became count. He was opposed to King William's power on the continent, thus the Battle of Castle upset the balance of power in northern France in addition to costing William an important supporter. In 1071 William defeated the last rebellion of the north. Earl Edwin was betrayed by his own men and killed, while William built a causeway to subdue the Isle of Eli, where Herewood the Wake and Mocha were hiding. Herewood escaped, but Mocha was captured, deprived of his earldom, and imprisoned. 
In 1072 William invaded Scotland, defeating Malcolm, who had recently invaded the north of England. William and Malcolm agreed to peace by signing the Treaty of Abernethy, and Malcolm probably gave up his son Duncan as a hostage for the peace. Perhaps another stipulation of the treaty was the expulsion of Edgar VIII Helling from Malcolm's court. William then turned his attention to the continent, returning to Normandy in early 1073 to deal with the invasion of Mene by Fulkler Reckham, the Count of Anjou. With a swift campaign, William seized Le Mains from Fulk's forces, completing the campaign by 30 March 1073. This made William's power more secure in northern France, but the new Count of Flanders accepted Edgar VIII Helling into his court. Robert also married his half-sister Bertha to King Philip I of France, who was opposed to Norman power. William returned to England to release his army from service in 1073 but quickly returned to Normandy, where he spent all of 1074. He left England in the hands of his supporters, including Richard Fitzgilbert and William de Varenne, as well as Lanfranc. William's ability to leave England for an entire year was a sign that he felt that his control of the kingdom was secure. While William was in Normandy, Edgar VIII Helling returned to Scotland from Flanders. The French king, seeking a focus for those opposed to William's power, then proposed that Edgar be given the castle of montreuil sur mer on the Channel, which would have given Edgar a strategic advantage against William. Edgar was forced to submit to William shortly thereafter, however, and he returned to William's court. Philip, although thwarted in this attempt, turned his attentions to Brittany, leading to a revolt in 1075. Troubles at home and abroad Earl Ralph had secured control of the castle at Dole, and in September 1076 William advanced into Brittany and laid siege to the castle. King Philip of France later relieved the siege and defeated William at the Battle of Dole in 1076, forcing him to retreat back to Normandy. Although this was William's first defeat in battle, it did little to change things. An Anjouan attack on Mene was defeated in late 1076 or 1077, with Count Fulkler Reckham wounded in the unsuccessful attack. More serious was the retirement of Simon the Creepy, the Count of Amiens, to a monastery. Before he became a monk, Simon handed his county of the Wakesen over to King Philip. The Wakesen was a buffer state between Normandy and the lands of the French king, and Simon had been a supporter of William. William was able to make peace with Philip in 1077 and secured a truce with Count Fulk in late 1077 or early 1078. In late 1077 or early 1078 trouble began between William and his eldest son, Robert. Although Odoric Vitalis describes it as starting with a quarrel between Robert and his two younger brothers, William and Henry, including the story that the quarrel was started when William and Henry threw water at Robert, it is much more likely that Robert was feeling powerless. Odoric relates that he had previously demanded control of Mene and Normandy and had been rebuffed. The trouble in 1077 or 1078 resulted in Robert leaving Normandy accompanied by a band of young men, many of them the sons of William's supporters. Included among them was Robert of Bellum, William the Bretoy, and Roger, the son of Richard Fitzgilbert. This band of young men went to the castle at Remelid, where they proceeded to raid into Normandy. The raiders were supported by many of William's continental enemies. William immediately attacked the rebels and drove them from Remelid, but King Philip gave them the castle at Gerberoy, where they were joined by new supporters. William then laid siege to Gerberoy in January 1079. After three weeks, the besieged forces sallied from the castle and managed to take the besiegers by surprise. William was enhorsed by Robert and was only saved from death by an Englishman, Toki son of Wigod, who was himself killed. William's forces were forced to lift the siege, and the king returned to Rouen. By 12 April 1080, William and Robert had reached an accommodation, with William once more affirming that Robert would receive Normandy when he died. Word of William's defeat at Gerberoy stirred up difficulties in northern England. In August and September 1079 King Malcolm of Scots raided south of the River Tweed, devastating the land between the River Tees and the Tweed in a raid that lasted almost a month. The lack of Norman response appears to have caused the Northumbrians to grow restive, 
and in the spring of 1080 they rebelled against the rule of William Walcher, the Bishop of Durham and Earl of Northumbria. Walcher was killed on the 14th of May 1080, and the king dispatched his half-brother Ordo to deal with the rebellion. William departed Normandy in July 1080, and in the autumn his son Robert was sent on a campaign against the Scots. Robert raided into Lothian and forced Malcolm to agree to terms, building a fortification at Newcastle. At Newcastle upon Tyne while returning to England. The king was at Gloucester for Christmas 1080 and at Winchester for Whitson in 1081, ceremonially wearing his crown on both occasions. A papal embassy arrived in England during this period, asking that William do fealty for England to the papacy, a request that he rejected. William also visited Wales during 1081, although the English and the Welsh sources differ on the exact purpose of the visit. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle states that it was a military campaign, but Welsh sources record it as a pilgrimage to St. David's in honour of St. David. William's biographer David Bates argues that the former explanation is more likely, explaining that the balance of power had recently shifted in Wales and that William would have wished to take advantage of the changed circumstances to extend Norman power. By the end of 1081, William was back on the continent, dealing with disturbances in Maine. Although he led an expedition into Maine, the result was instead a negotiated settlement arranged by a papal legate. Troubles at home and abroad Earl Ralph had secured control of the castle at Dole, and in September 1076 William advanced into Brittany and laid siege to the castle. King Philip of France later relieved the siege and defeated William at the Battle of Dole in 1076, forcing him to retreat back to Normandy. Although this was William's first defeat in battle, it did little to change things. An Anjouan attack on Mene was defeated in late 1076 or 1077, with Count Fulkler Reckham wounded in the unsuccessful attack. More serious was the retirement of Simon the Creepy, the Count of Amiens, to a monastery. Before he became a monk, Simon handed his county of the Wakesen over to King Philip. The Wakesen was a buffer state between Normandy and the lands of the French king, and Simon had been a supporter of William. William was able to make peace with Philip in 1077 and secured a truce with Count Fulk in late 1077 or early 1078. In late 1077 or early 1078 trouble began between William and his eldest son, Robert. Although Orderic Vitalis describes it as starting with a quarrel between Robert and his two younger brothers, William and Henry, including the story that the quarrel was started when William and Henry threw water at Robert, it is much more likely that Robert was feeling powerless. Odaric relates that he had previously demanded control of Mene and Normandy and had been rebuffed. The trouble in 1077 or 1078 resulted in Robert leaving Normandy accompanied by a band of young men, many of them the sons of William's supporters. Included among them was Robert of Bellum, William the Bretoy, and Roger, the son of Richard Fitzgilbert. This band of young men went to the castle at Remelid, where they proceeded to raid into Normandy. The raiders were supported by many of William's continental enemies. William immediately attacked the rebels and drove them from Remelid, but King Philip gave them the castle at Gerberoy, where they were joined by new supporters. William then laid siege to Gerberoy in January 1079. After three weeks, the besieged forces sallied from the castle and managed to take the besiegers by surprise. William was enhorsed by Robert and was only saved from death by an Englishman, Toki son of Wigod, who was himself killed. William's forces were forced to lift the siege, and the king returned to Rouen. By the 12th of April 1080, William and Robert had reached an accommodation, with William once more affirming that Robert would receive Normandy when he died. Word of William's defeat at Gerberoy stirred up difficulties in northern England. In August and September 1079 King Malcolm of Scots raided south of the River Tweed, devastating the land between the River Tees and the Tweed in a raid that lasted almost a month. The lack of Norman response appears to have caused the Northumbrians to grow restive, and in the spring of 1080 they rebelled against the rule of William Walcher, the Bishop of Durham and Earl of Northumbria. Walcher was killed on the 14th of May 1080, and the king dispatched his half-brother Ordo to deal with the rebellion.
William departed Normandy in July 1080, and in the autumn his son Robert was sent on a campaign against the Scots. Robert raided into Lothian and forced Malcolm to agree to terms, building a fortification at Newcastle. At Newcastle upon Tyne while returning to England. The king was at Gloucester for Christmas 1080 and at Winchester for Whitson in 1081, ceremonially wearing his crown on both occasions. A papal embassy arrived in England during this period, asking that William do fealty for England to the papacy, a request that he rejected. William also visited Wales during 1081, although the English and the Welsh sources differ on the exact purpose of the visit. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle states that it was a military campaign, but Welsh sources record it as a pilgrimage to St. David's in honour of St. David. William's biographer David Bates argues that the former explanation is more likely, explaining that the balance of power had recently shifted in Wales and that William would have wished to take advantage of the changed circumstances to extend Norman power. By the end of 1081, William was back on the continent, dealing with disturbances in Maine. Although he led an expedition into Maine, the result was instead a negotiated settlement arranged by a papal legate. The name Charlemagne, by which the emperor is normally known in English, comes from the French Charles Le Magne, meaning, Charles the Great. In modern German, Karl der Gross has the same meaning. His given name was simply Charles, Latin Carolus, Old High German Carlus, Romance Carlo. He was named after his grandfather, Charles Martel, a choice which intentionally marked him as Martel's true heir. The nickname Magnus Great may have been associated him already in his lifetime, but this is not certain. The contemporary Latin royal Frankish annals routinely call him Carolus Magnus Rex, Charles the Great King. As a nickname, it is only certainly attested in the works of the poet Saxo around 900 and it only became standard in all the lands of his former empire around 1000. By the 6th century, the western Germanic tribe of the Franks had been Christianized, due in considerable measure to the Catholic conversion of Clovis I. Francia, ruled by the Merovingians, was the most powerful of the kingdoms that succeeded the western Roman Empire. Following the Battle of Tertri, the Merovingians declined into powerlessness, for which they have been dubbed the Waffenons to nothing kings. Almost all government powers were exercised by their chief officer, the mayor of the palace. In 687, Pepin of Herstal, mayor of the palace of Austrasia, ended the strife between various kings and their mayors with his victory at Tertri. He became the sole governor of the entire Frankish kingdom. Pepin was the grandson of two important figures of the Austrasian kingdom, Saint Arnulf of Metz and Pepin of Landen. Pepin of Herstal was eventually succeeded by his son Charles, later known as Charles Martel Charles the Hammer. After 737, Charles governed the Franks in lieu of a king and declined to call himself king. Charles was succeeded in 741 by his sons Carloman and Pepin the Short, the father of Charlemagne. In 743, the brothers placed Childeric III on the throne to curb separatism in the periphery. He was the last Merovingian king. Carloman resigned office in 746, preferring to enter the church as a monk. Pepin brought the question of the kingship before Pope Zachary, asking whether it was logical for a king to have no royal power. The Pope handed down his decision in 749, decreeing that it was better for Pepin to be called king, as he had the powers of high office as mayor, so as not to confuse the hierarchy. He, therefore, ordered him to become the true king. In 750, Pepin was elected by an assembly of the Franks, anointed by the archbishop, and then raised to the office of king. The Pope branded Childeric III as the false king and ordered him into a monastery. The Merovingian dynasty was thereby replaced by the Carolingian dynasty, named after Charles Martel. In 753, Pope Stephen II fled from Italy to Francia, appealing to Pepin for assistance for the rights of Saint Peter. He was supported in this appeal by Carloman, Charles' brother. In return, the Pope could provide only legitimacy.
He did this by again anointing and confirming Pepin, this time adding his young sons Carolus, Charlemagne, and Carloman to the royal patrimony. They thereby became heirs to the realm that already covered most of Western Europe. In 754, Pepin accepted the Pope's invitation to visit Italy on behalf of St. Peter's rites, dealing successfully with the Lombards. Under the Carolingians, the Frankish kingdom spread to encompass an area including most of Western Europe, the east-west division of the kingdom formed the basis for modern France and Germany. Oman portrays the Treaty of Verdun 843, between the warring grandsons of Charlemagne as the foundation event of an independent France under its first king Charles the Bald, an independent Germany under its first king Louis the German, and an independent intermediate state stretching from the Low Countries along the borderlands to south of Rome under Lothair I, who retained the title of emperor and the capitals Aachen and Rome without the jurisdiction. The Middle Kingdom had broken up by 890 and partly absorbed into the Western Kingdom, later France, and the Eastern Kingdom, Germany, and the rest developing into smaller, buffer, nations that exist between France and Germany to this day, namely Benelux and Switzerland. Charlemagne was the eldest son of Pepin the Short and Bertrada of Loan, born before their canonical marriage. He became king of the Franks in 768 following his father's death, initially as co-ruler with his brother Carloman I, until the latter's death in 771. As sole ruler, he continued his father's policy towards the papacy and became its protector, removing the Lombards from power in northern Italy and leading an incursion into Muslim Spain. He campaigned against the Saxons to his east, Christianizing them upon penalty of death and leading to events such as the massacre of Wadden. He reached the height of his power in 800 when he was crowned, Emperor of the Romans, by Pope Leo III on Christmas Day at Old St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Charlemagne has been called the father of Europe, Peter Europi, as he united most of Western Europe for the first time since the classical era of the Roman Empire and united parts of Europe that had never been under Frankish or Roman rule. His rule spurred the Carolingian Renaissance, a period of energetic cultural and intellectual activity within the Western Church. The Eastern Orthodox Church viewed Charlemagne less favorably due to his support of the Filioque and the Pope's having preferred him as emperor over the Byzantine Empire's first female monarch, Irene of Athens. These and other disputes led to the eventual later split of Rome and Constantinople in the Great Schism of 1054. Charlemagne died in 814. He was laid to rest in the Aachen Cathedral, in his imperial capital city of Aachen. Charlemagne married at least four times, and had three legitimate sons who lived to adulthood. Only the youngest of them, Louis the Pious, survived to succeed him. He also had numerous illegitimate children with his concubines. By the 6th century, the Western Germanic tribe of the Franks had been Christianized, due in considerable measure to the Catholic conversion of Clovis I. Francia, ruled by the Merovingians, was the most powerful of the kingdoms that succeeded the Western Roman Empire. Following the Battle of Tertri, the Merovingians declined into powerlessness, for which they have been dubbed the Waffenons to nothing kings. Almost all government powers were exercised by their chief officer, the mayor of the palace. In 687, Pepin of Herstal, mayor of the palace of Austrasia, ended the strife between various kings and their mayors with his victory at Tertri. He became the sole governor of the entire Frankish kingdom. Pepin was the grandson of two important figures of the Austrasian kingdom, Saint Arnulf of Metz and Pepin of Landen. Pepin of Herstal was eventually succeeded by his son Charles, later known as Charles Martel Charles the Hammer. After 737, Charles governed the Franks in lieu of a king and declined to call himself king. Charles was succeeded in 741 by his sons Carloman and Pepin the Short, the father of Charlemagne. In 743, the brothers placed Childeric III on the throne to curb separatism in the periphery. He was the last Merovingian king. Carloman resigned office in 746, preferring to enter the church as a monk. Pepin brought the question of the kingship before Pope Zachary, asking whether it was logical for a king to have no royal power. The Pope handed down his decision in 749, 
decreeing that it was better for Pepin to be called king, as he had the powers of high office as mayor, so as not to confuse the hierarchy. He, therefore, ordered him to become the true king. In 750, Pepin was elected by an assembly of the Franks, anointed by the archbishop, and then raised to the office of king. The Pope branded Childaric III as the false king and ordered him into a monastery. The Merovingian dynasty was thereby replaced by the Carolingian dynasty, named after Charles Martel. In 753, Pope Stephen II fled from Italy to Francia, appealing to Pepin for assistance for the rights of Saint Peter. He was supported in this appeal by Carloman, Charles' brother. In return, the Pope could provide only legitimacy. He did this by again anointing and confirming Pepin, this time adding his young sons Carolus Charlemagne and Carloman to the royal patrimony. They thereby became heirs to the realm that already covered most of Western Europe. In 754, Pepin accepted the Pope's invitation to visit Italy on behalf of St. Peter's rites, dealing successfully with the Lombards. Under the Carolingians, the Frankish kingdom spread to encompass an area including most of Western Europe, the east-west division of the kingdom formed the basis for modern France and Germany. Oman portrays the Treaty of Verdun 843 between the warring grandsons of Charlemagne as the foundation event of an independent France under its first king Charles the Bald, an independent Germany under its first king Louis the German, and an independent intermediate state stretching from the Low Countries along the borderlands to south of Rome under Lothair I, who retained the title of emperor and the capitals Aachen and Rome without the jurisdiction. The Middle Kingdom had broken up by 890 and partly absorbed into the Western Kingdom, later France, and the Eastern Kingdom, Germany, and the rest developing into smaller, buffer, nations that exist between France and Germany to this day, namely Benelux and Switzerland. The most likely date of Charlemagne's birth is reconstructed from several sources. The date of 742, calculated from Einhard's date of death of January 814 at age 72, predates the marriage of his parents in 744. The year given in the Annal Petaviani, 747, would be more likely, except that it contradicts Einhard and a few other sources in making Charlemagne 67 years old at his death. The month and day of the 2nd of April are based on a calendar from Lush Abbey. In 747, Easter fell on the 2nd of April, a coincidence that likely would have been remarked upon by chroniclers but was not. If Easter was being used as the beginning of the calendar year, then the 2nd of April 747 could have been, by modern reckoning, April 748, not on Easter. The date favoured by the preponderance of evidence is the 2nd of April 742, based on Charlemagne's age at the time of his death. This date supports the concept that Charlemagne was technically an illegitimate child, although that is not mentioned by Einhard in either since he was born out of wedlock, Pepin and Bertrada were bound by a private contract of Fredelehe at the time of his birth, but did not marry until 744. Charlemagne's exact birthplace is unknown, although historians have suggested Aachen in modern-day Germany, and Liege Herstal in present-day Belgium as possible locations. Aachen and Liege are close to the region whence the Merovingian and Carolingian families originated. Other cities have been suggested, including Durren, Gotting, Merlinburch, Quaisy, and Prom. No definitive evidence resolves the question. The Latin chronicles of the end of Visigothic Hispania omit many details, such as identification of characters, filling in the gaps and reconciliation of numerous contradictions. Muslim sources, however, present a more coherent view, such as in the Tik Hiftatar al Andalus, History of the Conquest of al Andalus. By Ibn al Qutia, the son of the Gothic woman, referring to the granddaughter of Witiza, the last Visigothic king of a united Hispania, who married a Moor. Ibn al Qutia, who had another, much longer name, must have been relying to some degree on family oral tradition. According to Ibn al Qutia Witiza, the last Visigothic king of a united Hispania died before his three sons, Almund, Romulo, and Ardabast reached maturity. Their mother was queen regent at Toledo, but Roderick, army chief of staff, 
staged a rebellion, capturing Cordoba. He chose to impose a joint rule over distinct jurisdictions on the true heirs. Evidence of a division of some sort can be found in the distribution of coins imprinted with the name of each king and in the king lists. Witiza was succeeded by Roderick, who reigned for seven and a half years, followed by Achilla Aquila, who reigned three and a half years. If the reigns of both terminated with the incursion of the Saracens, then Roderick appears to have reigned a few years before the majority of Achilla. The latter's kingdom is securely placed to the northeast, while Roderick seems to have taken the rest, notably modern Portugal. The Saracens crossed the mountains to claim Ardo's Septimania, only to encounter the vast dynasty of Aquitaine, always the allies of the Goths. Ardo the Great of Aquitaine was at first victorious at the Battle of Toulouse in 721. Saracen troops gradually massed in Septimania and in 732 an army under Emir Abdul Rahman al Ghafiki advanced into Vasconia, and Ardo was defeated at the Battle of the River Garonne. They took Bordeaux and were advancing towards Tours when Ardo, powerless to stop them, appealed to his arch enemy, Charles Martel, mayor of the Franks. In one of the first of the lightning marches for which the Carolingian kings became famous, Charles and his army appeared in the path of the Saracens between Tours and Poitiers, and in the Battle of Tours decisively defeated and killed Al Ghafiki. The Moors returned twice more, each time suffering defeat at Charles' hands, at the River Bere near Narbonne in 737 and in the Dauphine in 740. Odo's price for salvation from the Saracens was incorporation into the Frankish kingdom, a decision that was repugnant to him and also to his heirs. Loss and recovery of Aquitaine after the death of his father, Hanaldi allied himself with Free Lombardy. However, Odo had ambiguously left the kingdom jointly to his two sons, Hanald and Hatto. The latter, loyal to Francia, now went to war with his brother over full possession. Victorious, Hanald blinded and imprisoned his brother, only to be so stricken by conscience that he resigned and entered the church as a monk to do penance. The story is told in Anal Metensis Prios. His son Baffer took an early inheritance, becoming Duke of Aquitaine and ratified the alliance with Lombardy. Waffer decided to honor it, repeating his father's decision, which he justified by arguing that any agreements with Charles Martel became invalid on Martel's death. Since Aquitaine was now Pepin's inheritance because of the earlier assistance that was given by Charles Martel, according to some the latter and his son, the young Charles, hunted down Waffer, who could only conduct the guerrilla war, and executed him. Among the contingents of the Frankish army were Bavarians under Tassilo III, Duke of Bavaria, and Agilofing, the hereditary Bavarian ducal family. Grifo had installed himself as Duke of Bavaria, but Pepin replaced him with a member of the ducal family yet a child, Tassilo, whose protector he had become after the death of his father. The loyalty of the Agilolfings was perpetually in question, but Pepin exacted numerous oaths of loyalty from Tassilo. However, the latter had married Liotperga, a daughter of Decidrius, king of Lombardy. At a critical point in the campaign, Tassilo left the field with all his Bavarians. Out of reach of Pepin, he repudiated all loyalty to Francia. Pepin had no chance to respond as he grew ill and died within a few weeks after Waffer's execution. The first event of the brothers' reign was the uprising of the Aquitanians and Gascons, in 769, in that territory split between the two kings. One year earlier, Pepin had finally defeated Waffer, Duke of Aquitaine, after waging a destructive, ten-year war against Aquitaine. Now, Hanol too led the Aquitanians as far north as Angoulême. Charles met Carloman, but Carloman refused to participate and returned to Burgundy. Charles went to war, leading an army to Bordeaux, where he set up a fort at Franzac. Hanold was forced to flee to the court of Duke Lupus II of Gascony. Lupus, fearing Charles, turned Hanold over in exchange for peace, and Hanold was put in a monastery. Gascon lords also surrendered, and Aquitaine and Gascony were finally fully subdued by the Franks. Marriage to Desiderata the brothers maintained lukewarm relations with the assistance of their mother Bertrada, 
but in 770 Charles signed a treaty with Duke Tassilo III of Bavaria and married a Lombard princess, commonly known today as Desiderata, the daughter of King Desiderius, to surround Carloman with his own allies. Though Pope Stephen III first opposed the marriage with the Lombard princess, he found little to fear from a Frankish Lombard alliance. Less than a year after his marriage, Charlemagne repudiated Desiderata and married a 13-year-old Swabian named Hildegard. The repudiated Desiderata returned to her father's court at Pavia. Her father's wrath was now aroused, and he would have gladly allied with Carloman to defeat Charles. Before any open hostilities could be declared, however, Carloman died on 5 December 771, apparently of natural causes. Carloman's widow Gerberger fled to Desiderius court with her sons for protection. Ambiguous high office the most powerful officers of the Frankish people, the mayor of the palace Mayor Domus, and one or more king's rex, regis were appointed by the election of the people. Elections were not periodic, but were held as required to elect officers ad quo summa imperi pertinbat, to whom the highest matters of state pertained. Evidently, interim decisions could be made by the Pope, which ultimately needed to be ratified using an assembly of the people that met annually. Before he was elected king in 751, Pepin was initially a mayor, a high office he held, as though hereditary, velut hereditario fingerbecher. Einhard explains that, the honor, was usually, given by the people, to the distinguished, but Pepin the Great and his brother Carloman the Wise received it as though hereditary, as had their father, Charles Martel. There was, however, a certain ambiguity about quasi-inheritance. The office was treated as joint property, one mayorship held by two brothers jointly. Each, however, had his own geographic jurisdiction. When Carloman decided to resign, becoming ultimately a Benedictine at Monte Cassino, the question of the disposition of his quasi-share was settled by the Pope. He converted the mayorship into a kingship and awarded the joint property to Pepin, who gained the right to pass it on by inheritance. This decision was not accepted by all family members. Carloman had consented to the temporary tenancy of his own share, which he intended to pass on to his son, Drogo, when the inheritance should be settled at someone's death. By the Pope's decision, in which Pepin had a hand, Drogo was to be disqualified as an heir in favour of his cousin Charles. He took up arms in opposition to the decision and was joined by Grifo, a half-brother of Pepin and Carloman, who had been given a share by Charles Martel, but was stripped of it and held under loose arrest by his half-brothers after an attempt to seize their shares by military action. Grifo perished in combat in the Battle of St. Jean de Maurienne while Drogo was hunted down and taken into custody. On the death of Pepin, the 24th of September 768, the kingship passed jointly to his sons, with divine assent, Divino Nutu. According to the life, Pepin died in Paris. The Franks, in general assembly, generally conventu, gave them both the rank of a king regis, but, partitioned the whole body of the kingdom equally, totem regni corpus ex equo parterentia. The annals tell a slightly different version, with the king dying at St. Denis, near Paris. The two, lords, Domni, were, elevated to kingship, eleventy sunt in regnum Charles on the 9th of October in Noyon, Carloman on an unspecified date in Sassons. If born in 742, Charles was 26 years old, but he had been campaigning at his father's right hand for several years, which may help to account for his military skill. Carloman was 17. The language, in either case, suggests that there were not two inheritances, which would have created distinct kings ruling over distinct kingdoms, but a single joint inheritance in a joint kingship tenanted by two equal kings, Charles and his brother Carloman. As before, distinct jurisdictions were awarded. Charles received Pepin's original share as mayor, the outer parts of the kingdom bordering on the sea, namely Neustria, western Aquitaine, and the northern parts of Austrasia. While Carloman was awarded his uncle's former share, the inner parts, southern Austrasia, Septimania, eastern Aquitaine, Burgundy, Provence, and Swabia, lands bordering Italy. 
The question of whether these jurisdictions were joint shares reverting to the other brother if one brother died or were inherited property passed on to the descendants of the brother who died was never definitely settled. It came up repeatedly over the succeeding decades until the grandsons of Charlemagne created distinct sovereign kingdoms. Formation of a new Aquitaine in southern Gaul, Aquitaine had been Romanized and people spoke a Romance language. Similarly, Hispania had been populated by peoples who spoke various languages, including Celtic, but these had now been mostly replaced by Romance languages. Between Aquitaine and Hispania were the Euskaldunic, Latinized to Vascans, or Basques, whose country, Vasconia, extended, according to the distributions of place names attributable to the Basques, mainly in the western Pyrenees but also as far south as the upper Ebro River in Spain and as far north as the Garonne River in France. The French name Gascony derives from Vasconia. The Romans were never able to subjugate the whole of Vasconia. The soldiers they recruited for the Roman legions from those parts they did submit and where they founded the region's first cities were valued for their fighting abilities. The border with Aquitaine was at Toulouse. In about 660, the Duchy of Vasconia united with the Duchy of Aquitaine to form a single realm under Felix of Aquitaine, ruling from Toulouse. This was a joint kingship with a Basque duke, Lupus I. Lupus is the Latin translation of Basque Otsoa, wolf. At Felix's death in 670 the joint property of the kingship reverted entirely to Lupus. As the Basques had no law of joint inheritance but relied on primogeniture, Lupus in effect founded a hereditary dynasty of Basque rulers of an expanded Aquitaine. Vasconia and the Pyrenees The destructive war led by Pepin in Aquitaine, although brought to a satisfactory conclusion for the Franks, proved the Frankish power structure south of the Levar was feeble and unreliable. After the defeat and death of Wyofer in 768, while Aquitaine submitted again to the Carolingian dynasty, a new rebellion broke out in 769 led by Hinault II, a possible son of Wafa. He took refuge with the allied Duke Lupus II of Gascony, but probably out of fear of Charlemagne's reprisal, Lupus handed him over to the new king of the Franks to whom he pledged loyalty, which seemed to confirm the peace in the Basque area south of the Garonne. In the campaign of 769, Charlemagne seems to have followed a policy of overwhelming force, and avoided a major pitched battle. Wary of new Basque uprisings, Charlemagne seems to have tried to contain Duke Lupus's power by appointing Seguin as the Count of Bordeaux, 778, and other counts of Frankish background in bordering areas Toulouse, County of Fiesenzac. The Basque Duke, in turn, seems to have contributed decisively as schemed the Battle of Roncevo past referred to as, Basque Treachery. The defeat of Charlemagne's army in Roncevo, 778, confirmed his determination to rule directly by establishing the Kingdom of Aquitaine, ruled by Louis the Pious, based on a power base of Frankish officials, distributing lands among colonizers and allocating lands to the church, which he took as an ally. A Christianization program was put in place across the High Pyrenees, 778. The new political arrangement for Vasconia did not sit well with local lords. As of 788 Adalric was fighting and capturing Chaucen, Carolingian Count of Toulouse. He was eventually released, but Charlemagne, enraged at the compromise, decided to depose him and appointed his trusty William of Gellone. William, in turn, fought the Basques and defeated them after banishing Adalric 790. From 781 Palace, Ribagorka to 806 Pamplona under Frankish influence taking the county of Toulouse for a power base, Charlemagne asserted Frankish authority over the Pyrenees by subduing the southwestern marches of Toulouse 790, and establishing vassal counties on the southern Pyrenees that were to make up the Marca Hispanica. As of 794, a Frankish vassal, the Basque Lord Belisco Al-Galashki, the Gaul, ruled Alava, but Pamplona remained under Cordovan and local control up to 806. Belisco and the counties in the Marca Hispanica provided the necessary base to attack the Andalusians, an expedition led by William Count of Toulouse and Louis the Pious to capture Barcelona in 801. Events in the Duchy of Vasconia, rebellion in Pamplona, Count overthrown in Aragon, 
Duke Seguin of Bordeaux deposed, uprising of the Basque Lords, ETC, were to prove it ephemeral upon Charlemagne's death. Charlemagne had 18 children with eight of his ten known wives or concubines. Nonetheless, he had only four legitimate grandsons, the four sons of his fourth son, Louis. In addition, he had a grandson Bernard of Italy, the only son of his third son, Pepin of Italy, who was illegitimate but included in the line of inheritance. Among his descendants are several royal dynasties, including the Habsburg and Capetian dynasties. By consequence, most if not all established European noble families ever since can genealogically trace some of their background to Charlemagne. At his succession in 772, Pope Adrian I demanded the return of certain cities in the former Exarchate of Ravenna in accordance with a promise at the succession of Decidrius. Instead, Decidrius took over certain papal cities and invaded the Pentapolis, heading for Rome. Adrian sent ambassadors to Charlemagne in autumn requesting he enforce the policies of his father, Pepin. Decidrius sent his own ambassadors denying the Pope's charges. The ambassadors met at Thienville, and Charlemagne upheld the Pope's side. Charlemagne demanded what the Pope had requested, but Decidrius swore never to comply. Charlemagne and his uncle Bernard crossed the Alps in 773 and chased the Lombards back to Pavia, which they then besieged. Charlemagne temporarily left the siege to deal with Adelchis, son of Decidrius, who was raising an army at Verona. The young prince was chased to the Adriatic littoral and fled to Constantinople to plead for assistance from Constantine V, who was waging war with Bulgaria. The siege lasted until the spring of 774 when Charlemagne visited the Pope in Rome. There he confirmed his father's grants of land, with some later chronicles falsely claiming that he also expanded them, granting Tuscany, Amelia, Venice and Corsica. The Pope granted him the title patrician. He then returned to Pavia, where the Lombards were on the verge of surrendering. In return for their lives, the Lombards surrendered and opened the gates in early summer. Decidrius was sent to the Abbey of Corby, and his son Adelchis died in Constantinople, a patrician. Charles, unusually, had himself crowned with the Iron Crown and made the magnates of Lombardy pay homage to him at Pavia. Only Duke Arachis II of Benevento refused to submit and proclaimed independence. Charlemagne was then master of Italy as king of the Lombards. He left Italy with a garrison in Pavia and a few Frankish counts in place the same year. Instability continued in Italy. In 776, dukes wrote God of Friuli and Hildeprand of Spoleto rebelled. Charlemagne rushed back from Saxony and defeated the Duke of Friuli in battle, the Duke was slain. The Duke of Spoleto signed a treaty. Their co-conspirator, Arachis, was not subdued, and Adelchis, their candidate in Byzantium, never left that city. Northern Italy was now faithfully his. Southern Italy in 787, Charlemagne directed his attention towards the Duchy of Benevento, where Arachis too was reigning independently with the self-given title of Princeps. Charlemagne's siege of Salerno forced Arachis into submission. However, after Arachis II's death in 787, his son Grimoald III proclaimed the Duchy of Benevento newly independent. Grimoald was attacked many times by Charles or his son's armies, without achieving a definitive victory. Charlemagne lost interest and never again returned to southern Italy where Grimoald was able to keep the duchy free from Frankish suzerainty. According to the Muslim historian Ibn al atheev the Diet of Paderborn had received the representatives of the Muslim rulers of Tharagotha, Girona, Barcelona and Vesca. Their masters had been cornered in the Iberian Peninsula by Abdur Rahman I, the Umayyad Emir of Cordoba. These, Saracen, Moorish and Mughalad rulers offered their homage to the King of the Franks in return for military support. Seeing an opportunity to extend Christendom and his own power and believing the Saxons to be a fully conquered nation, Charlemagne agreed to go to Spain. In 778, he led the Neustrian army across the western Pyrenees, while the Austrasians, Lombards, and Burgundians passed over the eastern Pyrenees. The armies met at Saragossa and Charlemagne received the homage of the Muslim rulers, Suleiman al-Arabi and Qasman ibn Yusuf, but the city did not fall for him. 
Indeed, Charlemagne faced the toughest battle of his career. The Muslims forced him to retreat. He decided to go home since he could not trust the Basques, whom he had subdued by conquering Pamplona. He turned to leave Iberia, but as he was passing through the Pass of Roncesvalles, one of the most famous events of his reign occurred. The Basques attacked and destroyed his rearguard and baggage train. The Battle of Roncevo Pass, though less a battle than a skirmish, left many famous dead, including the Seneschal Egihad, the Count of the Palace Anselm, and the Warden of the Breton March, Roland, inspiring the subsequent creation of the Song of Roland, Le Chanson de Roland. Coronation Imperial Coronation of Charlemagne, by Friedrich Kulberch, 1861 and 799, Pope Leo III had been assaulted by some of the Romans, who tried to put out his eyes and tear out his tongue. Leo escaped and fled to Charlemagne at Paderborn. Charlemagne, advised by scholar Alcuin, travelled to Rome, in November 800 and held a synod. On 23 December, Leo swore an oath of innocence to Charlemagne. His position having thereby been weakened, the Pope sought to restore his status. Two days later, at Mass, on Christmas Day, the 25th of December, when Charlemagne knelt at the altar to pray, the Pope crowned him Imperator Romanorum, Emperor of the Romans, in St. Peter's Basilica. In so doing, the Pope rejected the legitimacy of Empress Irene of Constantinople. Pope Leo III, crowning Charlemagne from Chroniques de France au de Saint Denis, Volume 1, France, Second Quarter of 14th Century. When Odoacer compelled the abdication of Romulus Augustulus, he did not abolish the Western Empire as a separate power, but caused it to be reunited with or sink into the Eastern, so that from that time there was a single undivided Roman Empire. Dot, dot. Pope Leo III and Charlemagne, like their predecessors, held the Roman Empire to be one and indivisible, and proposed by the coronation of Charlemagne not to proclaim a severance of the East and West, they were not revolting against a reigning sovereign, but legitimately filling up the place of the deposed Constantine VI. Charlemagne was held to be the legitimate successor, not of Romulus Augustulus, but of Constantine VI. Charlemagne's coronation as emperor, though intended to represent the continuation of the unbroken line of emperors from Augustus to Constantine VI, had the effect of setting up two separate, and often opposing, empire and two separate claims to imperial authority. It led to war in 802, and for centuries to come, the emperors of both West and East would make competing claims of sovereignty over the whole. Einhard says that Charlemagne was ignorant of the Pope's intent and did not want any such coronation. H. A. at first had such an aversion that he declared that he would not have set foot in the church the day that they, the imperial titles, were conferred, although it was a great feast day, if he could have foreseen the design of the Pope. A number of modern scholars, however, suggest that Charlemagne was indeed aware of the coronation, certainly, he cannot have missed the bejeweled crown waiting on the altar when he came to pray, something even contemporary sources support. Debate the throne of Charlemagne and the subsequent German kings in Aachen Cathedral historians have debated for centuries whether Charlemagne was aware before the coronation of the Pope's intention to crown him emperor. Charlemagne declared that he would not have entered St. Peter's had he known, according to Chapter 28 of Einhard's Vita Caroli Magni, but that debate obscured the more significant question of why the Pope granted the title and why Charlemagne accepted it. Collins points out, T. had the motivation behind the acceptance of the imperial title was a romantic and antiquarian interest in reviving the Roman Empire is highly unlikely. For one thing, such romance would not have appealed either to Franks or Roman Catholics at the turn of the 9th century, both of whom viewed the classical heritage of the Roman Empire with distrust. The Franks took pride in having, fought against and thrown from their shoulders the heavy yoke of the Romans, and, from the knowledge gained in baptism, clothed in gold and precious stones the bodies of the holy martyrs whom the Romans had killed by fire, by the sword and by wild animals, as Pepin III described it in a law of 763 or 764. Furthermore, the new title carrying with it the risk that the new emperor would make drastic changes to the traditional styles and procedures of government, or concentrate his attentions on Italy or on Mediterranean concerns more generally, risked alienating the Frankish leadership. 
For both the Pope and Charlemagne, the Roman Empire remained a significant power in European politics at this time. The Byzantine Empire, based in Constantinople, continued to hold a substantial portion of Italy, with borders not far south of Rome. Charles sitting in judgment of the Pope could be seen as usurping the prerogatives of the Emperor in Constantinople. By whom, however, could he the Pope be tried? Who, in other words, was qualified to pass judgment on the Vicar of Christ? In normal circumstances the only conceivable answer to that question would have been the Emperor at Constantinople. But the imperial throne was at this moment occupied by Irene. That the Empress was notorious for having blinded and murdered her own son was, in the minds of both Leo and Charles, almost immaterial, it was enough that she was a woman. The female sex was known to be incapable of governing, and by the old Salic tradition was debarred from doing so. As far as Western Europe was concerned, the throne of the emperors was vacant, Irene's claim to it was merely an additional proof, if any were needed, of the degradation into which the so-called Roman Empire had fallen. For the Pope, then, there was no living emperor at that time, though Henry Pian disputes this saying that the coronation was not in any sense explained by the fact that at this moment a woman was reigning in Constantinople. Nonetheless, the Pope took the extraordinary step of creating one. The papacy had since 727 been in conflict with Irene's predecessors in Constantinople over a number of issues, chiefly the continued Byzantine adherence to the doctrine of iconoclasm, the destruction of Christian images, while from 750, the secular power of the Byzantine Empire in central Italy had been nullified. By bestowing the imperial crown upon Charlemagne, the Pope arrogated to himself the right to appoint the Emperor of the Romans, establishing the imperial crown as his own personal gift but simultaneously granting himself implicit superiority over the emperor whom he had created. And, because the Byzantines had proved so unsatisfactory from every point of view political, military and doctrinal, he would select a westerner, the one man who by his wisdom and statesmanship and the vastness of his dominions, stood out head and shoulders above his contemporaries. With Charlemagne's coronation, therefore, the Roman Empire remained, so far as either of them, Charlemagne and Leo, were concerned, one and indivisible, with Charles as its emperor, though there can have been, little doubt that the coronation, with all that it implied, would be furiously contested in Constantinople. Alcuin writes hopefully in his letters of an Imperium Christianum Christian Empire, wherein, just as the inhabitants of the Roman Empire had been united by a common Roman citizenship, presumably this new empire would be united by a common Christian faith. This is the view of Pion when he says, Charles was the emperor of the Ecclesia as the Pope conceived it, of the Roman Church, regarded as the universal church. The Imperium Christianum was further supported at a number of synods all across Europe by Paulinus of Aquileia. What is known, from the Byzantine chronicler Theophanes, is that Charlemagne's reaction to his coronation was to take the initial steps towards securing the Constantinopolitan throne by sending envoys of marriage to Irene, and that Irene reacted somewhat favorably to them. It is important to distinguish between the universalist and localist conceptions of the empire, which remain controversial among historians. According to the former, the empire was a universal monarchy, a commonwealth of the whole world, whose sublime unity transcended every minor distinction. And the emperor was entitled to the obedience of Christendom. According to the latter, the emperor had no ambition for universal dominion, his realm was limited in the same way as that of every other ruler, and when he made more far-reaching claims his object was normally to ward off the attacks either of the pope or of the Byzantine emperor. According to this view, also, the origin of the empire is to be explained by specific local circumstances rather than by overarching theories. According to Onsorge, for a long time, it had been the custom of Byzantium to designate the German princes as spiritual, sons, of the Romans. What might have been acceptable in the 5th century had become provoking and insulting to the Franks in the 8th century. Charles came to believe that the Roman emperor, who claimed to head the world hierarchy of states, was, in reality, no greater than Charles himself, a king as other kings, since beginning in 629 he had entitled himself, 
Basilius, translated literally as king. Onsorge finds it significant that the chief wax seal of Charles, which bore only the inscription, Christ, protege Carolum Regem Francorum Christ, protect Charles, king of the Franks, was used from 772 to 813, even during the imperial period and was not replaced by a special imperial seal, indicating that Charles felt himself to be just the king of the Franks. Finally, Onsorge points out that in the spring of 813 at Aachen Charles crowned his only surviving son, Louis, as the emperor without recourse to Rome with only the acclamation of his Franks. The form in which this acclamation was offered was Frankish Christian rather than Roman. This implies both independence from Rome and a Frankish non-Roman understanding of empire. Imperial title Charlemagne used these circumstances to claim that he was the renewer of the Roman Empire, which had declined under the Byzantines. In his official charters, Charles preferred the style Carolus Serenissimus Augustus Adio Coronatus Magnus Pacificus Imperator Romanum Gubernans Imperium, Charles, Most Serene Augustus crowned by God, the great, peaceful emperor ruling the Roman Empire, to the more direct Imperator Romanorum, Emperor of the Romans. The title of emperor remained in the Carolingian family for years to come, but divisions of territory and infighting over supremacy of the Frankish state weakened its significance. The papacy itself never forgot the title nor abandoned the right to bestow it. When the family of Charles ceased to produce worthy heirs, the Pope gladly crowned whichever Italian magnate could best protect him from his local enemies. The empire would remain in continuous existence for over a millennium as the Holy Roman Empire, a true imperial successor to Charles. Imperial Diplomacy Europe Around 814 The iconoclasm of the Byzantine Isaurian dynasty was endorsed by the Franks. The Second Council of Nicaea reintroduced the veneration of icons under Empress Irene. The council was not recognized by Charlemagne since no Frankish emissaries had been invited, even though Charlemagne ruled more than three provinces of the classical Roman Empire and was considered equal in rank to the Byzantine Emperor. And while the Pope supported the reintroduction of the iconic veneration, he politically digressed from Byzantium. He certainly desired to increase the influence of the papacy, to honor his saviour Charlemagne, and to solve the constitutional issues then most troubling to European jurists in an era when Rome was not in the hands of an emperor. Thus, Charlemagne's assumption of the imperial title was not a usurpation in the eyes of the Franks or Italians. It was, however, seen as such in Byzantium, where it was protested by Irene and her successor Nikephoros I, neither of whom had any great effect in enforcing their protests. The East Romans, however, still held several territories in Italy, Venice, what was left of the Exarchate of Ravenna. Reggio, in Calabria. Otranto in Apulia and Naples the Ducatus Neapolitanus. These regions remained outside of Frankish hands until 804, when the Venetians, torn by infighting, transferred their allegiance to the Iron Crown of Pippin, Charles' son. The Pax Nicephori ended. Nicephorus ravaged the coasts with a fleet, initiating the only instance of war between the Byzantines and the Franks. The conflict lasted until 810 when the pro-Byzantine party in Venice gave their city back to the Byzantine emperor, and the two emperors of Europe made peace, Charlemagne received the Istrian peninsula and in 812 the emperor Michael I Rangabe recognized his status as emperor, although not necessarily as emperor of the Romans. In 813, Charlemagne called Louis the Pious, king of Aquitaine, his only surviving legitimate son, to his court. There Charlemagne crowned his son as co-emperor and sent him back to Aquitaine. He then spent the autumn hunting before returning to Aachen on the 1st of November. In January, he fell ill with pleurisy. In deep depression, mostly because many of his plans were not yet realized, he took to his bed on the 21st of January and as Einhard tells it. He died January 28, the seventh day from the time that he took to his bed, at nine o'clock in the morning, after partaking of the Holy Communion, in the 72nd year of his age and the 47th of his reign. He was buried that same day, in Aachen Cathedral, although the cold weather and the nature of his illness made such a hurried burial unnecessary. 
the earliest surviving planktus, the planktus de Obertu Caroli, was composed by a monk of Bobbio, which he had patronized. A later story, told by Otho of Lomolo, Count of the Palace at Aachen in the time of Emperor Otto III, would claim that he and Otto had discovered Charlemagne's tomb. Charlemagne, they claimed, was seated upon a throne, wearing a crown and holding a scepter, his flesh almost entirely incorrupt. In 1165, Emperor Frederick I reopened the tomb again and placed the emperor in a sarcophagus beneath the floor of the cathedral. In 1215 Emperor Frederick II re-entered him in a casket made of gold and silver known as the Karlskrian. Charlemagne's death emotionally affected many of his subjects, particularly those of the literary clique who had surrounded him at Aachen. An anonymous monk of Bobbio lamented, from the lands where the sun rises to western shores, people are crying and wailing, the Franks, the Romans, all Christians, are stung with mourning and great worry, the young and old, glorious nobles, all lament the loss of their Caesar. The world laments the death of Charles. O Christ, you who govern the heavenly host, grant a peaceful place to Charles in your kingdom. Alas for miserable me, Louis succeeded him as Charles had intended. He left a testament allocating his assets in 811 that was not updated prior to his death. He left most of his wealth to the church, to be used for charity. His empire lasted only another generation in its entirety, its division, according to custom, between Louis's own sons after their father's death laid the foundation for the modern states of Germany and France. Einhard tells in his 24th chapter, Charles was temperate in eating, and particularly so in drinking, for he abominated drunkenness in anybody, much more in himself and those of his household. But he could not easily abstain from food, and often complained that fasts injured his health. He very rarely gave entertainments, only on great feast days, and then to large numbers of people. His meals ordinarily consisted of four courses, not counting the roast, which his huntsmen used to bring in on the speed, he was more fond of this than of any other dish. While at table, he listened to reading or music. The subjects of the readings were the stories and deeds of olden time. He was fond, too, of St. Augustine's books, and especially of the one titled, The City of God. Charlemagne threw grand banquets and feasts for special occasions such as religious holidays and four of his weddings. When he was not working, he loved Christian books, horseback riding, swimming, bathing in natural hot springs with his friends and family, and hunting. Franks were well known for horsemanship and hunting skills. Charles was a light sleeper and would stay in his bedchambers for entire days at a time due to restless nights. During these days, he would not get out of bed when a quarrel occurred in his kingdom, instead summoning all members of the situation into his bedroom to be given orders. Einhard tells again in the 24th chapter, in summer after the midday meal, he would eat some fruit, drain a single cup, put off his clothes and shoes, just as he did for the night, and rest for two or three hours. He was in the habit of awaking and rising from bed four or five times during the night. Charlemagne as emperor in his role as a zealous defender of Christianity, Charlemagne gave money and land to the Christian church and protected the popes. As a way to acknowledge Charlemagne's power and reinforce his relationship with the church, Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne Emperor of the Romans on December 25, 800, at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. As emperor, Charlemagne proved to be a talented diplomat and able administrator of the vast area he controlled. He promoted education and encouraged the Carolingian Renaissance, a period of renewed emphasis on scholarship and culture. He instituted economic and religious reforms, and was a driving force behind the Carolingian minuscule, a standardized form of writing that later became a basis for modern European printed alphabets. Charlemagne ruled from a number of cities and palaces, but spent significant time in Aachen. His palace there included a school, for which he recruited the best teachers in the land. In addition to learning, Charlemagne was interested in athletic pursuits. Known to be highly energetic, he enjoyed hunting, horseback riding and swimming. Aachen held particular appeal for him due to its therapeutic warm springs. According to Einhard, Charlemagne was in good health until the final four years of his life, 
when he often suffered from fevers and acquired a limp. However, as the biographer notes, even at this time, he followed his own counsel rather than the advice of the doctors, whom he very nearly hated, because they advised him to give up roasted meat, which he loved, and to restrict himself to boiled meat instead. In 813, Charlemagne crowned his son Louis the Pious 778-840 King of Aquitaine, as co-emperor. Louis became sole emperor when Charlemagne died in January 814, ending his reign of more than four decades. At the time of his death, his empire encompassed much of Western Europe. Charlemagne was buried at the cathedral in Aachen. In the ensuing decades, his empire was divided up among his heirs, and by the late 800s, it had dissolved. Nevertheless, Charlemagne became a legendary figure endowed with mythical qualities. In 1165, under Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, 1120-1190, Charlemagne was canonized for political reasons, however, the church today does not recognize his sainthood. Thank you, hope you find the content informative. Kindly share the video and subscribe to the channel, do comment to let us know what are the other subjects you'd like us to cover. Ivan was the first Moscow ruler born after its independence. The son of Vasily III, the Ruriki ruler of the Grand Duchy of Moscow, he was appointed Grand Prince when he was three years old after his father's death. A group of reformers known as the Chosen Council united around the young Ivan, declaring him Tsar Emperor of all Rus in 1547 at the age of 16 and establishing the Tsardom of Russia with Moscow as the predominant state. Ivan's reign was characterized by Russia's transformation from a medieval state to an empire under the Tsar but at an immense cost to its people and its broader, long-term economy. During his youth, there was a conquest of the Khanates of Kazan and Astrakhan. After he had consolidated his power, Ivan got rid of the advisers from the chosen council and triggered the Livonian War, which ravaged Russia and resulted in the loss of Livonia and Ingria but allowed him to establish greater autocratic control over Russia's nobility, which he violently purged with the Opryknina. The later years of Ivan's reign were also marked by the massacre of Novgorod and the burning of Moscow by Tatars. Contemporary sources present disparate accounts of Ivan's complex personality. He was described as intelligent and devout but also prone to paranoia, rage, and episodic outbreaks of mental instability that increased with age. In one fit of anger, he murdered his eldest son and heir, Ivan Ivanovich, and the latter's unborn child, which left his younger son, the politically ineffectual Fyodor Ivanovich, to inherit the throne, a man whose rule and subsequent childless death directly led to the end of the Ruriki dynasty and the beginning of the time of troubles. The English word terrible is usually used to translate the Russian word Groznij in Ivan's nickname, but that is a somewhat archaic translation. The Russian word Groznij reflects the older English usage of terrible as in inspiring fear or terror. Dangerous, powerful, formidable. It does not convey the more modern connotations of English terrible such as defective or evil. Vladimir Dahl defines Grozny specifically in archaic usage and as an epithet for Zaz, courageous, magnificent, magisterial and keeping enemies in fear, but people in obedience. Other translations have also been suggested by modern scholars, including, formidable, Ivan was the first son of Vasily III and his second wife, Elena Glinskaya. Vasily's mother was a Greek princess and member of the Byzantine Paleologos family. 
She was a daughter of Thomas Paleologos, the younger brother of the last Byzantine emperor, Constantine XI Paleologos R. 1449-1453. Elena's mother was a Serbian princess in her father's family, the Glinsky clan nobles based in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, claimed descent both from Orthodox Hungarian nobles and the Mongol ruler Mamai, 1335-1380. Closing parenthesis. When Ivan was three years old, his father died from an abscess and inflammation on his leg that developed into blood poisoning. Ivan was proclaimed the Grand Prince of Moscow at the request of his father. His mother Elena Glinskaya initially acted as regent, but she died in 1538 when Ivan was only eight years old. Many believed that she was poisoned. The regency then alternated between several feuding Boya families that fought for control. According to his own letters, Ivan, along with his younger brother Yuri, often felt neglected and offended by the mighty boys from the Shuisky and Belsky families. In a letter to Prince Kerbsky Ivan remembered, My brother Iri, of blessed memory, and me they brought up like vagrants and children of the forest. What have I suffered for want of garments and food? That account has been challenged by the historian Edward Keenan, who doubts the authenticity of the source in which the quotations are found. On the 16th of January 1547, at 16, Ivan was crowned with Monomach's cap at the Cathedral of the Domitian. He was the first to be crowned as Tsar of all the Russias, partly imitating his grandfather, Ivan III the Great, who had claimed the title of Grand Prince of all Rus. Until then, rulers of Muscovy were crowned as Grand Princes, but Ivan III the Great had styled himself, Tsar, in his correspondence. Two weeks after his coronation, Ivan married his first wife, Anastasia Romanovna, a member of the Romanov family, who became the first Russian Tsaritsa. By being crowned Tsar, Ivan was sending a message to the world and to Russia that he was now the only supreme ruler of the country, and his will was not to be questioned. The new title symbolized an assumption of powers equivalent and parallel to those held by former Byzantine emperor and the Tatar Khan, both known in Russian sources as Tsar. The political effect was to elevate Ivan's position. The new title not only secured the throne but also granted Ivan a new dimension of power that was intimately tied to religion. He was now a divine leader appointed to enact God's will, as church texts described Old Testament kings as Tsars and Christ as the heavenly Tsar. The newly appointed title was then passed on from generation to generation, and succeeding Muscovite rulers benefited from the divine nature of the power of the Russian monarch, crystallized during Ivan's reign. Despite calamities triggered by the Great Fire of 1547, the early part of Ivan's reign was one of peaceful reforms and modernization. Ivan revised the law code, creating the Sudebnik of 1550, founded a standing army, the Streltsy, established the Zemsky Sobor, the first Russian parliament of feudal estates, and the Council of the Nobles, known as the Chosen Council, and confirmed the position of the Church with the Council of the Hundred Chapters, Stiglevi Synod, which unified the rituals and ecclesiastical regulations of the whole country. He introduced local self-government to rural regions, mainly in northeastern Russia, populated by the state peasantry. Ivan ordered in 1553 the establishment of the Moscow Print Yard, and the first printing press was introduced to Russia. 
Several religious books in Russian were printed during the 1550s and 1560s. The new technology provoked discontent among traditional scribes, which led to the print yard being burned in an arson attack. The first Russian printers, Ivan Fedorov and Pyotr Mstislavitz, were forced to flee from Moscow to the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Nevertheless, the printing of books resumed from 1568 onwards, with Andronik Timofeevich Neveza and his son Ivan now heading the print yard. Ivan had street. Basel's cathedral constructed in Moscow to commemorate the seizure of Kazan. There is a legend that he was so impressed with the structure that he had the architect, Postnik Yakovlev, blinded so that he could never design anything as beautiful again. However, Postnik Yakovlev really went on to design more churches for Ivan and the walls of the Kazan Kremlin in the early 1560s as well as the chapel over St. Basil's grave, which was added to St. Basil's Cathedral in 1588, several years after Ivan's death. Although more than one architect was associated with that name, it is believed that the principal architect is the same person. Other events of the period include the introduction of the first laws restricting the mobility of the peasants, which would eventually lead to serfdom and were instituted during the rule of the future Tsar Boris Godunov in 1597. See also Serfdom in Russia. Opryknina the 1560s brought to Russia hardships that led to a dramatic change of Ivan's policies. Russia was devastated by a combination of drought, famine, unsuccessful wars against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Tatar invasions, and the sea trading blockade carried out by the Swedes, the Poles, and the Hanseatic League. His first wife, Anastasia Romanovna, died in 1560, which was suspected to be a poisoning. The personal tragedy deeply hurt Ivan and is thought to have affected his personality, if not his mental health. At the same time, one of Ivan's advisors, Prince Andrei Kurbsky, defected to the Lithuanians, took command of the Lithuanian troops and devastated the Russian region of Velikieluki. That series of treasons made Ivan paranoically suspicious of nobility. On 3 December 1564, Ivan departed Moscow for Alexandruva Sloboda, where he sent two letters in which he announced his abdication because of the alleged embezzlement and treason of the aristocracy and the clergy. The Boya court was unable to rule in Ivan's absence and feared the wrath of the Muscovite citizens. A Boya envoy departed for Alexandruva Sloboda to beg Ivan to return to the throne. Ivan agreed to return on condition of being granted absolute power. He demanded to be able to execute and confiscate the estates of traitors without interference from the Boya council or church. Ivan decreed the creation of the Opryknina. That was a separate territory within the borders of Russia, mostly in the territory of the former Novgorod Republic in the north. Ivan held exclusive power over the territory. The Boya Council ruled the Zeschina land, the second division of the state. Ivan also recruited a personal guard known as the Oprikniki. Originally, it numbered 1,000. The Oprikniki were headed by Malyuta Skuratov. One known Opryknik was the German adventurer Heinrich von Staden. The Opryknikki enjoyed social and economic privileges under the Opryknina. They owed their allegiance and status to Ivan, not heredity or local bonds. The first wave of persecutions targeted primarily the princely clans of Russia, notably the influential families of Suzdal. 
Ivan executed, exiled a forcibly tonsured prominent members of the Boya clans on questionable accusations of conspiracy. Among those who were executed were the Metropolitan Philip and the prominent warlord Alexander Gorbatyshuski. In 1566, Ivan extended the Oprichnina to eight central districts. Of the 12,000 nobles, 570 became Oprichniki and the rest were expelled. Under the new political system, the Oprichniki were given large estates but, unlike the previous landlords, could not be held accountable for their actions. The men took virtually all the peasants possessed, forcing them to pay, in one year as much as they used to pay in ten. That degree of oppression resulted in increasing cases of peasants fleeing, which, in turn, reduced the overall production. The price of grain increased ten times. Sack of Novgorod conditions under the Oprichnina were worsened by the 1570 epidemic, a plague that killed 10,000 people in Novgorod and 600 to 1,000 daily in Moscow. During the grim conditions of the epidemic, a famine and the ongoing Livinian War, Ivan grew suspicious that noblemen of the wealthy city of Novgorod were planning to defect and to place the city itself into the control of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The Novgorod citizen Petr Wolonets warned the Tsar about the alleged conspiracy, which modern historians believe to be false. In 1570, Ivan ordered the Oprichniki to raid the city. The Oprichniki burned and pillaged Novgorod and the surrounding villages, and the city has never regained its former prominence. Casualty figures vary greatly from different sources. The First Staff Chronicle estimates the number of victims at 60,000. According to the Third Novgorod Chronicle, the massacre lasted for five weeks. The massacre of Novgorod consisted of men, women and children that were tied to sleighs and run into the freezing waters of the Volkhov River, which Ivan ordered on the basis of unproved accusations of treason. He then tortured its inhabitants and killed thousands in a pogrom. The archbishop was also hunted to death. Almost every day, 500 or 600 people were killed or drowned, but the official death toll named 1,500 of Novgorod's big people, nobility, and mentioned only about the same number of smaller people. Many modern researchers estimate the number of victims to range from 2,000 to 3,000 since after the famine and epidemics of the 1560s, the population of Novgorod most likely did not exceed 10,000 minus 20,000. Many survivors were deported elsewhere. The Oprichnina did not live long after the sack of Novgorod. During the 1571-72 Russo-Crimean War, Oprichniki failed to prove themselves worthy against a regular army. In 1572, Ivan abolished the Oprichnina and disbanded his Oprichniki. Pretended resignation in 1575, Ivan once again pretended to resign from his title and proclaimed Simeon Bekvulatovich, his statesman of Tatar origin, the new Grand Prince of all Rus. Simeon reigned as a figurehead leader for about a year. According to the English envoy Giles Fletcher, the elder, Simeon acted under Ivan's instructions to confiscate all of the lands that belonged to monasteries, and Ivan pretended to disagree with the decision. When the throne was returned to Ivan in 1576, he returned some of the confiscated land and kept the rest. In 1547, Hans Schlitt, the agent of Ivan, recruited craftsmen in Germany for work in Russia. However, all of the craftsmen were arrested in Lübeck at the request of Poland and Livonia. 
The German merchant companies ignored the new port built by Ivan on the river Narva in 1550 and continued to deliver goods in the Baltic ports owned by Livonia. Russia remained isolated from sea trade. Ivan established close ties with the Kingdom of England. Russian-English relations can be traced to 1551, when the Muscovy Company was formed by Richard Chancellor, Sebastian Cabot, Sir Hugh Willoughby and several London merchants. In 1553, Chancellor sailed to the White Sea and continued overland to Moscow, where he visited Ivan's court. Ivan opened up the White Sea and the port of Arkhangelske to the company and granted it privilege of trading throughout his reign without paying the standard customs fees. With the use of English merchants, Ivan engaged in a long correspondence with Elizabeth I of England. While the Queen focused on commerce, Ivan was more interested in a military alliance. During his troubled relations with the boys, Ivan even asked her for a guarantee to be granted asylum in England if his rule was jeopardized. Elizabeth agreed if he provided for himself during his stay. Ivan corresponded with overseas Orthodox leaders. In response to a letter of Patriarch Joachim of Alexandria asking him for financial assistance for the St. Catherine's Monastery, in the Sinai Peninsula, which had suffered by the Turks, Ivan sent in 1558 a delegation to Egypt aided by Archdeacon Gennady, who, however, died in Constantinople before he could reach Egypt. From then on, the embassy was headed by Smolensk merchant Vasily Poznikov, whose delegation visited Alexandria, Cairo and Sinai, brought the Patriarch a fur coat and an icon sent by Ivan and left an interesting account of his two and a half years of travels. Ivan was the first ruler to begin cooperating with the Free Cossacks on a large scale. Relations were handled through the Posolsky Prikaz diplomatic department, Moscow sent them money and weapons, while tolerating their freedoms, to draw them into an alliance against the Tatars. The first evidence of cooperation surfaces in 1549 when Ivan ordered the Don Cossacks to attack Crimea. While Ivan was a child, armies of the Kazan Khanate repeatedly raided northeastern Russia. In the 1530s, the Crimean Khan formed an offensive alliance with Safagiri of Kazan, his relative. When Safagiri invaded Muscovy in December 1540, the Russians used Qasim Tatars to contain him. After his advance was stalled near Murom, Safagiri was forced to withdraw to his own borders. The reverses undermined Safagiri's authority in Kazan. A pro-Russian party, represented by Shagali, gained enough popular support to make several attempts to take over the Kazan throne. In 1545, Ivan mounted an expedition to the river Volga to show his support for the pro-Russians. In 1551, the Tsar sent his envoy to the Nogai Horde, and they promised to maintain neutrality during the impending war. The Urbegs and Udmurts submitted to Russian authority as well. In 1551, the wooden fort of Sviazysk was transported down the Volga from Aglich all the way to Kazan. It was used as the Russian place dam during the decisive campaign of 1552. On the 16th of June 1552, Ivan led a strong Russian army towards Kazan. The last siege of the Tatar capital commenced on the 30th of August. Under the supervision of Prince Alexander Gorbatyshevsky, the Russians used battering rams and a siege tower undermining and 150 cannons. The Russians also had the advantage of efficient military engineers. 
The city's water supply was blocked and the walls were breached. Kazan finally fell on 2 October, its fortifications were razed and much of the population massacred. Many Russian prisoners and slaves were released. Ivan celebrated his victory over Kazan by building several churches with oriental features, most famously St. Basil's Cathedral on Red Square in Moscow. The fall of Kazan was only the beginning of a series of so-called Cheremis Wars. The attempts of the Moscow government to gain a foothold on the Middle Volga kept provoking uprisings of local peoples, which was suppressed only with great difficulty. In 1557, the first Cheremis War ended, and the Bashkas accepted Ivan's authority. In campaigns in 1554 and 1556, Russian troops conquered the Astrakhan Khanate at the mouths of the Volga River, and the new Astrakhan fortress was built in 1558 by Ivan Virodkov to replace the old Tatar capital. The annexation of the Tatar Khanates meant the conquest of vast territories, access to large markets and control of the entire length of the Volga River. Subjugating Muslim Khanates turned Muscovy into an empire. After his conquest of Kazan, Ivan is said to have ordered the crescent, a symbol of Islam, to be placed underneath the Christian cross on the domes of Orthodox Christian churches. In 1568, Grand Vizier Sokolu Mehmet Pasa, who was the real power in the administration of the Ottoman Empire under Sultan Selim, initiated the first encounter between the Ottoman Empire and its future northern rival. The results presaged the many disasters to come. A plan to unite the Volga and Don by a canal was detailed in Constantinople. In the summer of 1569, a large force under Qasim Passer of 1,500 Janissaries, 2,000 Sparks and a few thousand Azaps and Akinsis were sent to lay siege to Astrakhan and to begin the canal works while an Ottoman fleet besieged Azov. In early 1570, Ivan's ambassadors concluded a treaty at Constantinople that restored friendly relations between the Sultan and the Tsar. In 1558, Ivan launched the Livonian War in an attempt to gain access to the Baltic Sea and its major trade routes. The war ultimately proved unsuccessful and stretched on for 24 years in engaging the Kingdom of Sweden, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Teutonic Knights of Livonia. The prolonged war had nearly destroyed the economy, and the Oprichnina had thoroughly disrupted the government. Meanwhile, the Union of Lublin had united the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and Kingdom of Poland, and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth acquired an energetic leader, Stefan Batory, who was supported by Russia's southern enemy, the Ottoman Empire. Ivan's realm was being squeezed by two of the time's great powers. After rejecting peace proposals from his enemies, Ivan had found himself in a difficult position by 1579. The displaced refugees fleeing the war compounded the effects of the simultaneous drought, and the exacerbated war engendered epidemics causing much loss of life. Batory then launched a series of offensives against Muscovy in the campaign seasons of 1579-81 to try to cut the Kingdom of Livonia from Muscovy. During his first offensive in 1579, he retook Politske with 22,000 men. During the second, in 1580, he took Veliki Luki with a 29,000 strong force. Finally, he began the siege of Stuff in 1581 with a 100,000 strong army. 
Narva, in Estonia, was reconquered by Sweden in 1581. Unlike Sweden and Poland, Frederick II of Denmark had trouble continuing the fight against Muscovy. He came to an agreement with John III of Sweden in 1580 to transfer the Danish titles of Livonia to John III. Muscovy recognized Polish-Lithuanian control of Livonia only in 1582. After Magnus von Liffland, the brother of Frederick II and a former ally of Ivan, died in 1583, Poland invaded his territories in the Duchy of Kurland, and Frederick II decided to sell his rights of inheritance. Except for the island of Sarema, Denmark had left Livonia by 1585. In the later years of Ivan's reign, the southern borders of Muscovy were disturbed by Crimean Tatars, mainly to capture slaves. See also Slavery in the Ottoman Empire. Khan Devlaya Giri of Crimea repeatedly raided the Moscow region. In 1571, the 40,000-strong Crimean and Turkish army launched a large-scale raid. The ongoing Lebanian war made Moscow's garrison to number only 6,000 and could not even delay the Tatar approach. Unresisted, Devle devastated unprotected towns and villages around Moscow and caused the fire of Moscow 1571. Historians have estimated the number of casualties of the fire to be 10,000 to 80,000. To buy peace from Devle Giri, Ivan was forced to relinquish his claims on Astrakhan for the Crimean Khanate, but the proposed transfer was only a diplomatic maneuver and was never actually completed. The defeat angered Ivan. Between 1571 and 1572, preparations were made upon his orders. In addition to Zesaknaya Chatta, innovative fortifications were set beyond the Oka River, which defined the border. The following year, Devle launched another raid on Moscow, now with a numerous horde, reinforced by Turkish janissaries equipped with firearms and cannons. The Russian army, led by Prince Mikhail Vorotinsky, was half the size but was experienced and supported by Streltsy, equipped with modern firearms and Gule Gorids. In addition, it was no longer artificially divided into two parts, the Opritnina and Zemsky, unlike during the 1571 defeat. On 27 July, the horde broke through the defensive line along the Oka River and moved towards Moscow. The Russian troops did not have time to intercept it, but the regiment of Prince Khvorostanin vigorously attacked the Tatars from the rear. The Khan stopped only 30 kilometers from Moscow and brought down his entire army back on the Russians, who managed to take up defense near the village of Molody. After several days of heavy fighting, Mikhail Vorotinsky with the main part of the army flanked the Tatars and dealt a sudden blow on 2 August, and Khvorostanin made a sortie from the fortifications. The Tatars were completely defeated and fled. The next year, Ivan, who had sat out in distant Novgorod during the battle, killed Mikhail Vorotinsky. During Ivan's reign, Russia started a large-scale exploration and colonization of Siberia. In 1555, shortly after the conquest of Kazan, the Siberian Khan Yadegar and the Nogai Horde, under Khan Ismail, pledged their allegiance to Ivan in the hope that he would help them against their opponents. However, Yadegar failed to gather the full sum of tribute that he proposed to the Tsar and so Ivan did nothing to save his inefficient vassal. In 1563, Yadegar was overthrown and killed by Khan Kuchim, who denied any tribute to Moscow. In 1558, 
Ivan gave the Stroganov merchant family the patent for colonizing the abundant region along the Kama River and, in 1574, lands over the Ural Mountains along the rivers Tura and Tobol. The family also received permission to build forts along the Ob River and the Irtish River. Around 1577, the Stroganovs engaged the Cossack leader Yermak Timofeyevich to protect their lands from attacks of the Siberian Khan Kuchim. In 1580, Yermak started his conquest of Siberia. With some 540 Cossacks, he started to penetrate territories that were tributary to Kuchim. Yermak pressured and persuaded the various family-based tribes to change their loyalties and to become tributaries of Russia. Some agreed voluntarily because they were offered better terms than with Kuchim, but others were forced. He also established distant forts in the newly conquered lands. The campaign was successful and the Cossacks managed to defeat the Siberian army in the Battle of Chubashkape, but Yermak still needed reinforcements. He sent an envoy to Ivan the Terrible with a message that proclaimed Yermak conquered Siberia to be part of Russia to the dismay of the Stroganovs, who had planned to keep Siberia for themselves. Ivan agreed to reinforce the Cossacks with his Streltsy, but the detachment sent to Siberia died of starvation without any benefit. The Cossacks were defeated by the local peoples, Ermak died and the survivors immediately left Siberia. Only in 1586, two years after the death of Ivan, would the Russians manage to gain a foothold in Siberia by founding the city of Tumen. Ivan was a poet and a composer of considerable talent. His orthodox liturgical hymn, Stikayan No. 1 in honor of St. Peter, and fragments of his letters were put into music by the Soviet composer Rodion Shedrin. The recording, the first Soviet-produced CD, was released in 1988 to mark the millennium of Christianity in Russia. Apisas D.S. Mursky called Ivan, a pamphleteer of genius. The letters are often the only existing source on Ivan's personality and provide crucial information on his reign, but Harvard professor Edward L. Keenan has argued that the letters are 17th century forgeries. That contention, however, has not been widely accepted, and most other scholars, such as John Fennell and Ruslan Skrinikov, have continued to argue for their authenticity. Recent archival discoveries of 16th-century copies of the letters strengthen the argument for their authenticity. Ivan was a devoted follower of Christian orthodoxy but in his own specific manner. He placed the most emphasis on defending the divine right of the ruler to unlimited power under God. Some scholars explain the sadistic and brutal deeds of Ivan the Terrible with the religious concepts of the 16th century, which included drowning and roasting people alive or torturing victims with boiling or freezing water, corresponding to the torments of hell. That was consistent with Ivan's view of being God's representative on earth with the sacred right and duty to punish. He may also have been inspired by the model of Archangel Michael with the idea of divine punishment. Despite the absolute prohibition of the church for even the fourth marriage, Ivan had seven wives, and even while his seventh wife was alive, he was negotiating to marry Mary Hastings, a distant relative of Queen Elizabeth of England. Of course, polygamy was also prohibited by the church, but Ivan planned to put his wife away. Ivan freely interfered in church affairs by ousting Metropolitan Philip and ordering him to be killed and accusing of treason and deposing the second oldest hierarch, Novgorod Archbishop Piman. 
Many monks were tortured to death during the massacre of Novgorod. Ivan was somewhat tolerant of Islam, which was widespread in the territories of the conquered Tatar Khanates, since he was afraid of the wrath of the Ottoman Sultan. However, his anti-Semitism was so fierce that no pragmatic considerations could hold him back. For example, after the capture of Politsky, all unconverted Jews were drowned, despite their role in the city's economy. Little is known about Ivan's appearance, as virtually all existing portraits were made after his death and contain uncertain amounts of artist's impression. In 1567, the ambassador Daniel Prince von Buchau described Ivan as follows. He is tall, stout and full of energy. His eyes are big, observing and restless. His beard is reddish-black, long and thick, but most other hairs on his head are shaved off according to the Russian habits of the time. According to Ivan Kateri of Rostovsky, the son-in-law of Michael I of Russia, Ivan had an unpleasant face with a long and crooked nose. He was tall and athletically built, with broad shoulders and a narrow waist. In 1963, the graves of Ivan and his sons were excavated and examined by Soviet scientists. Chemical and structural analysis of his remains disproved earlier suggestions that Ivan suffered from syphilis or that he was poisoned by arsenic or strangled. At the time of his death, he was 178 centimeters tall, 5 feet 10 in, and weighed 85 to 90 kilogram, 187 to 198 lb. His body was rather asymmetrical, had a large amount of osteophytes uncharacteristic of his age and contained excessive concentration of mercury. Researchers concluded that Ivan was athletically built in his youth but, in his last years, had developed various bone diseases and could barely move. They attributed the high mercury content in his body due to his use of ointments to heal his joints. Ivan completely altered Russia's governmental structure, establishing the character of modern Russian political organization. Ivan's creation of the Oprik Nina, answerable only to him, afforded him personal protection but also curtailed the traditional powers and rights of the boys. Henceforth, Tsarist autocracy and despotism would lie at the heart of the Russian state. Ivan bypassed the Mestnichistvo system and offered positions of power to his supporters among the minor gentry. The empire's local administration combined both locally and centrally appointed officials. The system proved durable and practical and sufficiently flexible to tolerate later modification. Ivan's expedition against Poland failed at a military level, but it helped extend Russia's trade, political and cultural links with other European states. Peter the Great built on those connections in his bid to make Russia a major European power. At Ivan's death, the empire encompassed the Caspian to the southwest and western Siberia to the east. His southern conquests ignited several conflicts with the expansionist Turkey, whose territories were thus confined to the Balkans and the Black Sea regions. Ivan's management of Russia's economy proved disastrous, both in his lifetime and afterward. He had inherited a government in debt, and in an effort to raise more revenue for his expansionist wars, he instituted a series of increasingly unpopular and burdensome taxes. Successive wars drained Russia of manpower and resources and brought it to the brink of ruin. After Ivan's death, his empire's nearly ruined economy contributed to the decline of his own Rurik dynasty, leading to the time of troubles.
Ivan's notorious outbursts and autocratic whims helped characterize the position of Tsar as one accountable to no earthly authority but only to God. Tsarist absolutism faced few serious challenges until the late 19th century. Ivan's legacy was manipulated by the Soviet Union as a potential focus for nationalist pride. His image became closely associated with the personality cult of Joseph Stalin. While early Marxist-Leninist historiography attached greater significance to socio-economic forces than to political history and the role of individuals, Stalin wanted official historians to make Russia's history comprehensible and accessible to the populace, with an emphasis on those great men, such as Ivan, Alexander Nevsky and Peter the Great, who had strengthened and expanded Russia. In post-Soviet Russia, a campaign has been run to seek the granting of sainthood to Ivan IV. But the Russian Orthodox Church opposed the idea. The first statue of Ivan the Terrible was officially opened in Oriol, Russia in 2016. Formally, the statue was unveiled in honor of the 450th anniversary of the founding of Oriol, a Russian city of about 310,000 that was established as a fortress to defend Moscow's southern borders. Informally, there was a big political subtext. The opposition thinks that Ivan the Terrible's rehabilitation echoes of Stalin's era. The erection of the statue was vastly covered in international media like The Guardian, The Washington Post, Politico, and others. The Russian Orthodox Church officially supported the erection of the monument. Supported the erection of the monument. Since 1542 Ivan had been greatly influenced by the views of the Metropolitan of Moscow, Makari, who encouraged the young Tsar in his desire to establish a Christian state based on the principles of justice. Ivan's government soon embarked on a wide program of reforms and of the reorganization of both central and local administration. Church councils summoned in 1547 and 1549 strengthened and systematized the church's affairs, affirming its orthodoxy and canonizing a large number of Russian saints. In 1549 the first Zemsky Sobor was summoned to meet in an advisory capacity, this was a national assembly composed of boys, clergy, and some elected representatives of the new service gentry. In 1550 a new, more detailed legal code was drawn up that replaced one dating from 1497. Russia's central administration was also reorganized into departments, each responsible for a specific function of the state. The conditions of military service were improved, the armed forces were reorganized, and the system of command altered so that commanders were appointed on merit rather than simply by virtue of their noble birth. The government also introduced extensive self-government, with district administrators elected by the local gentry. One object of the reforms was to limit the powers of the hereditary aristocracy of princes and boys, who held their estates on a hereditary basis, and promote the interests of the service gentry, who held their landed estates solely as compensation for service to the government and who were thus dependent on the Tsar. Ivan apparently aimed at forming a class of landed gentry that would owe everything to the sovereign. All the reforms took place under the aegis of the so-called Chosen Council, an informal advisory body in which the leading figures were the Tsar's favorites Alexei Adishev and the priest Sylvester. The council's influence waned and then disappeared in the early 1560s, however, after the death of Ivan's first wife and of Makari, by which time Ivan's views and his entourage had changed. 
Ivan's first wife, Anastasia, died in 1560, and only two male heirs by her, Ivan, born 1554, and Fyodor, born 1557, survived the rigors of medieval childhood. Russia was at war for the greater part of Ivan's reign. Muscovite rulers had long feared incursions by the Tatars, and in 1547-48 and 1549-50 unsuccessful campaigns were undertaken against the hostile Khanate of Kazan, on the Volga River. In 1552, after lengthy preparations, the Tsar set out for Kazan, and the Russian army then succeeded in taking the town by assault. In 1556 the Khanate of Astrakhan, located at the mouth of the Volga, was annexed without a fight. From that moment onward, the Volga became a Russian river, and the trade route to the Caspian Sea was rendered safe. The Livonian war with both banks of the Volga now secured, Ivan prepared for a campaign to force an exit to the sea, a traditional concern of landlocked Russia. Ivan felt that trade with Europe depended on free access to the Baltic and decided to turn his attention westward. In 1558 he went to war in an attempt to establish Russian rule over Livonia, in present-day Latvia and Estonia. Russia was at first victorious and succeeded in destroying the Livonian Knights, but their ally Lithuania became an integral part of Poland in 1569. The war dragged on, while the Swedes supported Poland against Russia, the Crimean Tatars attacked Astrakhan and even made an extensive incursion into Russia in 1571, they burned Moscow, leaving only the Kremlin standing. When Stephen Bathory of Transylvania became king of Poland in 1575, reorganized Polish armies under his leadership were able to carry the war onto Russian territory while the Swedes recaptured parts of Livonia. Ivan at last asked Pope Gregory XIII to intervene, and through the mediation of his nuncio, Antonio Posevino, an armistice with Poland was concluded on January 15, 1582. Under its terms Russia lost all its gains in Livonia, and an armistice with Sweden in 1583 compelled Russia to give up towns on the Gulf of Finland. The 24-year-long Livonian war had proved fruitless for Russia, which was exhausted by the long struggle. Ivan's first executions apparently arose out of his disappointment over the course of the Livonian War and the suspected treason of several Russian boys. The defection of one of Ivan's outstanding field commanders, Prince Andrei Kurpsky, to Poland in 1564 greatly startled the Tsar, who announced later that year his intention of abdicating in view of the boy's betrayal. The Muscovites, however, led by the clergy, implored him to continue to rule, and in 1565 he acceded to their request on condition that he should be allowed to deal with the traitors as he wished and that he should form an opriknina, i.e., an aggregate of territory that would be administered separately from the rest of the state and put under his immediate control as crown land. A bodyguard of 1,000-6,000 men, known as the Oprikniki, was raised, and specified towns and districts all over Russia were included in the Opriknina, their revenues being assigned to the maintenance of the Tsar's new court and household, which consisted of a number of carefully selected boys and service gentry. Ivan lived exclusively in this entourage and withdrew from the day-to-day -day management of Russia's administrative apparatus, now called the Zemschina, or the land which he left in the hands of leading boys and bureaucrats. Ivan cut himself off from almost all communication with them, 
while the Oprichniki trampled with impunity on everyone beyond Ivan's immediate circle. Since nearly all the documents relating to this epoch were destroyed in one of Moscow's periodic fires, historians tend to give differing explanations for Ivan's actions during this part of his reign. The majority tend to the view that the struggle was between the Tsar and the old hereditary nobility, which, jealous of surrendering its power and privileges, had resisted his internal reforms and military projects. The Oprichnina thus may have been Ivan's attempt to create a highly centralized state and destroy the economic strength and political power of the princes and the high nobility. The increasingly resentful boys had indeed opposed Ivan and plotted against him on occasion, but the reign of terror that Ivan initiated by the Oprichnina proved far more dangerous to the stability of the country than the danger that it was designed to suppress. In 1570, for example, Ivan personally led his Oprichniki troops against Novgorod, destroying that city and executing several thousand of its inhabitants. Many boys and other members of the gentry perished during this period, some being publicly executed with calculated and symbolic cruelty. Ivan later sent to various monasteries memorials synodiki, of more than 3,000 of his victims, most of whom were executed in the course of the Oprichnina. The Oprichnina lasted only seven years, from 1565 to 1572, when it was abolished as a result of the failure of the Oprichnina regiments to defend Moscow from attack by the Crimean Tatars. The Oprichnina army was reintegrated with that of the Zemschina, and some of the estates confiscated by Ivan's followers were returned to their owners. The entire episode of the Oprichnina leaves a bloody imprint on Ivan's reign, causing some doubts about his mental stability and leaving historians with the impression of a morbidly suspicious and vindictive ruler. Later years' withdrawal and flight are themes that run through the later years of Ivan's reign. He expressed an interest in establishing diplomatic and trade relations with England, even suggesting his readiness to marry an English noblewoman. In 1575 he seems to have abdicated for about a year in favor of a Tatar prince, Simeon Bekbulatovich. During the 1570s he married five wives in succession in only nine years. Finally, in a fit of rage, he murdered his only viable heir, Ivan, in 1581. This murder set the clock ticking for the political crisis, known as the Time of Troubles, that began with the extinction of the Rurik dynasty upon the infirm Fyodor's death in 1598. Legacy Ivan's achievements were many. In foreign policy all his actions were directed toward forcing Russia into Europe, a line that Peter I the Great was to continue. Internally, Ivan's reign of terror eventually resulted in the weakening of all levels of the aristocracy, including the service gentry he had sponsored. The prolonged and unsuccessful Livonian war overextended the state's resources and helped bring Russia to the verge of economic collapse. These factors, together with Tata incursions, resulted in the depopulation of a number of Russian provinces by the time of Ivan's death in 1584. Nevertheless, he left his realm far more centralized both administratively and culturally than it had been previously. Ivan the Terrible Ivan also encouraged Russia's cultural development, especially through printing. He himself wrote well, and, though his surviving writings are mainly of a political nature, his command of words and his biting sarcasm are very evident. Ivan was a devout adherent of the Orthodox Church.
His arguments on religious questions are striking in their power and conviction, but he placed the most emphasis on defending the divine right of the ruler to unlimited power under God, a view with which most other monarchs of the time would have been in agreement. Ivan's first executions apparently arose out of his disappointment over the course of the Livonian War and the suspected treason of several Russian boys. The defection of one of Ivan's outstanding field commanders, Prince Andrei Kurpsky, to Poland in 1564 greatly startled the Tsar, who announced later that year his intention of abdicating in view of the boy's betrayal. The Muscovites, however, led by the clergy, implored him to continue to rule, and in 1565 he acceded to their request on condition that he should be allowed to deal with the traitors as he wished and that he should form an opriknina, i.e., an aggregate of territory that would be administered separately from the rest of the state and put under his immediate control as crown land. A bodyguard of 1,000-6,000 men, known as the Oprikniki, was raised, and specified towns and districts all over Russia were included in the Opriknina, their revenues being assigned to the maintenance of the Tsar's new court and household, which consisted of a number of carefully selected boys and service gentry. Ivan lived exclusively in this entourage and withdrew from the day-to-day -day management of Russia's administrative apparatus, now called the Zemschina, or the land which he left in the hands of leading boys and bureaucrats. Ivan cut himself off from almost all communication with them, while the Oprikniki trampled with impunity on everyone beyond Ivan's immediate circle, Ivan the Terrible. Ivan the Terrible Ivan the Terrible, Russian Ivan Grozny, Bynum of Ivan Vasilyevich, also called Ivan the Fourth, born August 25, 1530, Kolomenskoye, near Moscow, Russia, died March 18, 1584, Moscow Grand Prince of Moscow 1533-84, and the first to be proclaimed Tsar of Russia, from 1547. His reign saw the completion of the construction of a centrally administered Russian state and the creation of an empire that included non-Slav states. Ivan engaged in prolonged and largely unsuccessful wars against Sweden and Poland, and, in seeking to impose military discipline and a centralized administration, he instituted a reign of terror against the hereditary nobility. Ivan the Terrible born, August 25, 1530 Kolomenskoye Rysiadid, March 18, 1584, aged 53. Moscow Russia title, office, Tsar 1547-1584. Rusharaus dynasty, Rurik dynasty notable family members, Father Vasily III, son Fyodor I, son Dmitry Ivanovich. Early life Ivan was the son of Grand Prince Vasily III of Moscow and his second wife, Yelena Glinskaya. He was to become the penultimate representative of the Rurik dynasty. On December 4, 1533, immediately after his father's death, the three-year-old Ivan was proclaimed Grand Prince of Moscow. His mother ruled in Ivan's name until her death, allegedly by poison, in 1538. The deaths of both of Ivan's parents served to reanimate the struggles of various factions of nobles for control of the person of the young prince and for power. The years 1538-47 were thus a period of murderous strife among the clans of the warrior caste commonly termed, boys. Their continual struggles for the reins of government to the detriment of the realm made a profound impression on Ivan and imbued him with the lifelong dislike of the boys. Early reforms on January 16, 1547, Ivan was crowned, Tsar and Grand Prince of all Russia. 
The title za was derived from the Latin title Caesar and was translated by Ivan's contemporaries as Emperor. In February 1547 Ivan married Anastasia Romanovna, a great aunt of the future first Tsar of the Romanov dynasty. Since 1542 Ivan had been greatly influenced by the views of the Metropolitan of Moscow, Makari, who encouraged the young Tsar in his desire to establish a Christian state based on the principles of justice. Ivan's government soon embarked on a wide program of reforms and of the reorganization of both central and local administration. Church councils summoned in 1547 and 1549 strengthened and systematized the church's affairs, affirming its orthodoxy and canonizing a large number of Russian saints. In 1549 the first Zemsky Sobor was summoned to meet in an advisory capacity, this was a national assembly composed of boys, clergy, and some elected representatives of the new service gentry. In 1550 a new, more detailed legal code was drawn up that replaced one dating from 1497. Russia's central administration was also reorganized into departments, each responsible for a specific function of the state. The conditions of military service were improved, the armed forces were reorganized, and the system of command altered so that commanders were appointed on merit rather than simply by virtue of their noble birth. The government also introduced extensive self-government, with district administrators elected by the local gentry. One object of the reforms was to limit the powers of the hereditary aristocracy of princes and boys, who held their estates on a hereditary basis, and promote the interests of the service gentry, who held their landed estates solely as compensation for service to the government and who were thus dependent on the Tsar. Ivan apparently aimed at forming a class of landed gentry that would owe everything to the sovereign. All the reforms took place under the aegis of the so-called Chosen Council, an informal advisory body in which the leading figures were the Tsar's favorites Alexei Adishev and the priest Sylvester. The council's influence waned and then disappeared in the early 1560s, however, after the death of Ivan's first wife and of Makari, by which time Ivan's views and his entourage had changed. Ivan's first wife, Anastasia, died in 1560, and only two male heirs by her, Ivan, born 1554, and Fyodor, born 1557, survived the rigors of medieval childhood. Russia was at war for the greater part of Ivan's reign. Muscovite rulers had long feared incursions by the Tatars, and in 1547-48 and 1549-50 unsuccessful campaigns were undertaken against the hostile Khanate of Kazan, on the Volga River. In 1552, after lengthy preparations, the Tsar set out for Kazan, and the Russian army then succeeded in taking the town by assault. In 1556 the Khanate of Astrakhan, located at the mouth of the Volga, was annexed without a fight. From that moment onward, the Volga became a Russian river, and the trade route to the Caspian Sea was rendered safe. The Livonian war with both banks of the Volga now secured, Ivan prepared for a campaign to force an exit to the sea, a traditional concern of landlocked Russia. Ivan felt that trade with Europe depended on free access to the Baltic and decided to turn his attention westward. In 1558 he went to war in an attempt to establish Russian rule over Livonia, in present-day Latvia and Estonia. Russia was at first victorious and succeeded in destroying the Livonian Knights, but their ally Lithuania became an integral part of Poland in 1569. 
The war dragged on, while the Swedes supported Poland against Russia. The Crimean Tatars attacked Astrakhan and even made an extensive incursion into Russia in 1571. They burned Moscow, leaving only the Kremlin standing. When Stephen Bathory of Transylvania became king of Poland in 1575, reorganized Polish armies under his leadership were able to carry the war onto Russian territory while the Swedes recaptured parts of Livonia. Ivan at last asked Pope Gregory XIII to intervene, and through the mediation of his nuncio, Antonio Posevino, an armistice with Poland was concluded on January 15, 1582. Under its terms Russia lost all its gains in Livonia, and an armistice with Sweden in 1583 compelled Russia to give up towns on the Gulf of Finland. The 24-year-long Livonian war had proved fruitless for Russia, which was exhausted by the long struggle. Ivan's first executions apparently arose out of his disappointment over the course of the Livonian War and the suspected treason of several Russian boys. The defection of one of Ivan's outstanding field commanders, Prince Andrei Kurbsky, to Poland in 1564 greatly startled the Tsar, who announced later that year his intention of abdicating in view of the boys' betrayal. The Muscovites, however, led by the clergy, implored him to continue to rule, and in 1565 he acceded to their request on condition that he should be allowed to deal with the traitors as he wished and that he should form an opriknina, i.e., an aggregate of territory that would be administered separately from the rest of the state and put under his immediate control as crown land. A bodyguard of 1,000 minus 6,000 men, known as the Oprikniki, was raised, and specified towns and districts all over Russia were included in the Opriknina, their revenues being assigned to the maintenance of the Tsar's new court and household, which consisted of a number of carefully selected boys and service gentry. Ivan lived exclusively in this entourage and withdrew from the day-to-day -day management of Russia's administrative apparatus, now called the Zemschina, or the land which he left in the hands of leading boys and bureaucrats. Ivan cut himself off from almost all communication with them, while the Oprikniki trampled with impunity on everyone beyond Ivan's immediate circle. Since nearly all the documents relating to this epoch were destroyed in one of Moscow's periodic fires, historians tend to give differing explanations for Ivan's actions during this part of his reign. The majority tend to the view that the struggle was between the Tsar and the old hereditary nobility, which, jealous of surrendering its power and privileges, had resisted his internal reforms and military projects. The Oprichnina thus may have been Ivan's attempt to create a highly centralized state and destroy the economic strength and political power of the princes and the high nobility. The increasingly resentful boys had indeed opposed Ivan and plotted against him on occasion, but the reign of terror that Ivan initiated by the Oprichnina proved far more dangerous to the stability of the country than the danger that it was designed to suppress. In 1570, for example, Ivan personally led his Oprichniki troops against Novgorod, destroying that city and executing several thousand of its inhabitants. Many boys and other members of the gentry perished during this period, some being publicly executed with calculated and symbolic cruelty. Ivan later sent to various monasteries memorials synodiki, of more than 3,000 of his victims, most of whom were executed in the course of the Oprichnina. The Oprichnina lasted only seven years, from 1565 to 1572, 
when it was abolished as a result of the failure of the Oprichnina regiments to defend Moscow from attack by the Crimean Tatars. The Oprichnina army was reintegrated with that of the Zemschina, and some of the estates confiscated by Ivan's followers were returned to their owners. The entire episode of the Oprichnina leaves a bloody imprint on Ivan's reign, causing some doubts about his mental stability and leaving historians with the impression of a morbidly suspicious and vindictive ruler. Later years' withdrawal and flight are themes that run through the later years of Ivan's reign. He expressed an interest in establishing diplomatic and trade relations with England, even suggesting his readiness to marry an English noblewoman. In 1575 he seems to have abdicated for about a year in favor of a Tatar prince, Simeon Bekbulatovich. During the 1570s he married five wives in succession in only nine years. Finally, in a fit of rage, he murdered his only viable heir, Ivan, in 1581. This murder set the clock ticking for the political crisis, known as the Time of Troubles, that began with the extinction of the Rurik dynasty upon the infirm Fyodor's death in 1598. Legacy Ivan's achievements were many. In foreign policy all his actions were directed toward forcing Russia into Europe, a line that Peter I the Great was to continue. Internally, Ivan's reign of terror eventually resulted in the weakening of all levels of the aristocracy, including the service gentry he had sponsored. The prolonged and unsuccessful Livonian war overextended the state's resources and helped bring Russia to the verge of economic collapse. These factors, together with Tata incursions, resulted in the depopulation of a number of Russian provinces by the time of Ivan's death in 1584. Nevertheless, he left his realm far more centralized both administratively and culturally than it had been previously. Ivan also encouraged Russia's cultural development, especially through printing. He himself wrote well, and, though his surviving writings are mainly of a political nature, his command of words and his biting sarcasm are very evident. Ivan was a devout adherent of the Orthodox Church. His arguments on religious questions are striking in their power and conviction, but he placed the most emphasis on defending the divine right of the ruler to unlimited power under God, a view with which most other monarchs of the time would have been in agreement. Time would have Saladin, was a Sunni Muslim Kurd. He became the first Sultan of both Egypt and Syria, founding the Ayyubid dynasty. Saladin led the Muslim military campaign against the Crusader states in the Levant. At the height of his power, his Sultanate spanned Egypt, Syria, the Jazira Upper Mesopotamia, the Hejaz Western Arabia, Yemen, parts of Western North Africa, and Nubia. Saladin was born in Tikrit in present-day Iraq. His personal name was Yusuf Salah ad-Din, is a lakab, an honorific epithet, meaning righteousness of the faith. Q. His family was most likely of Kurdish ancestry and had originated from the village of Ajdanakan near the city of Dvin in central Armenia. The Ravadia tribe he hailed from had been partially assimilated into the Arabic speaking world by this time in Saladin's era. No scholar had more influence than Sheikh Abdul Qadir Gilani and Saladin was strongly influenced and aided by him and his pupils. In 1132, the defeated army of Zengi, a Tibeg of Mosul, found their retreat blocked by the Tigris River opposite the fortress of Tikrit, where Saladin's father, Najam ad-Din Ayyub served as the warden. Ayyub provided ferries for the army and gave them refuge in Tikrit. Mujahid al-Din Biharuz, a former Greek slave who had been appointed as the military governor of northern Mesopotamia for his service to the Seleuks, 
reprimanded Ayub for giving Zengi refuge and in 1137 banished Ayub from Tikrit after his brother Asad al-Din Shirku killed a friend of Behruz. According to Baha ad-Din ibn Shaddad, Saladin was born on the same night that his family left Tikrit. In 1139, Ayub and his family moved to Mosul, where Ahmed ad-Din Zengi acknowledged his debt and appointed Ayub commander of his fortress in Balbek. After the death of Zengi in 1146, his son, Nur ad-Din, became the regent of Aleppo and the leader of the Zenjids. Saladin, who now lived in Damascus, was reported to have a particular fondness for the city, but information on his early childhood is scarce. About education, Saladin wrote, children are brought up in the way in which their elders were brought up. According to his biographers, Annie Mary Eden Alvarani, Saladin was able to answer questions on Euclid, the Almagest, arithmetic, and law, but this was an academic ideal. It was his knowledge of the Quran and the sciences of religion that linked him to his contemporaries. Several sources claim that during his studies he was more interested in religious studies than joining the military. Another factor which may have affected his interest in religion was that, during the First Crusade, Jerusalem was taken by the Christians. In addition to Islam, Saladin had a knowledge of the genealogies, biographies, and histories of the Arabs, as well as the bloodlines of Arabian horses. More significantly, he knew the Hamasa of Abu Tamim by heart. He spoke Kurdish and Arabic. He was originally sent to Fatimid Egypt in 1164 alongside his uncle Shirku, a general of the Zengid army, on the orders of their lord Nur ad-Din to help restore Shavar as vizier of the teenage Fatimid Caliph al-Adid. A power struggle ensued between Shirku and Shavar after the latter was reinstated. Saladin, meanwhile, climbed the ranks of the Fatimid government by virtue of his military successes against crusader assaults against its territory and his personal closeness to al-Adid. After Shavar was assassinated and Shirku died in 1169, Al-Adid appointed Saladin Vizir, a rare nomination of a Sunni Muslim to such an important position in the Shia Caliphate. During his tenure as Vizir, Saladin began to undermine the Fatimid establishment and, following Al-Adid's death in 1171, he abolished the Fatimid Caliphate and realigned the country's allegiance with the Sunni, Baghdad-based Abbasid Caliphate. In the following years, he led forays against the Crusaders in Palestine, commissioned the successful conquest of Yemen, and staved off pro-Fatimid rebellions in Upper Egypt. Not long after Nur ad duns death in 1174, Saladin launched his conquest of Syria, peacefully entering Damascus at the request of its governor. By mid-1175, Saladin had conquered Hammer and Homs, inviting the animosity of other Zengid lords, the official rulers of Syria's various regions. Soon after, he defeated the Zengid army at the Battle of the Horns of Hammer of 1175 and was thereafter proclaimed the Sultan of Egypt and Syria by the Abbasid Caliph al-Mustadi. Saladin made further conquests in northern Syria and the Jazira, escaping two attempts on his life by assassins, before returning to Egypt in 1177 to address issues there. By 1182, Saladin had completed the conquest of Muslim Syria after capturing Aleppo, but ultimately failed to take over the Zengid stronghold of Mosul. Under Saladin's command, the Ayyubid army defeated the Crusaders at the decisive Battle of Hattin in 1187, and thereafter wrested control of Palestine, including the city of Jerusalem, from the Crusaders, who had conquered the area 88 years earlier. Although the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem continued to exist until the late 13th century, its defeat at Hattin marked a turning point in its conflict with the Muslim powers of the region. Saladin died in Damascus in 1193, having given away much of his personal wealth to his subjects. He is buried in a mausoleum adjacent to the Umayyad Mosque. Saladin has become a prominent figure in Muslim, Arab, Turkish and Kurdish culture, and has been described as the most famous Kurd in history. Saladin's military career began under the tutelage of his uncle Asad al-Din Shirku, a prominent military commander under Nur ad-Din, the Zengi emir of Damascus and Aleppo and the most influential teacher of Saladin. In 1163, the vizier to the Fatimid Caliph al-Adid, Shavar, had been driven out of Egypt by his rival Dirgham, 
a member of the powerful Banu Razak tribe. He asked for military backing from Nur ad-Din, who complied and, in 1164, sent Shirku to aid Shavar in his expedition against Dirgham. Saladin, at age 26, went along with them. After Shavar was successfully reinstated as vizier, he demanded that Shirku withdraw his army from Egypt for a sum of 30,000 gold dinars, but he refused, insisting it was Nur ad-Din's will that he remain. Saladin's role in this expedition was minor, and it is known that he was ordered by Shirku to collect stores from Bilbas prior to its siege by a combined force of crusaders and Shavas troops. After the sacking of Bilbas, the crusader Egyptian force and Shirku's army were to engage in the Battle of Al-Babain on the desert border of the Nile, just west of Giza. Saladin played a major role, commanding the right wing of the Zengid army, while a force of Kurds commanded the left, and Shirku was stationed in the center. Muslim sources at the time, however, put Saladin in the baggage of the center, with orders to lure the enemy into a trap by staging a feigned retreat. The crusader force enjoyed early success against Shirku's troops, but the terrain was too steep and sandy for their horses, and commander Hugh of Caesarea was captured while attacking Saladin's unit. After scattered fighting in little valleys to the south of the main position, the Zengid central force returned to the offensive, Saladin joined in from the rear. The battle ended in a Zengid victory, and Saladin is credited with having helped Shirku in one of the most remarkable victories in recorded history, according to Ibn al-Athir, although more of Shirku's men were killed and the battle is considered by most sources as not a total victory. Saladin and Shirku moved towards Alexandria where they were welcomed, given money, arms, and provided a base. Faced by a superior crusader Egyptian force attempting to besiege the city, Shirku split his army. He and the bulk of his force withdrew from Alexandria, while Saladin was left with the task of guarding the city. Shirku was in a power struggle over Egypt with Shavar and Amalric I of Jerusalem in which Shavar requested Amalric's assistance. In 1169, Shavar was reportedly assassinated by Saladin, and Shirku died later that year. Following his death, a number of candidates were considered for the role of vizier to Al-Adid, most of whom were ethnic Kurds. Their ethnic solidarity came to shape the Ayyubid family's actions in their political career. Saladin and his close associates were wary of Turkish influence. On one occasion Aysar al-Hakkari, a Kurdish lieutenant of Saladin, urged a candidate for the viziership, Emir Kutbi al-Din al-Harbani, to step aside by arguing that, both you and Saladin are Kurds and you will not let the power pass into the hands of the Turks. Nur ad-Din chose a successor for Shirku, but al-Adid appointed Saladin to replace Shavar as vizier. The reasoning behind the Shia Caliph al-Adid's selection of Saladin, a Sunni, varies. Ibn al-Athir claims that the Caliph chose him after being told by his advisers that, there is no one weaker or younger, than Saladin, and, not one of the Emir's commanders obeyed him or served him. However, according to this version, after some bargaining, he was eventually accepted by the majority of the Emirs. Al-Adid's advisers were also suspected of promoting Saladin in an attempt to split the Syria-based Zenjids. Al-Warani wrote that Saladin was selected because of the reputation of his family in their generosity and military prowess. Ahmed Ad Din wrote that after the brief mourning period for Shirku, during which opinions differed, the Zengi Demirs decided upon Saladin and forced the Caliph to invest him as vizier. Although positions were complicated by rival Muslim leaders, the bulk of the Syrian commanders supported Saladin because of his role in the Egyptian expedition, in which he gained a record of military qualifications. Inaugurated as vizier on the 26th of March, Saladin repented, wine drinking and turned from frivolity to assume the dress of religion, according to Arabic sources of the time. Having gained more power and independence than ever before in his career, he still faced the issue of ultimate loyalty between Al-Adid and Nur ad-Din. Later in the year, a group of Egyptian soldiers and emirs attempted to assassinate Saladin, but having already known of their intentions thanks to his intelligence chief Ali Ibn Sifyan, He had the chief conspirator, Naji, Mataman al-Khilafah, the civilian controller of the Fatimid palace, arrested and killed.
The day after, 50,000 black African soldiers from the regiments of the Futimid army opposed to Saladin's rule, along with a number of Egyptian emirs and commoners, staged a revolt. By the 23rd of August, Saladin had decisively quelled the uprising, and never again had to face a military challenge from Cairo. Towards the end of 1169, Saladin, with reinforcements from Nur ad-Din, defeated a massive crusader Byzantine force near Demieta. Afterward, in the spring of 1170, Nur ad-Din sent Saladin's father to Egypt in compliance with Saladin's request, as well as encouragement from the Baghdad-based Abbasid Caliph, Al-Mustanjid, who aimed to pressure Saladin in deposing his rival Caliph, al adid Saladin himself had been strengthening his hold on Egypt and widening his support base there. He began granting his family members high-ranking positions in the region. He ordered the construction of a college for the Maliki branch of Sunni Islam in the city, as well as one for the Shafi'i denomination to which he belonged in Al-Fastat. After establishing himself in Egypt, Saladin launched a campaign against the Crusaders, besieging Darum in 1170. The Malruk withdrew his Templar garrison from Gaza to assist him in defending Darum, but Saladin evaded their force and captured Gaza in 1187. In 1191 Saladin destroyed the fortifications in Gaza built by King Baldwin III for the Knights Templar. It is unclear exactly when, but during that same year, he attacked and captured the Crusader castle of Elat, built on an island off the head of the Gulf of Aqaba. It did not pose a threat to the passage of the Muslim navy but could harass smaller parties of Muslim ships and Saladin decided to clear it from his path. Conquest of Damascus In the early summer of 1174, Nur ad-Din was mustering an army, sending summons to Mosul, Deir Bakr, and the Jazira in an apparent preparation of attack against Saladin's Egypt. The Ayyubids held a council upon the revelation of these preparations to discuss the possible threat and Saladin collected his own troops outside Cairo. On 15 May, Nur ad-Din died after falling ill the previous week and his power was handed to his 11-year-old son as Saleh Ismail al-Malik. His death left Saladin with political independence and in a letter to his Saleh, he promised to act as a sword against his enemies and referred to the death of his father as an earthquake shock. In the wake of Nur ad-Din's death, Saladin faced a difficult decision, he could move his army against the crusaders from Egypt or wait until invited by his Saleh in Syria to come to his aid and launch a war from there. He could also take it upon himself to annex Syria before it could possibly fall into the hands of a rival, but he feared that attacking a land that formerly belonged to his master, forbidden in the Islamic principles in which he believed, could portray him as hypocritical, thus making him unsuitable for leading the war against the Crusaders. Saladin saw that in order to acquire Syria, he either needed an invitation from his Saleh, or to warn him that potential anarchy could give rise to danger from the Crusaders. When his Saleh was removed to Aleppo in August, Gumush Tijin, the emir of the city and a captain of Nur ad-Dun's veterans assumed guardianship over him. The emir prepared to unseat all his rivals in Syria and the Jazira, beginning with Damascus. In this emergency, the emir of Damascus appealed to Saif al-Din of Mosul, a cousin of Gumushtijan, for assistance against Aleppo, but he refused, forcing the Syrians to request the aid of Saladin, who complied. Saladin rode across the desert with 700 picked horsemen, passing through al kerak then reaching Bosra. According to his own account, was joined by emirs, soldiers, and Bedouins, the emotions of their hearts to be seen on their faces. On the 23rd of November, he arrived in Damascus amid general acclamation and rested at his father's old home there, until the gates of the citadel of Damascus, whose commander Rehan initially refused to surrender, were opened to Saladin four days later, after a brief siege by his brother Tutakan Ibn Ayyub. He installed himself in the castle and received the homage and salutations of the inhabitants. Further conquests in Syria 19th century depiction of a victorious Saladin, by Gustav Dahl leaving his brother Tutakan I. B. N. Ayyub as governor of Damascus, Saladin proceeded to reduce other cities that had belonged to Nur al-Din, but were now practically independent. His army conquered Hama with relative ease, but avoided attacking Homs because of the strength of its citadel. 
Saladin moved north towards Aleppo, besieging it on the 30th of December after Gumushtijan refused to abdicate his throne. As Saleh, fearing capture by Saladin, came out of his palace and appealed to the inhabitants not to surrender him and the city to the invading force. One of Saladin's chroniclers claimed, the people came under his spell. Gumushtijan requested Rashid ad-Din Sana, chief D of the assassins of Syria, who were already at odds with Saladin since he replaced the Fatimids of Egypt, to assassinate Saladin in his camp. On the 11th of May 1175, a group of 13 assassins easily gained admission into Saladin's camp, but were detected immediately before they carried out their attack by Nasi al-Din Khumatekan of Abu Kubays. One was killed by one of Saladin's generals and the others were slain while trying to escape. To deter Saladin's progress, Raymond of Tripoli gathered his forces by Nahar al-Kabir, where they were well placed for an attack on Muslim territory. Saladin later moved toward Homs instead, but retreated after being told a relief force was being sent to the city by Saif al-Din. Meanwhile, Saladin's rivals in Syria and Jazira waged a propaganda war against him, claiming he had forgotten his own condition, servant of Nur ad-Din, and showed no gratitude for his old master by besieging his son, rising, in rebellion against his lord. Saladin aimed to counter this propaganda by ending the siege, claiming that he was defending Islam from the Crusaders, his army returned to Hama to engage a crusader force there. The crusaders withdrew beforehand and Saladin proclaimed it, a victory opening the gates of men's hearts. Soon after, Saladin entered Homs and captured its citadel in March 1175, after stubborn resistance from its defenders. Saladin's successes alarmed Saif al-Din. As head of the Zenjids, including Gumushtijan, he regarded Syria and Mesopotamia as his family estate and was angered when Saladin attempted to usurp his dynasty's holdings. Saif al-Din mustered a large army and dispatched it to Aleppo, whose defenders anxiously had awaited them. The combined forces of Mosul and Aleppo marched against Saladin in Hammer. Heavily outnumbered, Saladin initially attempted to make terms with the Zenjids by abandoning all conquests north of the Damascus province, but they refused, insisting he return to Egypt. Seeing that confrontation was unavoidable, Saladin prepared for battle, taking up a superior position at the horns of Hammer, hills by the gorge of the Orontes River. On 13 April 1175, the Zengi troops marched to attack his forces, but soon found themselves surrounded by Saladin's Ayyubid veterans, who crushed them. The battle ended in a decisive victory for Saladin, who pursued the Zengi fugitives to the gates of Aleppo, forcing the Sal's advisors to recognize Saladin's control of the provinces of Damascus, Homs, and Hama, as well as a number of towns outside Aleppo such as Marat al numan after his victory against the Zenjids, Saladin proclaimed himself king and suppressed the name of his Saleh in Friday prayers and Islamic coinage. From then on, he ordered prayers in all the mosques of Syria and Egypt as the sovereign king and he issued at the Cairo mint gold coins bearing his official title, Al-Malik and Nasir Yusuf Ayyub, Ela Ghaya, the king strong to aid, Joseph son of Job. Exalted be the standard. The Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad graciously welcomed Saladin's assumption of power and declared him, Sultan of Egypt and Syria. The Battle of Hammer did not end the contest for power between the Ayyubids and the Zenjids, with the final confrontation occurring in the spring of 1176. Saladin had gathered massive reinforcements from Egypt while Saif al-Din was levying troops among the minor states of Diyabakir and Al-Jazeera. When Saladin crossed the Orontes, leaving Hammer, the sun was eclipsed. He viewed this as an omen, but he continued his march north. He reached the Sultan's Mount, roughly 25 kilometers 16 miles, from Aleppo, where his forces encountered Sefar Danzami. A hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued and the Zenjids managed to plow Saladin's left wing, driving it before him when Saladin himself charged at the head of the Zengi guard. The Zengid forces panicked and most of Saif al-Din's officers ended up being killed or captured, Saif al-Din narrowly escaped. The Zengid army's camp, horses, baggage, tents, and stores were seized by the Ayyubids. The Zengid prisoners of war, however, were given gifts and freed. All of the booty from the Ayyubid victory was accorded to the army, 
Saladin not keeping anything himself. He continued towards Aleppo, which still closed its gates to him, halting before the city. On the way, his army took Bazaar, then captured Manbij. From there, they headed west to besiege the fortress of Azaz on the 15th of May. Several days later, while Saladin was resting in one of his captain's tents, an assassin rushed forward at him and struck at his head with a knife. The cap of his head armor was not penetrated and he managed to grip the assassin's hand, the dagger only slashing his gumbeson, and the assailant was soon killed. Saladin was unnerved at the attempt on his life, which he accused Gumushtujan and the assassins of plotting, and so increased his efforts in the siege. Azaz capitulated on 21 June, and Saladin then hurried his forces to Aleppo to punish Gumushtujan. His assaults were again resisted, but he managed to secure not only a truce, but a mutual alliance with Aleppo, in which Gumushtujan and Asale were allowed to continue their hold on the city, and in return, they recognized Saladin as the sovereign over all of the dominions he conquered. The emirs of Mardin and Kifa, the Muslim allies of Aleppo, also recognized Saladin as the king of Syria. When the treaty was concluded, the younger sister of Asale came to Saladin and requested the return of the fortress of Azaz. He complied and escorted her back to the gates of Aleppo with numerous presents. Sultan of Egypt according to Ahmed ad-Din, Nur ad-Din wrote to Saladin in June 1171, telling him to re-establish the Abbasid Caliphate in Egypt, which Saladin coordinated two months later after additional encouragement by Najm ad-Din al-Khabushani, the Shafi'i Faqi, who vehemently opposed Shia rule in the country. Several Egyptian emirs were thus killed, but al adid was told that they were killed for rebelling against him. He then fell ill or was poisoned according to one account. While ill, he asked Saladin to pay him a visit to request that he take care of his young children, but Saladin refused, fearing treachery against the Abbasids, and is said to have regretted his action after realizing what al adid had wanted. He died on 13 September, and five days later, the Abbasid Qutbah was pronounced in Cairo in Al-Fastat, proclaiming Al-Mustadi as Caliph. On 25 September, Saladin left Cairo to take part in a joint attack on Kerik and Montreal, the desert castles of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, with Nur ad-Din who would attack from Syria. Prior to arriving at Montreal, Saladin however withdrew back to Cairo as he received the reports that in his absence the crusader leaders had increased their support to the traitors inside Egypt to attack Saladin from within and lessen his power especially the Fatimid who started plotting to restore their past glory. Because of this, Nur ad-Din went on alone. During the summer of 1173, a Nubian army along with a contingent of Armenian refugees were reported on the Egyptian border, preparing for a siege against Aswan. The emir of the city had requested Saladin's assistance and was given reinforcements under Turan Shah, Saladin's brother. Consequently, the Nubians departed, but returned in 1173 and were again driven off. This time, Egyptian forces advanced from Aswan and captured the Nubian town of Ibrin. Saladin sent a gift to Nur ad-Din, who had been his friend and teacher, 60,000 dinars, wonderful manufactured goods, some jewels, and an elephant. While transporting these goods to Damascus, Saladin took the opportunity to ravage the crusader countryside. He did not press an attack against the desert castles but attempted to drive out the Muslim Bedouins who lived in crusader territory with the aim of depriving the Franks of guides. On 31 July 1173, Saladin's father Ayyub was wounded in a horse-riding accident, ultimately causing his death on 9 August. In 1174, Saladin sent Turan Shah to conquer Yemen to allocate it and its port Aden to the territories of the Ayyubid dynasty. Battles and truce with Baldwin The Ayyubids allowed Baldwin IV of Jerusalem to enter Ascalon with his Gaza-based Knights Templar without taking any precautions against a sudden attack. Although the Crusader force consisted of only 375 knights, Saladin hesitated to ambush them because of the presence of highly skilled generals. On 25 November, while the greater part of the Ayyubid army was absent, Saladin and his men were surprised near Rimla in the Battle of Mont Gisad, possibly at Gezer, also known as Tel Gezer. Before they could form up, 
the Templar force hacked the Ayyubid army down. Initially, Saladin attempted to organize his men into battle order, but as his bodyguards were being killed, he saw that defeat was inevitable and so with a small remnant of his troops mounted a swift camel, riding all the way to the territories of Egypt. Not discouraged by his defeat at Mont Gisad, Saladin was prepared to fight the Crusaders once again. In the spring of 1178, he was encamped under the walls of Homs, and a few skirmishes occurred between his generals and the Crusader army. His forces in Hammer won a victory over their enemy and brought the spoils, together with many prisoners of war, to Saladin who ordered the captives to be beheaded for plundering and laying waste the lands of the faithful. He spent the rest of the year in Syria without a confrontation with his enemies. Saladin's intelligence services reported to him that the Crusaders were planning a raid into Syria. He ordered one of his generals, Farukh Shah, to guard the Damascus frontier with a thousand of his men to watch for an attack, then to retire, avoiding battle, and to light warning beacons on the hills, after which Saladin would march out. In April 1179, the Crusaders led by King Baldwin expected no resistance and waited to launch a surprise attack on Muslim herders grazing their herds and flocks east of the Golan Heights. Baldwin advanced to Rashli in pursuit of Farukh Shah's force, which was concentrated southeast of Kunitra and was subsequently defeated by the Ayyubids. With this victory, Saladin decided to call in more troops from Egypt. He requested Al Adil to dispatch 1,500 horsemen. In the summer of 1179, King Baldwin had set up an outpost on the road to Damascus and aimed to fortify a passage over the Jordan River, known as Jacob's Ford that commanded the approach to the Baniyas plain, the plain was divided by the Muslims and the Christians. Saladin had offered 100,000 gold pieces to Baldwin to abandon the project, which was particularly offensive to the Muslims, but to no avail. He then resolved to destroy the fortress, called Chastelet and defended by the Templars, moving his headquarters to Baniyas. As the Crusaders hurried down to attack the Muslim forces, they fell into disorder, with the infantry falling behind. Despite early success, they pursued the Muslims far enough to become scattered, and Saladin took advantage by rallying his troops and charged at the Crusaders. The engagement ended in a decisive Ayyubid victory, and many high-ranking knights were captured. Saladin then moved to besiege the fortress, which fell on 30 August 1179. In the spring of 1180, while Saladin was in the area of Safed, anxious to commence a vigorous campaign against the Kingdom of Jerusalem, King Baldwin sent messengers to him with proposals of peace. Because droughts and bad harvests hampered his commissariat, Saladin agreed to a truce. Raymond of Tripoli denounced the truce but was compelled to accept after an Ayyubid raid on his territory in May and upon the appearance of Saladin's naval fleet off the port of Tartus. After leaving the Anusaria mountains, Saladin returned to Damascus and had his Syrian soldiers return home. He left Turan Shah in command of Syria and left for Egypt with only his personal followers, reaching Cairo on the 22nd of September. Having been absent roughly two years, he had much to organize and supervise in Egypt, namely fortifying and reconstructing Cairo. The city walls were repaired and their extensions laid out, while the construction of the Cairo citadel was commenced. The 280 feet 85 meters deep Bir Yusuf Joseph's well was built on Saladin's orders. The chief public work he commissioned outside of Cairo was the large bridge at Giza, which was intended to form an outwork of defense against a potential Moorish invasion. Saladin remained in Cairo supervising its improvements, building colleges such as the Madrasa of the Swad Makers and ordering the internal administration of the country. In November 1177, he set out upon a raid into Palestine. The Crusaders had recently forayed into the territory of Damascus, so Saladin saw the truce as no longer worth preserving. The Christians sent a large portion of their army to besiege the fortress of Harim north of Aleppo, so southern Palestine bore few defenders. Saladin found the situation ripe and marched to Ascalon, which he referred to as the Bride of Syria. William of Tyre recorded that the Ayyubid army consisted of 26,000 soldiers, of which 8,000 were elite forces and 18,000 were black soldiers from Sudan. 
this army proceeded to raid the countryside, sack Rimla and Lord, and dispersed themselves as far as the gates of Jerusalem. Saladin had by now agreed truces with his Zengid rivals in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the latter occurred in the summer of 1175, but faced a threat from the Ismaili sect known as the Assassins, led by Rashid ad-Din Sana. Based in the Anusaria Mountains, they commanded nine fortresses, all built on high elevations. As soon as he dispatched the bulk of his troops to Egypt, Saladin led his army into the Anusaria range in August 1176. He retreated the same month, after laying waste to the countryside, but failing to conquer any of the forts. Most Muslim historians claim that Saladin's uncle, the governor of Hama, mediated a peace agreement between him and Sana. Saladin had his guards supplied with link lights and had chalk and cinders strewed around his tent outside Masyaf, which he was besieging to detect any footsteps by the assassins. According to this version, one night Saladin's guards noticed a spark glowing down the hill of Masyaf and then vanishing among the Ayyubid tents. Presently, Saladin awoke to find a figure leaving the tent. He saw that the lambs were displaced and beside his bed laid hot scones of the shape peculiar to the assassins with a note at the top pinned by a poison dagger. The note threatened that he would be killed if he did not withdraw from his assault. Saladin gave a loud cry, exclaiming that Sana himself was the figure that had left the tent. Another version claims that Saladin hastily withdrew his troops from Masyaf because they were urgently needed to fend off a crusader force in the vicinity of Mount Lebanon. In reality, Saladin sought to form an alliance with Sana and his assassins, consequently depriving the crusaders of a potent ally against him. Viewing the expulsion of the Crusaders as a mutual benefit and priority, Saladin and Sana maintained cooperative relations afterward, the latter dispatching contingents of his forces to bolster Saladin's army in a number of decisive subsequent battlefronts. Saladin turned his attention from Mosul to Aleppo, sending his brother Taj al-Muluk Buri to capture Tel Khalid, 130 kilometers northeast of the city. A siege was set, but the governor of Tel Khalid surrendered upon the arrival of Saladin himself on 17 May before a siege could take place. According to Ahmed ad-Din, after Tel Khalid, Saladin took a detour northwards to Aintib, but he gained possession of it when his army turned towards it, allowing him to quickly move backward another sea, 100 kilometers towards Aleppo. On 21 May, he camped outside the city, positioning himself east of the citadel of Aleppo, while his forces encircled the suburb of Bunikusa to the northeast and Bab Janan to the west. He stationed his men dangerously close to the city, hoping for an early success. Zangi did not offer long resistance. He was unpopular with his subjects and wished to return to his Sia, the city he governed previously. An exchange was negotiated where Zangi would hand over Aleppo to Saladin in return for the restoration of his control of Sia, Musebin, and Raqqa. Zangi would hold these territories as Saladin's vassals in terms of military service. On 12 June, Aleppo was formally placed in Ayyubid hands. The people of Aleppo had not known about these negotiations and were taken by surprise when Saladin's standard was hoisted over the citadel. Two emirs, including an old friend of Saladin, Izal din Jurduk, welcomed and pledged their service to him. Saladin replaced the Hanafi courts with Shafi'i administration, despite a promise he would not interfere in the religious leadership of the city. Although he was short of money, Saladin also allowed the departing Zangi to take all the stores of the citadel that he could travel with and to sell the remainder, which Saladin purchased himself. In spite of his earlier hesitation to go through with the exchange, he had no doubts about his success, stating that Aleppo was, the key to the lands, and, the city is the eye of Syria and the citadel is its pupil. For Saladin, the capture of the city marked the end of over eight years of waiting since he told Farooq Shah that, we have only to do the milking and Aleppo will be ours. After spending one night in Aleppo's citadel, Saladin marched to Harim, near the crusader-held Antioch. The city was held by Surak, a minor Mamluk. Saladin offered him the city of Bushra and property in Damascus in exchange for Harim, but when Surak asked for more, his own garrison in Harim forced him out. 
he was arrested by Saladin's deputy Taki al-Din on allegations that he was planning to cede Harim to Bowman III of Antioch. When Saladin received its surrender, he proceeded to arrange the defense of Harim from the Crusaders. He reported to the Caliph and his own subordinates in Yemen and Baalbek that was going to attack the Armenians. Before he could move, however, there were a number of administrative details to be settled. Saladin agreed to a truce with Bomond in return for Muslim prisoners being held by him and then he gave Azaz to Alam ad-Din Suleiman and Aleppo to Saif al-Din al Yasku. The former was an emir of Aleppo who joined Saladin and the latter was a former Mamluk of Shirku who helped rescue him from the assassination attempt at Azaz. Saif al-Din had died earlier in June 1181 and his brother Iz al-Din inherited leadership of Mosul. On the 4th of December, the crown prince of the Zenjids, as Saleh, died in Aleppo. Prior to his death, he had his chief officers swear an oath of loyalty to Iz al-Din, as he was the only Zengid ruler strong enough to oppose Saladin. Iz al-Din was welcomed in Aleppo, but possessing it in Mosul put too great of a strain on his abilities. He thus, handed Aleppo to his brother Ahmed al-Din Zangi, in exchange for Siyah. Saladin offered no opposition to these transactions in order to respect the treaty he previously made with the Zenjids. On the 11th of May 1182, Saladin, along with half of the Egyptian Ayyubid army and numerous non-combatants, left Cairo for Syria. On the evening before he departed, he sat with his companions and the tutor of one of his sons quoted a line of poetry, Enjoy the scent of the oxi plant of Najd, for after this evening it will come no more. Saladin took this as an evil omen and he never saw Egypt again. Knowing that crusader forces were massed upon the frontier to intercept him, he took the desert route across the Sinai Peninsula to Elar at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba. Meeting no opposition, Saladin ravaged the countryside of Montreal, whilst Baldwin's forces watched on, refusing to intervene. He arrived in Damascus in June to learn that Farouk Shah had attacked the Galilee, sacking Daburia and capturing Habas Jaldik, a fortress of great importance to the Crusaders. In July, Saladin dispatched Farouk Shah to attack Kokab al Hawa. Later, in August, the Ayyubids launched a naval and ground assault to capture Beirut. Saladin led his army in the Baka Valley. The assault was leaning towards failure and Saladin abandoned the operation to focus on issues in Mesopotamia. Kukbarit Muzaffar ad-Din Gokbori, the emir of Haram, invited Saladin to occupy the Jazira region, making up northern Mesopotamia. He complied and the truce between him and the Zenjids officially ended in September 1182. Prior to his march to Jazira, tensions had grown between the Zengid rulers of the region, primarily concerning their unwillingness to pay deference to Mosul. Before he crossed the Euphrates, Saladin besieged Aleppo for three days, signaling that the truce was over. Once he reached Bira, near the river, he was joined by Kukbari and Nur al-Din of Hizan Kefa and the combined forces captured the cities of Jazira, one after the other. First, Edessa fell, followed by Saruj, then Raqqa, Kirkizhir and Nusebin. Raqqa was an important crossing point and held by Kutbi al-Din Inal, who had lost Manbij to Saladin in 1176. Upon seeing the large size of Saladin's army, he made little effort to resist and surrendered on the condition that he would retain his property. Saladin promptly impressed the inhabitants of the town by publishing a decree that ordered a number of taxes to be cancelled and erased all mention of them from treasury records, stating, the most miserable rulers are those whose purses are fat and their people thin. From Raqqa, he moved to conquer Al-Fudain, Al-Hussein, Maxim, Darain, Arabin, and Khabur, all of which swore allegiance to him. Saladin proceeded to take Nusabin which offered no resistance. A medium-sized town, Nusabin was not of great importance, but it was located in a strategic position between Madan and Mosul and within easy reach of Diyabakir. In the midst of these victories, Saladin received word that the Crusaders were raiding the villages of Damascus. He replied, let them, whilst they knock down villages, we are taking cities, when we come back, we shall have all the more strength to fight them. Meanwhile, in Aleppo, the emir of the city Zangi raided Saladin's cities to the north and east, such as Balas, Manbij, Saruj, Bazaar, Al-Khazan. 
He also destroyed his own citadel at Azaz to prevent it from being used by the Ayyubids if they were to conquer it. Domestic affairs in June 1180, Saladin hosted a reception for Nur al-Din Muhammad, the Atakid Emir of Kifa, at Guksu, in which he presented him and his brother Abu Bakr with gifts, valued at over 100,000 dinars according to Ahmed al-Din. This was intended to cement an alliance with the Articids and to impress other emirs in Mesopotamia and Anatolia. Previously, Saladin offered to mediate relations between Nur al-Din and Kilij Aslan II, the Seluk Sultan of Rum, after the two came into conflict. The latter demanded that Nur al-Din return the lands given to him as a dowry for marrying his daughter when he received reports that she was being abused and used to gain Seluk territory. Nur al-Din asked Saladin to mediate the issue, but Aslan refused. After Nur al-Din and Saladin met at Guksu, the top Seluk emir, Ikhtiar al-Din al-Hassan, confirmed Aslan's submission, after which an agreement was drawn up. Saladin was later enraged when he received a message from Aslan accusing Nur al-Din of more abuses against his daughter. He threatened to attack the city of Malatya, saying, it is two days' march for me and I shall not dismount my horse until I am in the city. Alarmed at the threat, the Seluks pushed for negotiations. Saladin felt that Aslan was correct to care for his daughter, but Nur al-Din had taken refuge with him, and therefore he could not betray his trust. It was finally agreed that Aslan's daughter would be sent away for a year and if Nur al-Din failed to comply, Saladin would move to abandon his support for him. Leaving Farouk Shah in charge of Syria, Saladin returned to Cairo at the beginning of 1181. According to Abu Shama, he intended to spend the fast of Ramadan in Egypt and then make the Hajj pilgrimage to Makkah in the summer. For an unknown reason, he apparently changed his plans regarding the pilgrimage and was seen inspecting the Nile River banks in June. He was again embroiled with the Bedouin, he removed two-thirds of their fiefs to use as compensation for the fief holders at Fayyim. The Bedouin were also accused of trading with the Crusaders and, consequently, their grain was confiscated and they were forced to migrate westward. Later, Ayyubid warships were waged against Bedouin river pirates, who were plundering the shores of Lake Tanis. In the summer of 1181, Saladin's former palace administrator Karakush led a force to arrest Majd al-Din, a former deputy of Turan Shah in the Yemeni town of Zabad, while he was entertaining Ahmed ad-Din al-Ishfahani at his estate in Cairo. Saladin's intimates accused Majd al-Din of misappropriating the revenues of Zabad, but Saladin himself believed there was no evidence to back the allegations. He had Majd al-Din released in return for a payment of 80,000 dinars. In addition, other sums were to be paid to Saladin's brothers al-Adil and Taj al-Mulukburi. The controversial detainment of Majd al-Din was a part of the larger discontent associated with the aftermath of Turan Shah's departure from Yemen. Although his deputies continued to send him revenues from the province, centralized authority was lacking and an internal quarrel arose between Is al-Din Uthman of Aden and Hitan of Zabad. Saladin wrote in a letter to al-Adil, this Yemen is a treasure house. We conquered it, but up to this day we have had no return and no advantage from it. There have been only innumerable expenses, the sending out of troops, and expectations which did not produce what was hoped for in the end. As Saladin approached Mosul, he faced the issue of taking over a large city and justifying the action. The Zenjids of Mosul appealed to an Nasir, the Abbasid Caliph at Baghdad whose vizier favored them. And Nasir sent Badr al-Badr, a high-ranking religious figure, to mediate between the two sides. Saladin arrived at the city on 10 November 1182. Is al-Din would not accept his terms because he considered them disingenuous and extensive, and Saladin immediately laid siege to the heavily fortified city. After several minor skirmishes and a stalemate in the siege that was initiated by the caliph, Saladin intended to find a way to withdraw without damage to his reputation while still keeping up some military pressure. He decided to attack Siyah, which was held by Izar Dun's brother Sharaf al-Din. It fell after a 15-day siege on 30 December. Saladin's soldiers broke their discipline, plundering the city. Saladin only managed to protect the governor and his officers by sending them to Mosul. After establishing a garrison at Siyah, 
He awaited a coalition assembled by Izal Din consisting of his forces, those from Aleppo, Mardin, and Armenia. Saladin and his army met the coalition at Haram in February 1183, but on hearing of his approach, the latter sent messengers to Saladin asking for peace. Each force returned to their cities and Al-Fadal wrote, The Izal Dun's coalition advance like men, like women they vanished. On the 2nd of March, Al-Adil from Egypt wrote to Saladin that the Crusaders had struck the heart of Islam. Reynald the Chitilin had sent ships to the Gulf of Aqaba to raid towns and villages off the coast of the Red Sea. It was not an attempt to extend the Crusader influence into that sea or to capture its trade routes, but merely a piratical move. Nonetheless, Ahmed al-Din writes the raid was alarming to the Muslims because they were not accustomed to attacks on that sea, and Ibn al-Athir adds that the inhabitants had no experience with the Crusaders either as fighters or traders. Ibn Jubar was told that 16 Muslim ships were burnt by the Crusaders, who then captured a pilgrim ship and caravan at Adab. He also reported that they intended to attack Medina and remove Muhammad's body. Al-Makrizi added to the rumor by claiming Muhammad's tomb was going to be relocated to Crusader territory so Muslims would make pilgrimages there. Al-Adil had his warships moved from Fustat and Alexandria to the Red Sea under the command of an Armenian mercenary Lulu. They broke the Crusader blockade, destroyed most of their ships, and pursued and captured those who anchored and fled into the desert. The surviving Crusaders, numbered at 170, were ordered to be killed by Saladin in various Muslim cities. From the point of view of Saladin, in terms of territory, the war against Mosul was going well, but he still failed to achieve his objectives and his army was shrinking. Taki al-Din took his men back to Hama, while Nasir al-Din Muhammad and his forces had left. This encouraged Iz al-Din and his allies to take the offensive. The previous coalition regrouped at Hazam some 140 kilometers from Haram. In early April, without waiting for Nasir al-Din, Saladin and Taki al-Din commenced their advance against the coalition, marching eastward to Ras al-Ain unhindered. By late April, after three days of actual fighting, according to Saladin, the Ayyubids had captured Ahmed. He handed the city to Nur al-Din Muhammad together with its stores, which consisted of 80,000 candles, a tower full of arrowheads, and 1,040,000 books. In return for a diploma granting him the city, Nur al-Din swore allegiance to Saladin, promising to follow him in every expedition in the war against the Crusaders, and repairing the damage done to the city. The fall of Amid, in addition to territory, convinced Il Ghazi of Mardin to enter the service of Saladin, weakening Izar Dun's coalition. Saladin attempted to gain the Caliph and Nazir's support against Izal Din by sending him a letter requesting a document that would give him legal justification for taking over Mosul and its territories. Saladin aimed to persuade the Caliph claiming that while he conquered Egypt and Yemen under the flag of the Abbasids, the Zenjids of Mosul openly supported the Seluks rivals of the Caliphate and only came to the Caliph when in need. He also accused Izal Dun's forces of disrupting the Muslim, holy war, against the Crusaders, stating, they are not content not to fight, but they prevent those who can. Saladin defended his own conduct claiming that he had come to Syria to fight the Crusaders, end the heresy of the assassins, and stop the wrongdoing of the Muslims. He also promised that if Mosul was given to him, it would lead to the capture of Jerusalem, Constantinople, Georgia, and the lands of the Almohads in the Maghreb, until the word of God is supreme and the Abbasid Caliphate has wiped the world clean, turning the churches into mosques. Saladin stressed that all this would happen by the will of God, and instead of asking for financial or military support from the Caliph, he would capture and give the Caliph the territories of Tikrit, Dakak, Kutestan, Kish Island, and Oman. On 29 September 1182, Saladin crossed the Jordan River to attack Basin, which was found to be empty. The next day his forces sacked and burned the town and moved westwards. They intercepted crusader reinforcements from Karak and Shabak along the Nablus road and took a number of prisoners. Meanwhile, the main crusader force under Guy of Lusignan moved from Sepphoris to Alfula. Saladin sent out 500 skirmishers to harass their forces, 
and he himself marched to Injalut. When the crusader force, reckoned to be the largest the kingdom ever produced from its own resources, but still outmatched by the Muslims' advance, the Ayyubids unexpectedly moved down the stream of Injalut. After a few Ayyubid raids, including attacks on Zirin, Forbelit, and Mount Tabor, the crusaders still were not tempted to attack their main force, and Saladin led his men back across the river once provisions and supplies ran low. 85. Crusader attacks provoked further responses by Saladin. Reynard of Chitilin, in particular, harassed Muslim trading and pilgrimage routes with a fleet on the Red Sea, a water route that Saladin needed to keep open. In response, Saladin built a fleet of 30 galleys to attack Beirut in 1182. Reynard threatened to attack the holy cities of Makkah and Medina. In retaliation, Saladin twice besieged Kerik, Reynard's fortress in Old Rajodane, in 1183 and 1184. Reynald responded by looting a caravan of pilgrims on the Hajj in 1185. According to the later 13th century old French continuation of William of Tyre, Reynald captured Saladin's sister in a raid on a caravan. This claim is not attested in contemporary sources, Muslim or Frankish, however, instead stating that Reynald had attacked a preceding caravan, and Saladin set guards to ensure the safety of his sister and her son, who came to no harm. Following the failure of his Kerik sieges, Saladin temporarily turned his attention back to another long-term project and resumed attacks on the territory of his Ad-Din Masood Ibn Maudid Ibn Zangi around Mosul, which he had begun with some success in 1182. However, since then, Masood had allied himself with the powerful governor of Azerbaijan and Jibal, who in 1185 began moving his troops across the Zagros Mountains, causing Saladin to hesitate in his attacks. The defenders of Mosul, when they became aware that help was on the way, increased their efforts, and Saladin subsequently fell ill, so in March 1186 a peace treaty was signed. In July 1187, Saladin captured most of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. On 4 July 1187, at the Battle of Hattin, he faced the combined forces of Guy of Lusignan, King Consort of Jerusalem, and Raymond III of Tripoli. In this battle alone the Crusader force was largely annihilated by Saladin's determined army. It was a major disaster for the Crusaders and a turning point in the history of the Crusades. Saladin captured Reynald and was personally responsible for his execution in retaliation for his attacks against Muslim caravans. The members of these caravans had, in vain, besought his mercy by reciting the truce between the Muslims and the Crusaders, but Reynard ignored this and insulted the Islamic prophet, Muhammad, before murdering and torturing a number of them. Upon hearing this, Saladin swore an oath to personally execute Reynald. Guy of Lusignan was also captured. Seeing the execution of Reynald, he feared he would be next. However, his life was spared by Saladin, who said of Reynald, IT is not the wont of kings, to kill kings, but that man had transgressed all bounds, and therefore did I treat him thus. Capture of Jerusalem Saladin had captured almost every crusader city. Saladin preferred to take Jerusalem without bloodshed and offered generous terms, but those inside refused to leave their holy city, vowing to destroy it in a fight to the death rather than see it handed over peacefully. Jerusalem capitulated to his forces on Friday, 2 October 1187, after a siege. When the siege had started, Saladin was unwilling to promise terms of quarter to the Frankish inhabitants of Jerusalem. Bullion of Ibelin threatened to kill every Muslim hostage, estimated at 5,000, and to destroy Islam's holy shrines of the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque if such quarter were not provided. Saladin consulted his council and the terms were accepted. The agreement was read out through the streets of Jerusalem so that everyone might within 40 days provide for himself and pay to Saladin the agreed tribute for his freedom. An unusually low ransom was to be paid for each franc in the city, whether man, woman, or child, but Saladin, against the wishes of his treasurers, allowed many families who could not afford the ransom to leave. Patriarch Heraclius of Jerusalem organized and contributed to a collection that paid the ransoms for about 18,000 of the poorer citizens, leaving another 15,000 to be enslaved. 
Saladin's brother Al-Adil, asked Saladin for a thousand of them for his own use and then released them on the spot. Most of the foot soldiers were sold into slavery. Upon the capture of Jerusalem, Saladin summoned the Jews and permitted them to resettle in the city. In particular, the residents of Ishkelon, a large Jewish settlement, responded to his request. The subject ordered the churches repurposed as host stables and the church towers destroyed. Tyre, on the coast of modern-day Lebanon, was the last major crusader city that was not captured by Muslim forces. Strategically, it would have made more sense for Saladin to capture Tyre before Jerusalem. Saladin, however, chose to pursue Jerusalem first because of the importance of the city to Islam. Tyre was commanded by Conrad of Montferrat, who strengthened its defences and withstood two sieges by Saladin. In 1188, at Tortosa, Saladin released Guy of Lusignan and returned him to his wife Sibylla of Jerusalem. They went first to Tripoli, then to Antioch. In 1189, they sought to reclaim Tyre for their kingdom but were refused admission by Conrad, who did not recognize Guy as king. Guy then set about besieging Acre. Saladin was on friendly terms with Queen Tamar of Georgia. Saladin's biographer Baha, ad din ibn Sadad reports that, after Saladin's conquest of Jerusalem, the Georgian queen sent envoys to the Sultan to request the return of confiscated possessions of the Georgian monasteries in Jerusalem. Saladin's response is not recorded, but the queen's efforts seem to have been successful as Jacques de Vitry, the Bishop of Acre, reports the Georgians were, in contrast to the other Christian pilgrims, allowed a free passage into the city with their banners unfurled. IBN Sadad furthermore claims that Queen Tamar outbid the Byzantine emperor in her efforts to obtain the relics of the true cross, offering 200,000 gold pieces to Saladin who had taken the relics as booty at the Battle of Hattin, but to no avail. Third Crusade It is equally true that his generosity, his piety, devoid of fanaticism, that flower of liberality and courtesy which had been the model of our old chroniclers, won him no less popularity in Frankish Syria than in the lands of Islam. Hattin and the fall of Jerusalem prompted the Third Crusade 1189-1192, which was partially financed by a special, Saladin Tithe, in 1188. King Richard I led Guy's siege of Acre, conquered the city and executed almost 3,000 Muslim prisoners of war. Baha, ad Din wrote. The motives of this massacre are differently told, according to some, the captives were slain by way of reprisal for the death of those Christians whom the Muslims had slain. Others again say that the King of England, on deciding to attempt the conquest of Ascalon, thought it unwise to leave so many prisoners in the town after his departure. God alone knows what the real reason was. The armies of Saladin engaged in combat with the army of King Richard at the Battle of Ersuf on 7 September 1191, at which Saladin's forces suffered heavy losses and were forced to withdraw. After the Battle of Ersuf, Richard occupied Jaffa, restoring the city's fortifications. Meanwhile, Saladin moved south, where he dismantled the fortifications of Ascalon to prevent this strategically important city, which lay at the junction between Egypt and Palestine, from falling into Crusader hands. In October 1191, Richard began restoring the inland castles on the coastal plain beyond Jaffa in preparation for an advance on Jerusalem. During this period, Richard and Saladin passed envoys back and forth, negotiating the possibility of a truce. Richard proposed that his sister Joan should marry Saladin's brother and that Jerusalem could be their wedding gift. However, Saladin rejected this idea when Richard insisted that Saladin's brother convert to Christianity. Richard suggested that his niece Eleanor, fair maid of Brittany be the bride instead, an idea that Saladin also rejected. In January 1192, Richard's army occupied Beit Muba, just 12 miles from Jerusalem, but withdrew without attacking the holy city. Instead, Richard advanced south on Ascalon, where he restored the fortifications. In July 1192, Saladin tried to threaten Richard's command of the coast by attacking Jaffa. The city was besieged, and Saladin very nearly captured it, however, Richard arrived a few days later and defeated Saladin's army in a battle outside the city. The Battle of Jaffa 1192
proved to be the last military engagement of the Third Crusade. After Richard reoccupied Jaffa and restored its fortifications, he and Saladin again discussed terms. At last Richard agreed to demolish the fortifications of Ascalon, while Saladin agreed to recognize crusader control of the Palestinian coast from Tyre to Jaffa. The Christians would be allowed to travel as unarmed pilgrims to Jerusalem, and Saladin's kingdom would be at peace with the crusader states for the following three years. Saladin died of a fever on 4 March 1193, at Damascus, not long after King Richard's departure. In Saladin's possession at the time of his death were one piece of gold and forty pieces of silver. He had given away his great wealth to his poor subjects, leaving nothing to pay for his funeral. He was buried in a mausoleum in the garden outside the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, Syria. Originally the tomb was part of a complex which also included a school, Madrasa al-Azizia, of which little remains except a few columns and an internal arch. Seven centuries later, Emperor Wilhelm II of Germany donated a new marble sarcophagus to the mausoleum. However, the original sarcophagus was not replaced, instead, the mausoleum, which is open to visitors, now has two sarcophagi, the marble one placed on the side and the original wooden one, which covers Saladin's tomb. Saladin eventually achieved a great reputation in Europe as a chivalrous knight, due to his fierce struggle against the Crusaders and his generosity. In the Divine Comedy he is mentioned as one of the virtuous non-Christians in Limbo, and he is also depicted favorably in Boccaccio's The Decameron. Although Saladin faded into history after the Middle Ages, he appears in a sympathetic light in Gotthold Ephraim Lussing's play Nathan the Wise, 1779, and in Sir Walter Scott's novel The Talisman, 1825. The modern view of Saladin originates mainly from these texts. Scott's portrayal of Saladin was that of a modern, 19th-century, liberal European gentleman, beside whom medieval Westerners would always have made a poor showing. Despite the Crusaders' slaughter when they originally conquered Jerusalem in 1099, Saladin granted amnesty and free passage to all common Catholics and even to the defeated Christian army, as long as they were able to pay the aforementioned ransom, the Greek Orthodox Christians were treated even better because they often opposed the Western Crusaders. Notwithstanding the differences in beliefs, the Muslim Saladin was respected by Christian lords, Richard especially. Richard once praised Saladin as a great prince, saying that he was, without doubt, the greatest and most powerful leader in the Islamic world. Saladin, in turn, stated that there was not a more honorable Christian lord than Richard. After the treaty, Saladin and Richard sent each other many gifts as tokens of respect but never met face to face. In April 1191, a Frankish woman's three-month-old baby had been stolen from her camp and sold on the market. The Franks urged her to approach Saladin herself with her grievance. According to Baha, al-Din, Saladin used his own money to buy the child back. He gave it to the mother and she took it, with tears streaming down her face, and hugged the baby to her chest. The people were watching her and weeping and I, Ibn Shaddad, was standing amongst them. She suckled it for some time and then Saladin ordered a horse to be fetched for her and she went back to camp. Saladin has become a prominent figure in Islamic, Arab, Turkish and Kurdish culture, and he has been described as the most famous Kurd in history. In 1898, German Emperor Wilhelm II visited Saladin's tomb to pay his respects. The visit, coupled with anti-imperialist sentiments, encouraged the image in the Arab world of Saladin as a hero of the struggle against the West, Building on was the romantic one created by Walter Scott and other Europeans in the West at the time. Saladin's reputation had previously been largely forgotten in the Muslim world, eclipsed by more successful figures, such as Bebas of Egypt. Modern Arab states have sought to commemorate Saladin through various measures, often based on the image created of him in the 19th century West. The governorate centered around Tikrit and Samarra in modern-day Iraq, Saladin Governorate, is named after him, as is Salahuddin University in Erbil, the largest city of Iraqi Kurdistan. A suburban community of Erbil, Masif Salahuddin, is also named after him. Few structures associated with Saladin survive within modern cities. 
Saladin first fortified the citadel of Cairo 1175-1183, which had been a domed pleasure pavilion with a fine view in more peaceful times. In Syria, even the smallest city is centered on a defensible citadel, and Saladin introduced this essential feature to Egypt. Although the Ayyubid dynasty that he founded would only outlive him by 57 years, the legacy of Saladin within the Arab world continues to this day. With the rise of Arab nationalism in the 20th century, particularly with regard to the Arab-Israeli conflict, Saladin's heroism and leadership gained a new significance. Saladin's recapture of Palestine from the European Crusaders is considered an inspiration for modern-day Arabs' opposition to Zionism. Moreover, the glory and comparative unity of the Arab world under Saladin was seen as the perfect symbol for the new unity sought by Arab nationalists, such as Jamal Abdel Nasser. For this reason, the eagle of Saladin became the symbol of revolutionary Egypt, and was subsequently adopted by several other Arab states the United Arab Republic, Iraq, Libya, the state of Palestine, and Yemen. Among Egyptian Shias, Saladin is dubbed as Kharab al-Din, the destroyer of religion, a derisive play on the name, Saladin. Derisive play on the name, Saladin. Derisive During his reign, his generals greatly expanded the size of the Chinese state, campaigns south of Chu permanently added the Yu lands of Hunan and Guangdong to the Chinese cultural orbit, campaigns in Central Asia conquered the Odo's loop from the nomad Zhongnu, although eventually it would also lead to their confederation under Modu Chinyu. Qin Shi Huang also worked with his minister Li Si to enact major economic and political reforms aimed at the standardization of the diverse practices of the earlier Chinese states. He is traditionally said to have banned and burned many books and executed scholars. His public works projects included the unification of diverse state walls into a single Great Wall of China and a massive new national road system, as well as the city-sized mausoleum guarded by the life-sized terracotta army. He ruled until his death in 210 BC during his fourth tour of eastern China. Modern Chinese sources often give the personal name of Qin Shi Huang as Ying Zheng, with Ying Ying taken as the surname and Zheng Zheng, the given name. In ancient China, however, the naming convention differed, and Zhao Zhao, the place where he was born and raised, may be used as the surname. Unlike modern Chinese names, the nobles of ancient China had two distinct surnames. The ancestral name Zing comprised a larger group descended from a prominent ancestor, usually said to have lived during the time of the three sovereigns and five emperors of Chinese legend, and the clan name Qi comprised a smaller group that showed a branch's current fee for recent title. The ancient practice was to list men's names separately, Simukians, basic annals of the first emperor of Qin, introduces him as, given the name Zheng and the surname Zhao, or to combine the clan surname with the personal name, Sima's account of Chu describes the 16th year of the reign of King Kali as, the time when Zhao Zheng was enthroned as king of Qin. However, since modern Chinese surnames despite usually descending from clan names use the same character as the old ancestral names, it is much more common in modern Chinese sources to see the emperor's personal name written as Ying Zheng, using the ancestral name of the Ying family. The rulers of Qin had styled themselves kings from the time of King Havan in 325 BC. Upon his ascension, Zheng became known as the King of Qin or King Zheng of Qin. This title made him the nominal equal of the rulers of Shang and of Zhou, the last of whose kings had been deposed by King Zhaoxiang of Qin in 256 BC. Following the surrender of Qi in 221 BC, 
King Zheng had reunited all of the lands of the former kingdom of Zhou. Rather than maintain his rank as king, however, he created a new title of Wangdi Emperor for himself. This new title combined two titles, Huvang of the mythical three sovereigns, San Huvang, San Huvang, and the Di of the legendary five emperors, Wu Di, Wu Di of Chinese prehistory. The title was intended to appropriate some of the prestige of the Yellow Emperor, whose cult was popular in the later Warring States period and who was considered to be a founder of the Chinese people. King Zheng chose the new regnal name of First Emperor, Shi Wangdi, formally transcribed as Shi Huangdi. On the understanding that his successors would be successively titled the Second Emperor, third emperor, and so on through the generations. In fact, the scheme lasted only as long as his immediate heir, the second emperor. The new title carried religious overtones. For that reason, sinologists, starting with Peter Budberg or Edward Schaefer, sometimes translate it as Theach, and the first emperor as the first Theach. As early as Sima Qian, it was common to shorten the resulting four-character Qin Shi Wangdi to Qin Shi Huvang, variously transcribed as Qin Shi Wang or Qin Shi Huvang. Following his elevation as emperor, both Zheng's personal name Zheng and possibly its homophone Zheng became taboo. The first emperor also arrogated the first person Chinese pronoun Zhen, oak asterisk lum. Zhen, for his exclusive use and in 212 BC began calling himself the immortal. Others were to address him as, Your Majesty, Bai Chia, Maud. Bixia, Lit. Beneath the palace steps, in person and, Your Highness, Shank, in writing. According to the records of the Grand Historian, written by Sima Qian during the Ha dynasty, the first emperor was the eldest son of the Qin Prince Yiren, who later became King Zhuangxiang of Qin. Prince Yiren at that time was residing at the court of Zhao, serving as a hostage to guarantee the armistice between the Qin and Zhao states. Prince Yiren had fallen in love at first sight with a concubine of Lu Bu Wei, a rich merchant from the state of Wei. Lu consented for her to be Yiren's wife, who then became known as Lady Zhao, Zhao Ji, after the state of Zhao. He was given the name Zhao Zheng. The name Zheng, Zheng came from his month of birth Zhenggu, the first month of the Chinese lunar calendar. The clan name of Zhao came from his father's lineage and was unrelated to either his mother's name or the location of his birth. Song Zhong says that his birthday, significantly, was on the first day of Zhenggu. Liu Buwei's machinations later helped Yiren become King Zhuangxiang of Qin in 250 BC. However, the records of the Grand Historian also claimed that the first emperor was not the actual son of Prince Yiren but that of Liu Bu Wei. According to this account, when Liu Bu Wei introduced the dancing girl to the prince, she was Liu Bu Wei's concubine and had already become pregnant by him, and the baby was born after an unusually long period of pregnancy. According to translations of the annals of Liu Bu Wei, Zhao Ji gave birth to the future emperor in the city of Handan in 259 BC, the first month of the 48th year of King Zhao Xiang of Qin. The idea that the emperor was an illegitimate child, widely believed throughout Chinese history, contributed to the generally negative view of the first emperor. However, a number of modern scholars have doubted this account of his birth. Sinologist Doug Bord wrote, 
there is good reason for believing that the sentence describing this unusual pregnancy is an interpolation added to the Shichi by an unknown person in order to slander the first emperor and indicate his political as well as natal illegitimacy. John Knobloch and Geoffrey Regal, in their translation of Liu Bouvet's Spring and Autumn Annals, call the story, patently false, meant both to libel Liu and to cast aspersions on the first emperor. Claiming Liu Bouvet, a merchant, as the first emperor's biological father was meant to be especially disparaging, since later Confucian society regarded merchants as the lowest of all social classes. In 246 BC, when King Zhuangxiang died after a short reign of just three years, he was succeeded on the throne by his 13-year-old son. At the time, Zhao Zheng was still young, so Liu Bouvet acted as the regent prime minister of the state of Qin, which was still waging war against the other six states. Nine years later, in 235 BC, Zhao Zheng assumed full power after Liu Bouvet was banished for his involvement in a scandal with Queen Dowager Zhao. Zhao Chengzhou, the Lord Chang'an, Zhang and Jun was Zhao Zheng's legitimate half-brother, by the same father but from a different mother. After Zhao Zheng inherited the throne, Chengzhou rebelled at Tinliu and surrendered to the state of Zhao. Cheng Jiao's remaining retainers and families were executed by Zhao Zheng. La Wai's attempted coup as King Zheng grew older, Liu Buwei became fearful that the boy king would discover his liaison with his mother Lady Zhao. He decided to distance himself and look for a replacement for the Queen Dowager. He found a man named La Wai. According to the record of Grand Historian, Lao Ai was disguised as a eunuch by plucking his beard. Later Lao Ai and Queen Zhao Ji got along so well they secretly had two sons together. Lao Ai then became ennobled as Marquis Lavai, and was showered with riches. Lavai's plot was supposed to replace King Zheng with one of the hidden sons. But during a dinner party drunken Lavai was heard bragging about being the young king's stepfather. In 238 BC the king was traveling to the former capital, Yong Yong. Lavai seized the queen mother's seal and mobilized an army in an attempt to start a coup and rebel. When King Zheng discovered this fact, he ordered Liu Buwei to let Lord Changping and Lord Changwen attack La Wei. Although the royal army killed hundreds of rebels at the capital, La Wei succeeded in fleeing from this battle. A price of one million copper coins was placed on La Wei's head if he was taken alive or half a million if dead. La Wei's supporters were captured and beheaded, then Lao Wei was tied up and torn to five pieces by horse carriages, while his entire family was executed to the third degree. The two hidden sons were also killed, while Mother Zhao Ji was placed under house arrest until her death many years later. Liu Buwei drank a cup of poison wine and committed suicide in 235 BC. Ying Zheng then assumed full power as the king of the Qin state. Replacing Liu Buwei, Li Si became the new chancellor. King Zheng and his troops continued to take over different states. The state of Yan was small, weak and frequently harassed by soldiers. It was no match for the Qin state. So Crown Prince Dan of Yan plotted an assassination attempt to get rid of King Zheng, begging Jing Ke to go on the mission in 227 BC. Jing Ke was accompanied by King Buyang in the plot. Each was supposed to present a gift to King Zheng, a map of Dukang and the severed head of Fan Buji. King Buyang first tried to present the map case gift, but trembled in fear and moved no further towards the king. 
Jinke continued to advance toward the king, while explaining that his partner has never set eyes on the Son of Heaven, which is why he is trembling. Jinke had to present both gifts by himself. While unrolling the map, a dagger was revealed. The king drew back, stood on his feet, but struggled to draw the sword to defend himself. At the time, other palace officials were not allowed to carry weapons. Jinke pursued the king, attempting to stab him, but missed. King Zheng drew out his sword and cut Jinke's thigh. Jinke then threw the dagger, but missed again. Suffering eight wounds from the king's sword, Jinke realized his attempt had failed and knew that both of them would be killed afterwards. The Yan state was conquered by the Qin state five years later. Second attempted assassination Gao Jianli was a close friend of Jinke, who wanted to avenge his death. As a famous lute player, one day he was summoned by King Zheng to play the instrument. Someone in the palace who had known him in the past exclaimed, This is Gao Jianli. Unable to bring himself to kill such a skilled musician, the emperor ordered his eyes put out, but the king allowed Gao Jianli to play in his presence. He praised the playing and even allowed Gao Jianli to get closer. As part of the plot, the lute was fastened with a heavy piece of lead. He raised the lute and struck at the king. He missed, and his assassination attempt failed. Gao Jianli was later executed. In 230 BC, King Zheng unleashed the final campaigns of the Warring States period, setting out to conquer the remaining independent kingdoms, one by one. The first state to fall was Ha, Ha, sometimes called Han to distinguish it from the Ha Ha of Ha dynasty in 230 BC. Then Qin took advantage of natural disasters in 229 BC to invade and conquer Zhao, where Qin Shi Huang had been born. He now avenged his poor treatment as a child hostage there, seeking out and killing his enemies. Qin armies conquered the state of Zhao in 228 BC, the northern country of Yan in 226 BC, the small state of Wei in 225 BC, and the largest state and greatest challenge, Chu, in 223 BC. In 222 BC, the last remnants of Yan and the royal family were captured in Leodong in the northeast. The only independent country left was now state of Qi, in the far east, what is now the Shandong Peninsula. Terrified, the young king of Qi sent 200,000 people to defend his western borders. In 221 BC, the Qin armies invaded from the north, captured the king, and annexed Qi. Some of the strategies Qin used to unify China were to standardize the trade in communication, currency and language. For the first time, all Chinese lands were unified under one powerful ruler. In that same year, King Zheng proclaimed himself the first emperor, Shi Huangdi, Shi Wangdi, no longer a king in the old sense and now far surpassing the achievements of the old Zhou dynasty rulers. The emperor ordered the Heishibi to be made into the imperial seal, known as the heirloom seal of the realm. The words, having received the mandate from heaven, made the emperor lead a long and prosperous life. Shou Ming Yu Tian, Ji Shou Yong Chang were written by Prime Minister Li Si, and carved onto the seal by Sun Shou. The seal was later passed from emperor to emperor for generations to come. In the south, military expansion in the form of campaigns against the Yu tribes continued during his reign, with various regions being annexed to what is now Guangdong province and part of today's Vietnam.
in an attempt to avoid a recurrence of the political chaos of the Warring States period, King Shi Huang and his Prime Minister Li Si completely abolished feudalism. The empire was then divided into 36 commanderies, Jun, Jun later more than 40 commanderies. The whole of China was thus divided into administrative units, first commanderies, then counties, Xi'an, Xi'an. Townships, Xi'ang, Xi'ang, and hundred family units, Li, Li, which roughly corresponds to the modern day subdistricts and communities. This system was different from the previous dynasties, which had loose alliances and federations. People could no longer be identified by their native region or former feudal state, as when a person from Chu was called Chu person. Churen, Churen. Appointments were subsequently based on merit instead of hereditary rights. Economic reforms King Shi Huang and Li Si unified China economically by standardizing the Chinese units of measurements such as weights and measures, the currency, and the length of the axles of carts to facilitate transport on the road system. The emperor also developed an extensive network of roads and canals connecting the provinces to improve trade between them. The currencies of the different states were also standardized to the Ban Liang coin, Ban Liang, Ban Liang. Perhaps most importantly, the Chinese script was unified. Under Li Si, the seal script of the state of Qin was standardized through removal of variant forms within the Qin script itself. This newly standardized script was then made official throughout all the conquered regions, thus doing away with all the regional scripts to form one language, one communication system for all of China. While the previous Warring States era was one of constant warfare, it was also considered the golden age of free thought. Qin Shi Huang eliminated the hundred schools of thought which included Confucianism and other philosophies. After the unification of China, with all other schools of thought banned, legalism became the endorsed ideology of the Qin dynasty. Beginning in 213 BC, at the instigation of Li Si and to avoid scholars' comparisons of his reign with the past, Qin Shi Huang ordered most existing books to be burned with the exception of those on astrology, agriculture, medicine, divination, and the history of the state of Qin. This would also serve the purpose of furthering the ongoing reformation of the writing system by removing examples of obsolete scripts. Owning the Book of Songs or the Classic of History was to be punished especially severely. According to the later records of the Grand Historian, the following year Qin Shi Huang had some 460 scholars buried alive for owning the forbidden books. The emperor's oldest son Fuzu criticized him for this act. Recent research suggests that the burying of the Confucian scholars alive is a Confucian martyr's legend, rather, the emperor ordered the killing Keng Keng of a group of alchemists after having found that they had fooled him. In hard times, the Confucian scholars, who had served the king loyally, used that incident to distance themselves from the failed dynasty. Kong and Guo Kong and Guo C, 165 C, 74 BC, a descendant of Confucius, turned the alchemists Fang Shi Fang Shi into Confucianists Ruru, and entwined the martyr's legend with the strange story of the rediscovery of the lost Confucian books behind a demolished wall in the house of his ancestors. The emperor's own library still had copies of the forbidden books but most of these were destroyed later when Xiang Yu burned the palaces of Shanyang in 206 BC. Qin Shi Huang also followed the theory of the five elements, earth, 
wood, metal, fire and water. Wu the Zhong Shi Shuo Zhao Zheng's birth element is water, which is connected with the color black. It was also believed that the royal house of the previous dynasty Zhou had ruled by the power of fire, which was the color red. The New Qin dynasty must be ruled by the next element on the list, which is water, represented by the color black. Black became the color for garments, flags, pennants. Other associations include north as the cardinal direction, winter season and the number 6. Tallies and official hats were 15 cm 5.9 inches long, carriages 2 m 6.6 feet wide, one pace bu, bu, was 1.4 m 4.6 feet. In 230 BC, the state of Qin had defeated the state of Ha. A Ha aristocrat named Zhang Liang swore revenge on the Qin emperor. He sold all his valuables and in 218 BC, he hired a strongman assassin and built him a heavy metal cone weighing 120 jin, roughly 160 pounds or 97 kilograms. The two men hid among the bushes along the emperor's route over a mountain. At a signal, the muscular assassin hurled the cone at the first carriage and shattered it. However, the emperor was actually in the second carriage, as he was traveling with two identical carriages for this very reason. Thus the attempt failed. Both men were able to escape in spite of a huge manhunt. Great Wall the king fought nomadic tribes to the north and northwest. The Zhongwu tribes were not defeated and subdued, thus the campaign was tiring and unsuccessful, and to prevent the Zhongwu from encroaching on the northern frontier any longer, the emperor ordered the construction of an immense defensive wall. This wall, for whose construction hundreds of thousands of men were mobilized, and an unknown number died, is a precursor to the current Great Wall of China. It connected numerous state walls which had been built during the previous four centuries, a network of small walls linking river defenses to impassable cliffs. Intending to impose centralized rule and prevent the resurgence of feudal lords, Ying Zheng ordered the destruction of the sections of the walls that divided his empire among the former states. To position the empire against the Zhongwu people from the north, however, he ordered the building of new walls to connect the remaining fortifications along the empire's northern frontier. Build and move on was a central guiding principle in constructing the wall, implying that the Chinese were not erecting a permanently fixed border. Transporting the large quantity of materials required for construction was difficult, so builders always tried to use local resources. Stones from the mountains were used over mountain ranges, while rammed earth was used for construction in the plains. There are no surviving historical records indicating the exact length and course of the Qin walls. Most of the ancient walls have eroded away over the centuries, and very few sections remain today. The human cost of the construction is unknown, but it has been estimated by some authors that hundreds of thousands, if not up to a million, workers died building the Qin Wall. Linku Canal, a famous South China quotation, was In the north there is the Great Wall, in the south there is the Linku Canal, Biu Zhang Cheng Nan Yu Linku, Biu Zhang Cheng Nan Yu Linku. In 214 BC, the emperor began the project of a major canal to transport supplies to the army. The canal allows water transport between North and South China. The canal, 34 kilometers in length, links the Xiang River which flows into the Yangtze and the Lijing, which flows into the Pearl River. 
the canal connected two of China's major waterways and aided Gun's expansion into the southwest. The construction is considered one of the three great feats of ancient Chinese engineering, the others being the Great Wall and the Sichuan Dujangyan irrigation system. Elixir of life later in his life, Qin Shi Huang feared death and desperately sought the fabled elixir of life, which would supposedly allow him to live forever. He was obsessed with acquiring immortality and fell prey to many who offered him supposed elixirs. He visited Jifu Island three times in order to achieve immortality. In one case he sent Zhu Fu, a Jifu Islander, with ships carrying hundreds of young men and women in search of the mystical Penglai Mountain. They were sent to find Anki Sheng, a 1,000-year-old magician whom Qin Shi Huang had supposedly met in his travels and who had invited him to seek him there. These people never returned, perhaps because they knew that if they returned without the promised elixir, they would surely be executed. Legends claim that they reached Japan and colonized it. It is also possible that the book Burning, a purge on what could be seen as wasteful and useless literature, was, in part, an attempt to focus the minds of the emperor's best scholars on the alchemical quest. Some of the executed scholars were those who had been unable to offer any evidence of their supernatural schemes. This may have been the ultimate means of testing their abilities, if any of them had magic powers, then they would surely come back to life when they were let out again. Since the emperor was afraid of death and evil spirits, he had workers build a series of tunnels and passageways to each of his over 200 palaces, because traveling unseen would supposedly keep him safe from the evil spirits. In 211 BC a large meteor is said to have fallen in Dongjun in the lower reaches of the Yellow River. On it, an unknown person inscribed the words, The first emperor will die and his land will be divided, Shi Huang seer the Fen. When the emperor heard of this, he sent an imperial secretary to investigate this prophecy. No one would confess to the deed, so all the people living nearby were put to death. The stone was then pulverized. During his fifth tour of eastern China, the emperor became seriously ill after he arrived in Pingyunjin, Pingyun County, Shandong, and died on 10 September 210 BC, Julian Calendar, at the palace in Shakyu Prefecture, Shakyu Pingtai, Shakyu Pingtai, about two months away by road from the capital Shanyang. The cause of Qin Shi Wang's death is still largely unknown. Reportedly, he died from Chinese alchemical elixir poisoning due to ingesting mercury pills, made by his alchemists and court physicians, believing it to be an elixir of immortality. A possible contributing factor was illness due to the stress of running the empire. Second Emperor Conspiracy After the Emperor's death, Prime Minister Li Si, who accompanied him, became extremely worried that the news of his death could trigger a general uprising in the empire. It would take two months for the entourage to reach the capital, and it would not be possible to stop the uprising. Li Si decided to hide the death of the emperor, and returned to Shanyang. Most of the imperial entourage accompanying the emperor were left ignorant of the emperor's death. Only a younger son, Ying Huhai, who was traveling with his father, the eunuch Zhao Gao, Li Si, and five or six favorite eunuchs knew of the death. Li Si also ordered that two carts containing rotten fish be carried immediately before and after the wagon of the emperor. The idea behind this was to prevent people from noticing the foul smell emanating from the wagon of the emperor, 
where his body was starting to decompose severely as it was summertime. They also pulled down the shade so no one could see his face, changed his clothes daily, brought food and when he had to have important conversations, they would act as if he wanted to send them a message. Eventually, after about two months, Nisi and the imperial court reached Shanyang, where the news of the death of the emperor was announced. Qin Shi Huang did not like to talk about his own death and he had never written a will. After his death, the eldest son Fuzu would normally become the next emperor. Li Xi and the chief eunuch Zhao Gao conspired to kill Fuzu because Fuzu's favorite general was Meng Tian, whom they disliked and feared. Meng Tian's brother, a senior minister, had once punished Zhao Gao. They believed that if Fuzu was enthroned, they would lose their power. Li Xi and Zhao Gao forged a letter from Qin Shi Huang saying that both Fuzu and General Meng must commit suicide. The plan worked, and the younger son Hu He became the second emperor, later known as Qin Er Shi or second generation Qin. Qin Er Shi, however, was not as capable as his father. Revolts quickly erupted. His reign was a time of extreme civil unrest, and everything built by the first emperor crumbled away within a short period. One of the immediate revolt attempts was the 209 BC Days village uprising led by Chen Sheng and Bu Guang. The Chinese historian Sima Qian, writing a century after the first emperor's death, wrote that it took 700,000 men to construct the emperor's mausoleum. British historian John Mann points out that this figure is larger than the population of any city in the world at that time and he calculates that the foundations could have been built by 16,000 men in two years. While Sima Qian never mentioned the terracotta army, the statues were discovered by a group of farmers digging wells on the 29th of March 1974. The soldiers were created with a series of mix and match clay molds and then further individualized by the artist's hand. Ha purple was also used on some of the warriors. There are around 6,000 terracotta warriors and their purpose was to protect the emperor in the afterlife from evil spirits. Also among the army are chariots and 40,000 real bronze weapons. One of the first projects which the young king accomplished while he was alive was the construction of his own tomb. In 215 BC Qin Shi Huang ordered General Meng Tian to begin its construction with the assistance of 300,000 men. Other sources suggest that he ordered 720,000 unpaid laborers to build his tomb according to his specifications. Again, given John Mann's observation regarding populations at the time, See paragraph above, these historical estimates are debatable. The main tomb containing the emperor has yet to be opened and there is evidence suggesting that it remains relatively intact. Sima Qian's description of the tomb includes replicas of palaces and scenic towers, rare utensils and wonderful objects, 100 rivers made with mercury, representations of the heavenly bodies, and crossbows rigged to shoot anyone who tried to break in. The tomb was built at the foot of Mount Li, 30 kilometers away from Zion. Modern archaeologists have located the tomb, and have inserted probes deep into it. The probes revealed abnormally high quantities of mercury, some 100 times the naturally occurring rate, suggesting that some parts of the legend are credible. Secrets were maintained, as most of the workmen who built the tomb were killed.
Historiography Traditional Chinese historiography almost always portrayed the first emperor of the Chinese unified states as a brutal tyrant who had an obsessive fear of assassination. Ideological antipathy towards the legalist state of Qin was established as early as 266 BC, when Confucian philosopher Zimzi disparaged it. Later Confucian historians condemned the emperor who had burned the classics and had buried Confucian scholars alive. They eventually compiled a list of the ten crimes of Qin to highlight his tyrannical actions. The famous Ha poet and statesman Jia Yi concluded his essay The Faults of Qin Guo Qing Lum, Guo Qing Lum, with what was to become the standard Confucian judgment of the reasons for Kun's collapse. Jia Yi's essay, admired as a masterpiece of rhetoric and reasoning, was copied into two great Ha histories and has had a far-reaching influence on Chinese political thought as a classic illustration of Confucian theory. He attributed Kun's disintegration to its internal failures. Jia Yi wrote that, Qin, from a tiny base, had become a great power, ruling the land and receiving homage from all quarters for a hundred odd years. Yet after they unified the land and secured themselves within the pass, a single common rustic could nevertheless challenge this empire. Why? Because the ruler lacked humaneness and ripeness, because preserving power differs fundamentally from seizing power. In more modern times, historical assessment of the first emperor different from traditional Chinese historiography began to emerge. The reassessment was spurred on by the weakness of China in the latter half of the 19th century and early 20th century. At that time some began to regard Confucian traditions as an impediment to China's entry into the modern world, opening the way for changing perspectives. At a time when foreign nations encroached upon Chinese territory, leading Kuomintang historian Xiao Yushin emphasized the role of Qin Shi Huang in repulsing the northern barbarians, particularly in the construction of the Great Wall. Another historian, Ma Feibai, Ma Feibai, published in 1941 a full-length revisionist biography of the first emperor entitled Qin Shi Wang Di Jun, Qin Shi Huang Di Xuan, calling him, one of the great heroes of Chinese history. Ma compared him with the contemporary leader Chiang Kai-shek and saw many parallels in the careers and policies of the two men, both of whom he admired. Chang's northern expedition of the late 1920s, which directly preceded the new nationalist government at Nanjing was compared to the unification brought about by Qin Shi Huang. With the coming of the Communist Revolution and the establishment of a new, revolutionary regime in 1949, another re-evaluation of the first emperor emerged as a Marxist critique. This new interpretation of Qin Shi Huang was generally a combination of traditional and modern views, but essentially critical. This is exemplified in the complete history of China, which was compiled in September 1955 as an official survey of Chinese history. The work described the first emperor's major steps toward unification and standardization as corresponding to the interests of the ruling group and the merchant class, not of the nation or the people, and the subsequent fall of his dynasty is a manifestation of the class struggle. The perennial debate about the fall of the Qin dynasty was also explained in Marxist terms, the peasant rebellions being a revolt against oppression, a revolt which undermined the dynasty, but which was bound to fail because of a compromise with landlord class elements. Since 1972, However, a radically different official view of Qin Shi Huang in accordance with Maoist thought has been given prominence throughout China.
Hong Shidi's biography Qin Shi Huang initiated the re-evaluation. The work was published by the state press as a mass popular history, and it sold 1.85 million copies within two years. In the new era, Qin Shi Huang was seen as a far-sighted ruler who destroyed the forces of division and established the first unified, centralized state in Chinese history by rejecting the past. Personal attributes, such as his quest for immortality, so emphasized in traditional historiography, were scarcely mentioned. The new evaluations described approvingly how, in his time and era of great political and social change, he had no compunctions against using violent methods to crush counter-revolutionaries, such as the industrial and commercial slave owner, Chancellor Lu Buwei. However, he was criticized for not being as thorough as he should have been, and as a result, after his death, hidden subversives under the leadership of the chief eunuch Zhao Gao were able to seize power and use it to restore the old feudal order. To round out this re-evaluation, Luo Siding put forward a new interpretation of the precipitous collapse of the Qin dynasty in an article entitled, On the Class Struggle During the Period Between Qin and Ha, in a 1974 issue of Red Flag, to replace the old explanation. The new theory claimed that the cause of the fall of Qin lay in the lack of thoroughness of Qin Shi Wang's, dictatorship over the reactionaries, even to the extent of permitting them to worm their way into organs of political authority and usurp important posts. Mao Zedong was reviled for his persecution of intellectuals. On being compared to the first emperor, Mao boasted, he buried 460 scholars alive, we have buried 46,000 scholars alive. You intellectuals revile us for being Qin Shi Wangs. You are wrong. We have surpassed Qin Shi Huang a hundredfold. When you berate us for imitating his despotism, we are happy to agree. Your mistake was that you did not say so enough. Tom Ambrose characterizes Qin Shi Huang as the founder of the first police state in history. First police state in history. As emperor he initiated a series of reforms aimed at establishing a fully centralized administration, thus avoiding the rise of independent satrapies. Following the example of Qin and at the suggestion of Li Si, he abolished territorial feudal power in the empire, forced the wealthy aristocratic families to live in the capital, Shanyang, and divided the country into 36 military districts, each with its own military and civil administrator. He also issued orders for almost universal standardization, from weights, measures, and the axle lengths of carts to the written language and the laws. Construction of a network of roads and canals was begun, and fortresses erected for defense against barbarian invasions from the north were linked to form the Great Wall. In 220 Qin Shi Huang undertook the first of a series of imperial inspection tours that marked the remaining ten years of his reign. While supervising the consolidation and organization of the empire, he did not neglect to perform sacrifices in various sacred places, announcing to the gods that he had finally united the empire, and he erected stone tablets with ritual inscriptions to extol his achievements. Another motive for Qin Shi Wang's travels was his interest in magic and alchemy and his search for masters in these arts who could provide him with the elixir of immortality. After the failure of such an expedition to the islands in the Eastern Sea, possibly Japan, in 219, the emperor repeatedly summoned magicians to his court. 
Confucian scholars strongly condemn this step as charlatanry, and it is said that 460 of them were executed for their opposition. The continuous controversy between the emperor and Confucian scholars who advocated a return to the old feudal order culminated in the famous burning of the books of 213, when, at Lisi's suggestion, all books not dealing with agriculture, medicine, or prognostication were burned, except historical records of Qin and books in the imperial library. The last years of Qin Shi Wang's life were dominated by an ever-growing distrust of his entourage, at least three assassination attempts nearly succeeded, and his increasing isolation from the common people. Almost inaccessible in his huge palaces, the emperor led the life of a semidivan being. In 210 Qin Shi Huang died during an inspection tour. He was buried in a gigantic funerary compound hewn out of a mountain and shaped in conformity with the symbolic patterns of the cosmos. Excavation of this enormous complex of some 20 square miles, 50 square km, now known as the Keen Tomb, began in 1974, and the complex was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1987. Among the findings at the site were some 8,000 life-sized terracotta soldier and horse figures forming an army for the dead king. The disappearance of Qin Shi Wang's forceful personality immediately led to the outbreak of fighting among supporters of the old feudal factions that ended in the collapse of the Qin dynasty and the extermination of the entire imperial clan by 206. Most of the information about Qin Shi Wang's life derives from the successor Ha dynasty, which prized Confucian scholarship and thus had an interest in disparaging the Qin period. The report that Qin Shi Huang was an illegitimate son of Liu Bu Wei is possibly an invention of that epoch. Further, stories describing his excessive cruelty and the general defamation of his character must be viewed in the light of the distaste felt by the ultimately victorious Confucians for legalist philosophy in general. Qin Shi Huang certainly had an imposing personality and showed an unbending will in pursuing his aim of uniting and strengthening the empire. His despotic rule and the draconian punishments he meted out were dictated largely by his belief in legalist ideas. With few exceptions, the traditional historiography of imperial China has regarded him as the villain par excellence, unhuman, uncultivated, and superstitious. Modern historians, however, generally stress the endurance of the bureaucratic and administrative structure institutionalized by Qin Shi Huang, which, despite its official denial, remained the basis of all subsequent dynasties in China. We wouldn't have a China without Qin Shi Huang, says Harvard University's Peter Bowl. I think it's that simple. China at the time was a land of many states. In many ways, climate, lifestyle, diet, someone from northern Scotland and southern Spain have as much in common as someone from China's frozen north and the tropical south. Before Qin, China's multiple states were diverging, rather than converging, says Bowl. They have different calendars, their writing was starting to vary, the road widths were different, so the axle width is different in different places. He was king of the small state of Qin by the age of 13, and started as he meant to go on removing one possible threat to his throne by having his mother's lover executed, along with his entire clan. A hundred years later the famous historian Sima Qian said of the young king, with his puffed-out chest like a hawk and voice of a jackal, Qin is a man of scant mercy who has the heart of a wolf.
When he is in difficulty he readily humbles himself before others, but when he has got his way, then he thinks nothing of eating others alive. If the king should ever get his way with the world, then the whole world will end up his prisoner. King Shi Huang built a formidable fighting machine. His army is easy to imagine because he left us the famous terracotta warriors in Jian. The king was really the first state to really go into total mobilization for war, says Peter Bowl. It really saw the work of its population being fighting and soldiering to win wars and expand. One by one, King Shi Huang defeated neighboring states, swallowed their territory into his growing empire and enslaved and castrated their citizens. Every time he captured people from another country, he castrated them in order to mark them and made them into slaves, says Hong Kong University's Zanjo. There were lots and lots of eunuchs in his court. He was a ruthless tyrant. But still, no king, no China. From Mongolia down to Hong Kong, and from the sea right the way across to Sichuan, it's an enormous territory, says Francis Wood, curator of the Chinese collection at the British Library. It's the equivalent of the whole Roman Empire added together, if you like. And you've got one man ruling all of it. Peter Bowl credits Qin Shi Huang not only with creating China, but with establishing the world's first truly centralized bureaucratic empire. He set out to unify the procedures and customs and policies of all the states, says Bol. Writing is reunified. And the fact that Chinese writing remains unified after this point has everything to do with Qin Shi Huang. The axle widths are now all the same, so all the roads may now be passable. He also goes around to famous mountains, where they erect stulls, stone monuments, which say that the emperor's realm is now totally unified. His idea was that every area should have an able administrator, who was armed with rule books and who would look after the people. The people all knew what the rules were, says Wood. He collected taxes, he administered justice and he had trained bureaucrats all over China. I think that's an extraordinary achievement. Despite this, it is the stories of his bloodletting that historian Zhang Zhou grew up with. He got rid of anybody who showed opposition or didn't agree with him. He was paranoid. He was constantly in fear of how he could control this vast new territory with so many cultures and so many different groups of people, she says. And he feared the inkbrush as much as the sword. The scholars were talking behind his back, says Zanjo. And of course being a paranoid person, he didn't like that. So he ordered the arrest of over 400 scholars and buried them. Qin Shi Huang had no truck with China's traditions of Confucian scholarship, his fear of the intellectual was deep-rooted. Ideologically speaking, the king made the argument, we don't want to hear people criticize the present by referring to the past, says Peter Bowl. The past is irrelevant. History is irrelevant. And so you have the burning of books, you have the burying of scholars, of scholarly critics. Bol sees parallels with today's China. Like Qin Shi Huang, the Communist Party tolerates debate about tactics, but not about the general direction of travel, he says. They argue that it is the only possible approach to governing China. Historian Zanjo agrees. In communist China, we adopted the imperial model. The emperor is absolute. And the only way to rule such a vast empire is ruthlessness, she says. In fact in 1958, 
Mao himself made the connection between himself and Qin Shi Huang. He buried 460 scholars alive, we have buried 46,000 scholars alive, he said in a speech to party cadres. You intellectuals revile us for being Qin Shi Wangs. You are wrong. We have surpassed Qin Shi Huang a hundredfold. Every night, Mo's body inside its crystal coffin reportedly goes down into its earthquake-proof vault in an elevator, and every morning it is brought back up again. It is probably something Qin Shi Huang would have appreciated. But I am not sure he would have been impressed with Mo's mausoleum. His includes a life-size terracotta army, a full orchestra with instruments in a river landscape with cranes, swans and geese, and archaeologists have barely begun the excavation. In a sense the man has disappeared behind the tomb, says Francis Wood. And of course the size of the buried army, the size of the tomb enclosure, which seems to expand daily, does rather overcome anything that one knows about him in reality. You've got this great physical presence now. Both Qin Shi Huang and Mao live on powerfully in China's imagination, but China is bigger than its emperors. When Qin Shi Huang died, his dynasty lasted only months. It was the idea of China which survived. And when Mao died, his successors said the radiance of his thought would live forever. But the Mao suits are gone and despite the crowds at his mausoleum, Maoism is barely mentioned today.